Construction Incorporated for an air quality permit number 9295. Alto Concrete Batch Plant will now come to order. We have a team of interpreters present at this time. I invite them to give a brief overview of how to access the Spanish language channel. I will also ask the court reporter to swear in the interpreters before we continue. Will you raise your right hands for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will interpret from Spanish to English and English to Spanish the matters in these proceedings to the best of your ability? I can see her raising her hand, but I don't have, I can't hear her. Um, if everyone could please, um, for us to be able to hear them, I think the issue right now is we have to choose a channels um, that would be English or Spanish, um, and they'll be they'll be giving more instructions. I apologize, but if you could go into the little globe on the left side of the screen, and um, it says my interpretation language, and then if you could choose English. Um, just so we could hear the interpreters get sworn in. So, uh, Miss Patty and Miss Rosa, would you please affirm? Verbally? Would you like me to repeat the oath? No, I'm sure they heard it. Uh, let's have let's have one at a time. Thank you. We can't hear you, Miss Patty. Uh, Miss Patty, you were muted. No. Well, I don't want to hold up the hearing any longer. Um, when um, Patty can uh, verbally take the oath, then we can use her as an interpreter. But for now, we will only be able to use interpreter Rosa. So I'm going to continue. And uh, Miss Patty, let me know when you can participate more fully. Uh, to continue, the Roper facility is proposed to consist of 125 cubic yard per hour concrete batch plant to be operated within the county of Lincoln, state of New Mexico, and located off of Highway 220 near Alto, New Mexico. The permitting rules provide for the opportunity for public comment and for a public hearing when the Cabinet Secretary of Environment determines that there is significant public interest. On August 11, 2021, a finding of significant public interest was approved by the cabinet secretary. And on November 2nd, this matter was first docketed in the Office of Public Facilitation. My name is Gregory Chikalian. I am the New Mexico Environment's Administrative Law Judge. I was appointed to hear this case by the secretary on November 16, 2021, and it is my responsibility to conduct the hearing in a fair and impartial manner so that the relevant facts are fully developed and to avoid delay. That also includes the duty of providing the decision maker, who in this case is Deputy uh, Cabinet Secretary Stephanie Stringer, with a clean record. A clean record means that people don't speak over each other because the court reporter is not able to properly 
transcribe verbatim multiple people speaking. It's also disrespectful. Also, a clean record means that we only accept relevant evidence. So uh, the parties are under an obligation to object to irrelevant facts. Uh, and if they don't, then I'm gonna take it upon myself uh, to object to irrelevant facts. This comes from the rule that anyone can find on their computer. It's the New Mexico Administrative Code, uh, abbreviated as NMAC, A-N-M-A-C, 20.1.4.100, subsection E2. Moreover, all evidence received at this hearing must be relevant to the draft permit and the application. Those are the issues that are relevant here today. You can find that at 20.1.4.300, subsection B, 1 and 2. Issues such as zoning or noise are outside the draft permit and therefore not relevant to this proceeding. I have a duty to admit all relevant evidence that is not unduly prejudicial or repetitious or otherwise unreliable or of little probative value. You can find that at 20.1.4.400, subsection B1. Due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, this hearing is being held both virtually and at a local facility. And the Air Quality Bureau has provided simultaneous Spanish translation. As demonstrated earlier, if you prefer to participate in Spanish, please use the language function at the bottom of the screen, bottom left corner. There is also a chat feature to communicate with the WebEx host. You can communicate with the WebEx host with any questions about the hearing or to sign up to provide public comment. This is our virtual sign-in sheet. The parties will now enter their appearance for the record. First, the permittee. Uh, Mr. Hingosser, this is Lewis Rose with Montgomery and Andrews and Kristen Burby of Montgomery and Andrews on behalf of the applicant Roper Construction, Inc. Good morning. And now the uh, homeowners of Sonterra. Good morning, Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, Tom Nasco and Julie Sakura on behalf of the homeowners of, of Sonterra Property Owners Association and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Weems as well. Good morning. Uh, it is hard to hear you, so I'm going to ask you to either speak up or move the microphone closer. Is that better, Mr. Hearing Officer? Uh, uh, marginally, but I'm concerned about the court reporter being able to transcribe uh, what you say uh, accurately. Let me get our IT person to fix that problem if I can. Thank you very much. In, in the, you're welcome. In the meantime, uh, the New Mexico Air Quality Bureau Council. Good morning, Christy Hill, uh, Assistant General Counsel, New Mexico Environment Department here for the Air Quality Bureau. Good morning. Okay. Um, the public hearing is a forum to accept reliable and relevant evidence to fully inform the decision maker approval or denial of the draft permit. Public participation is encouraged and an important component of the permitting process. Public comment is admissible as general or non-technical evidence, and it will be received today at 12 p.m. and 5 p.m. To avoid background noise and feedback, everyone except for the attorneys will be muted. One witness at a time will be unmuted to provide their sworn testimony. Now we've run into issues with unmuting and muting people, so. Um, I'm going to ask that everyone who is not speaking to mute themselves. People will not speak over each other and over the hearing officer. Attorneys will not address each other, but instead speak to the hearing officer. To promote an orderly and efficient hearing, the hearing clerk will ensure these rules are observed. Public comment shall be received into evidence, either in written or verbal format. Written comment has several benefits. It is not limited in length. 
and it can be made at your convenience before the record closes and has the equal weight of sworn testimony. The hearing clerk has provided the smart comment link in the chat for your convenience. So, Ms. Corral, uh, is that link available in the chat? I will send it out, Mr. Hearing Officer, for everyone to, to view. <clears throat> Thank you. Sworn comment will be limited in length for each public member. To prevent undue delay or undue repetition, this time limit may be reduced to allow everyone to speak. Please use the chat feature to alert the hearing clerk of your desire to provide sworn general comment and you will be called in the order that you've signed up. When called, unmute yourself and enable your camera for the court reporter to swear you in and then spell your name for the record. Finally, I will consider both forms of public comment in my hearing report and recommend a decision to the deputy secretary. The burdens of persuasion in this hearing are as follows, and these can be found at 20.1.4.400 subsection A1. The applicant, otherwise known as Roper Construction, has the burden of proof that the draft permit should be issued and not denied, and that burden never shifts. The Air Quality Bureau has the burden of proof for a challenged condition of the permit. Any member of the public or any person who contends that a permit condition is inadequate or improper or who proposes to include a new permit condition has the burden of presenting an affirmative case. Testimony today will be presented in the following order. First, the applicant will present their case and their technical witnesses in support of the draft permit. Then the Air Quality Bureau, their technical witnesses, will then present their testimony. And finally, Sonterra's technical witnesses in opposition of the draft permit will then present their case. Now, the parties have attended a pre-hearing scheduling conference, which resulted in the December 2nd scheduling order, which can be found on the environment's webpage. And for all <clears throat> public members who are participating, who want to be well informed, if you go to the New Mexico environment's webpage and you click on public participation, you will see a drop down menu. That's one of the ways to find the smart comment link to make a written comment. You can also go to the docketed matters page and look up Roper construction from there. And that has every document that has been filed in this case. That includes the full written testimony of every witness who is going to testify today and their rebuttal testimony if they have submitted any. Now, since all the parties and all of the technical witnesses have submitted full written technical testimony, today they will be providing summaries limited in length for the public's benefit. And I'll get to that in just a moment. The purpose of the public hearing is to provide the public with information and to receive your relevant comment. Each technical witness has submitted full written technical testimony into the record in the form of an exhibit, which are numbered based on the parties and which have been uploaded with any attachments for the public's view on the website, as I just explained. Unless I sustain an objection, these exhibits will be adopted under oath by each witness and admitted into, the, into evidence in their entirety. Witnesses, therefore, will provide a 15-minute plain language summary for the public. The hearing clerk will inform each witness five minutes before the end of their time. Many witnesses also filed written rebuttal test technical testimony, also posted on the website. These witnesses shall have an additional 15 minutes to summarize their rebuttal testimony. Cross-examination is not part of these time limits, 
and the public may sign up to cross-examine a technical witness. Cross-examination is not an opportunity to testify and must be provided in the format related to the witness's testimony. So in other words, if a witness has not testified to a subject, a, cro a proper cross-examination question cannot be to something outside that subject. The hearing officer has a duty to enforce these rules. Finally, we will not take a formal lunch break and we may continue past five o'clock. Preliminary matters. As a preliminary matter, there was a motion to dismiss, which was denied. It was renewed, it was also denied. And a motion to exclude evidence about water issues. I also denied that motion. My orders and reasoning are available on the website. Let's now deal with the party's exhibits. So let's start with the applicant. Um, Mr. Hearing Officer, we we have three exhibits. Uh, they're labeled Broker 1, 2, and 3, and they consist of uh, Mr. Wade's direct and rebuttal testimony and um, his resume. And we would offer Broker exhibits 1 through 3 at this time and ask that they be admitted. Are there any uh, objections to Roper exhibits 1, 2, and 3 being admitted into evidence? Hearing none, they are admitted into evidence. I'm going to keep track, but Ms. Myers, you're also keeping track? I am as well, yes, Mr. Hearing Officer. All right. So, admitted. Roper one, two, and three. Uh, Mr. Vijo. I can't hear you, Mr. Vijo. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry about that. So we have uh, a New Mexico uh, NMED exhibits one through eight and NMED rebuttal exhibits one through eight, and we move that all 16 of those exhibits be entered into evidence. Uh, are there any uh, objections? No objection. No objection, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just write this down. All right, so we have all 16 exhibits for the Air Quality Bureau are admitted into evidence at this time. And Mr. Hanasco for Sonterra. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, we previously submitted with our uh, testimony and rebuttal testimony uh, attachments of our exhibits, and uh, uh, they're included within the record proper, all of them already, and we just we moved those uh, to be admitted as well. Okay, can I have the exact numbers? Can you have the exact numbers? We just numbered them one, two, three, four each. They're numbered, uh, they're numbered, Mr. Hearing Officer, exhibits uh, so that's a big Carlos uh, for Mr. Uh, Dr. Tuarte Villarreal, exhibits 1 through 10. And for Mr. Elude uh, uh, Martinez, exhibits 1 through 3. And for Mr. Edler, oh, excuse me. And for uh, did you find breaking? Mr. Edler does not have any exhibits, so none for him. And then finally, uh, for uh, Ms. Br Ms. Bernal, Brianna Bernal, we have exhibits one through four. Let me see if I understand. I'm sorry, Mr. Hearing Officer, exhibits one through seven. One through seven. Okay, let me see if I understand what you're saying. You have four witnesses, three of which who uh, have exhibits, and the exhibits are labeled with their names and numbers? In, in the statement of intent. They're, they're in the statement of intent, Your Honor. I don't think the exhibits themselves are individually labeled. We can certainly correct that, and uh, if, if Your Honor would... If, Hearing officer wants them individually labeled. We attach them to each uh, 
each uh, summary and testimony is provided in the notice of intent. I've read the notices of intent carefully, uh, but for admission into evidence and for the parties to be able to refer to them in their post hearing submissions, I do want them to be labeled. So I'm not going to tell you how to label them, Mr. Hanasco, but it seems to me you have 10 and 3, 13 and 7. Looks like you have 20 exhibits in total. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Hearing Officer. All right. So, um, unless you want to do it differently, would you label them and mark them and resubmit them uh, at some point today um, as Sonterra 1 through 20? Yes, we would. Thank you. Okay. Are there any objections to any of Sonterra's exhibits? Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, this is Lewis Rose. We had previously filed a motion in limine on water issues. And to the extent to which those exhibits relate to those issues, we'd like to make it a continuing objection to, to those rather than raise them every time that the issue comes up. So if you would consider that continuing objection as to the other exhibits, we have no objection. Okay, Mr. Vigil. Uh, we have no objection to the entry of the exhibits. Uh, uh, just noting that the Environment Department did uh, concur with the motion in limine. Uh, but we'll restrict our objections uh, in the moment uh, during testimony. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, to reiterate the order that was circulated uh, for the party's benefit and for witness preparation on Saturday, um, that motion was denied. Um, that evidence will come in and be given the appropriate weight that I find. And uh, so those objections um, are irrelevant and the um, at this point and the Sonterra exhibits 1 through 20 are admitted into evidence. Um, now we are going to move on to opening statements and I'm going to ask the permittee to provide an opening statement if he wishes and if not to call his first witness. Yes, Mr. Hearing officer again, this is Lewis Rose with Montgomery and Andrews. I have a brief opening statement and then. We have one witness that will call and I don't know, Mr. Hearing officer, if you want to allow. The parties to give open all of them to give opening statements before you begin testimony or whether you want each party to open. Immediately preceding their witness testifying either approaches. I get to go 1st, either way, but um, I don't know what you're procedurally how you intend to do that. This is your, um, this is your case in chief. Mr. Rose, and so um, your opening statement and then your witnesses, uh, other parties will have their opportunity later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Uh, as you indicated in your opening, this is a hearing before the department on a permit application, an air quality permit application for Roper construction. The permit application was submitted under the Air Quality Control Act, Section 7427 as well as the Environmental Improvement Board's permitting construction permitting regulation uh, 20.2.72. Under those, that regulation and application uh, and the relevant consideration is whether the applicant has demonstrated that they can and will comply with applicable air quality regulations and will not cause and contr or contribute to ambient air quality levels in exceedance of any national or state ambient air quality standard or PSD increment. The application in this matter uh, was submitted last summer. Uh, with the application, uh, Roper submitted modeling, and we believe that the application um, as submitted demonstrates compliance with regulations, and in this case, the only applicable regulation that sets substantive criteria applicable to Roper's operation is 20.2.61, which provides that for combustion equipment, uh, that equipment cannot exceed an opacity limit of 20%. Uh, there are three small water heaters. Those are the only combustion sources on site and uh, they will combust uh, pipeline quality natural gas. And it's our understanding that by combusting that natural gas, that these units will meet the opacity requirement. The remainder of the discussion relates to compliance with 
ambient air quality standards. And in this case, there are national ambient air quality standards that apply, and there are some state ambient air quality standards that apply. In addition to the standards, uh, the modeling also addresses where prevention of significant deterioration increments, which are actually requirements more stringent than the ambient air quality standards. And as the modeling demonstrated, as you'll hear testimony today from, from our witness, Mr. Wade, the modeling demonstrates compliance with, with the ambient air quality standards. That is that emissions from Roper's operation will not cause or contribute to an exceedance of any applicable ambient air quality standard and will not exceed any PSD increment. And as I indicated, uh, we have one witness, Mr. Wade, who, who submitted pre-filed written direct and rebuttal testimony um, and will be available for cross-examination. But his testimony as long, along with the application demonstrates Roper's entitlement to a hearing. Uh, you'll also hear testimony from Mr. Wade concerning proposed conditions that the department has has indicated they they put in the or proposed in the draft permit to be issued as well as some additional changes as a result of uh, pre-filed testimony uh, you'll hear testimony from Mr. Wade that even though Roper does not think that these conditions are necessary it will agree to inclusion of those conditions in the permit so uh, with that Mr. Hearing Officer I'd like to call my first witness and have him sworn, Mr. Paul Wade. Okay, Mr. Uh, Rose, before we swear your first witness in, um, I would like everyone to know that if you use the link that was in the chat for the smart comment, you will uh, initially see a little warning from WebEx. It says that you are being taken to an external site. Uh, that's fine. Click on the continue button below and you will actually get to the comment form. So there's nothing wrong with the link, and I just wanted everyone to know that. So, uh, Ms. Myers, would you please swear in Mr. Wade? Mr. Wade, will you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Wade, um, would you please spell your name for the court reporter? It's Paul Wade, P-A-U-L-W-A-D-E. -E. Okay, and Mr. Wade, since you do have rebuttal testimony, you will be under a 30 minute time limit. So um, please proceed. Um, Mr. Hearing Officer, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, Tom Nasco here. I, I've just been informed that the Ruidoso Convention Center has not been admitted into the WebEx conference. Ah. Very good. Um, Ms. Corral? Uh, Mr. Please. Hearing Officer, I currently uh, have nobody on, on the lobby. If they would like to um, um, <laughs> try to sign in again, um, I'll keep my eye. I, we've let everyone in at Thank this you. point. Okay. Mr. Hearing Mr. Officer. Mr. Wade, it is 9.34. Right. Please proceed. Um, I think it's important that the, the residents who want to hear this are allowed to listen. So if, if we need to take a break while that gets sorted out, we have no objection to doing that. How are we doing? Mr. Hearing Officer, they're trying to log in again right now. Okay, thank you. Let's give them a moment. Um, in the meantime, um, Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, Patty, the interpreter, is ready oh, to be sworn in. Um, if you would like to do that in the meantime, Miss Miss Patty, you were you, you heard the oath. Uh, do you agree? Thank you. You're sworn in now. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Mr. Hearing Officer, they have uh, they're signed in apparently. Uh, the residents down in Ruidoso. I think I will make a job to verify that. I'm, I'm, um, I'm sorry. Are they using the calendar, um, the main um, 
link that it's in the website? Because I, I don't see them in RM. Um, Pam, do you see them? Uh, nope, I'm watching for them. <clears throat> the everyone is, is has been directed to go to the NMED calendar to get the link to this meeting. <clears throat> Ms. Kudal, I see on my screen Taylor Jim or trailer Jim, and I uh, see the woman waving at us. Are are you saying that that's not who you're waiting for? No. Um. Taylor Jim is um, the environment department, the facility that we provided, I and see. um, if I'm correct, uh, they they chose to another location. Um, okay. The convention center, if I'm and correct. Mr. Manasco, are you in communication with the uh, other location? Yes, we are, Mr. Hearing Officer. All right. Have you directed them to the calendar on the New Mexico Environment website, which has the the proper link? I have. You have, okay. And have the are they? What have they told you? Standing by for. A We're standing by for a reply. I see. And we're having someone call down there too, Mr. Hearing Officer, to verify that. And while we're waiting for that, is my audio better, Mr. Hearing Officer? Marginally. I mean, I can I can make you out. And my concern was that the court reporter would not capture your voice, but if she doesn't have a problem with it, it's it's good enough for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Shannon. Mm Just Mr. Hanasco, do you have an update? We're waiting, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, we should have one very soon. Apparently, they were on the wrong way because we're going to the right way. I'm going to give them another five minutes and then we're going to continue. Um, so. It's now 939.
Mr. Hearing Officer, I believe he's in. Um, uh, they told me they were going to be under Bill. Okay. Bill Horton? Uh, yes. Okay, very good. So the time now is 941, Mr. Rose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Let's see if Mr. Wade is back here. Well, there he is. Back. Oh, I, uh, we've got to get the other system started. Looks like somebody still hasn't muted, so. Mr. Horton, um, are you addressing the hearing? Pennsylvania. Oh, Pittsburgh. Um, Ms. Corral, would you mute Mr. Horton so we can continue? Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Officer. Mr. Rose, it is 942. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Um, Mr. Wade, since you've already told us your name and spelled it. Could you uh, tell us with, with whom you're currently employed? I'm currently employed with Montrose Air Quality Services, LLC. And in what capacity are you so employed? I'm an air quality consultant. Um, I'm a, a senior project manager and also a principal. And Mr. Wade, could you give us a brief description of your educational and work background? I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of New Mexico. And I have worked in air quality for air quality issues for approximately 27 years. And uh, Mr. Wade, did you prepare the permit application? That's an issue in this case. I did. And did you prepare written um, direct testimony in this proceeding? I did. And if we were to ask you the questions that are included in your written direct, would you give us the same answers under oath today that you did in your written testimony? I would. And do you adopt your your writ pre filed written direct testimony as your direct testimony in this proceeding? I do. Uh, Mr. Wade, did you prepare rebuttal testimony in this proceeding? I did. And again, if we were to ask you the questions under oath that were asked in the, the rebuttal testimony, would you give the same answers? I would. And do you adopt your written rebuttal testimony as your rebuttal testimony in this proceeding? I do. And have you prepared a summary of your written direct and rebuttal testimony uh, for this proceeding. I have. Um, Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, Mr. Wade, could you give that that summary? And Mr. Wade's going to use a PowerPoint presentation, which we circulated yesterday. And I think, and I don't know if he has control of the screen or if exactly how that's to work, so. Looks like we're. Oh, I made him a presenter. Uh, feel free okay. to to share. There we go. Can we see it? We can. Oops. Sorry. My, I'm here to testify or summarize my testimony regarding the Roper construction permit application number 9295 for their, their proposed Alto concrete batch plant. Oh. 
I'm sorry. Uh, my direct testimony addressed the Roper permit, how the concrete batch plant operates, emission control equipment, Roper emissions for the concrete batch plant, and facility modeling. The facility is requesting a minor source permit for the concrete batch plant to produce a maximum of 125 cubic yards per hour and an annual production limit to 500,000 cubic yards per year. The application was submitted June 14th, 2021 and was ruled administratively com com complete on July 22nd, 2021. This slide shows a, the, uh, a list of the equipment that will be in, installed at the site. Uh, these, these are the emission, uh, emission, emission equipment, emission units uh, for the facility. It includes a haul road, a feed hopper, feed hopper conveyor, overhead aggregate bin, aggregate way batcher, aggregate way batcher conveyor, the truck loading area with bag house, the some cement and fly ash way batcher with bag house, the cement split silo with bag house, and the fly ash silo with bag house. The silo is a single unit, but it is split into two sides. Uh, one will be containing cement, and one the other will be containing fly ash. Along with that is uh, storage of aggregate material, aggregate and sand materials in storage piles. And three concrete, basically water heaters. Uh, each water heater is an instantaneous heating unit, similar to what you can buy for your, for your home. Here's a layout of the equipment and how it's, uh, uh, you know, the specific emission points. Um, I'm basically going to walk through and explain how the op operation will happen. Uh, the haul trucks will enter the site to deliver aggregate, sand, cement, fly ash, and water. The haul road will be paved to minimize emissions of particulates. The aggregate and sand are stored in three-sided storage bins. The aggregate and sand will be removed from the, the storage piles with a front-end loader and loaded into the feed hopper. Uh, from the feed hopper, it is conveyed on the feed hopper conveyor into the overhead aggregate bins. Um, since the material has, I mean, there's different different material properties for for uh, mixing the concrete, there is four aggregate bins uh, that are used for storage of that that material. The when when they're ready to load the trucks, uh, the way batcher will measure the, the specific amount of material that to be used um, for the for the aggregate and sand and drop it onto the way batcher delivery conveyor which moves the aggregate and sand into the truck loading area. Uh, also in at the truck loading area, uh, which is below the, the, the cement side or the silo is a cement fly ash batcher. And what, what that piece of equipment does is it measures out the, the amount of fly ash and cement that will be used in the, in the mix. Um, and again, that uh, that silo is, is uh, it will have the cement and fly ash split silo, and each side will have a bag house. Uh, here's a, a a picture of what the uh, the side view of of the truck loading area, and basically, I'm going to explain how the the, the loading will happen. Uh, a concrete truck are backed into a three-sided shroud, which you can see on the picture. A rubber chute 
which you can see in the picture, is positioned in into the concrete truck loading chute. Aggregate sand, cement, fly ash, and water is loaded through the, the rubber chute into the truck in combinations that minimize fugitive emissions. In other words, water will be added at the same time to capture some of the dust that may be generated uh, during loading. Uh, during loading, any dirty air displaced from the concrete truck drum will be emitted into the three-sided shroud and captured using negative pressure and sent to the central dust collector. Uh, that's similar to a, you know, what you would find in a vacuum where, you know, uh, where the air is being sucked up. Uh, this dirty air is sent through filters and clean air is emitted into the atmosphere. Here's a, a picture of the, of the central dust collector system. Um, the lower section of the central dust collector is, the, is a hopper to collect dust captured by the filters. The material in the uh, bag house hopper is pneumatically loaded into the cement silo uh, where the dirty air during loading is sent through the cement silo bag house. Uh, the filters in the central dust collector are continuously cleaned using a reverse air system, which blows the caked on material into the bag house hopper, hopper which is then transferred to the cement silo. Here's a, a picture of the silo bag house. Uh, the silo bag house will control dust during silo loading, a loading of the cement and the fly ash. Uh, the dirty air is displaced out of the silo and into the bag house, and it runs through the cartridge filters where particulate are captured and clean air is exhausted. A pulse jet system cleans the filters where the captured particulate is sent to the silos. For material handling, uh, a fugitive Fugitive dust suppression system will be used, which is basically the addition of moisture, additional moisture on the material as it is processed. Uh, the the additional, additional moisture will be added to the material transfers from the feed hopper to the feed hopper conveyor if visible emissions are observed. Uh, alternative method of adding moisture to control visible emissions during material transfers will be adding moisture at the aggregate or sand storage piles. The addition of moisture on the storage piles will reduce emissions during feeder loading, feeder hot feed hopper loading, which was not accounted for in the allowable emission rates that show compliance with ambient standards. And the draft permit condition that uh, discusses the, the, the control methods for fugitive dust is A502. This slide summarizes the allowable emission rates that were determined for the, for the facility based on maximum operation uh, <clears throat> at 500,000 cubic yards per year. Uh, and the, the permit allowable emission rates were determined using the appropriate EPA AP42 emission factors, uh, which are the AP42 AP emission factors that are typical of the facility. Modeling was done to show compliance with ambient air quality standards. The modeling is done in a step process. Uh, first, roper sources only are, are, are modeled to determine uh, any exceedance of significant impact levels. If the significant impact levels are not exceeded, then the model is that that's the end of the modeling exercise. Uh, as you can see on the table, uh, under the percent of criteria, 
you can see that the Knox annual uh, PSD class one Knox annual PSD class two Knox annual uh, CO SO2 and PM class one uh, uh, PSD class one PM10 annual were not did not exceed the sills, so no further modeling was was prepared. Uh, for for the the pollutants and time averaging periods that exceeded the sills, cumulative modeling was performed. Uh, cumulative modeling was performed, including appropriate neighbor neighboring permitted emission sources or emissions, and also a a background concentration. For background monitoring stations were selected that are conservative for the Alto area, including model contributions from roper sources, appropriate neighbors, and background concentrations. All cumulative concentrations were below national and state ambient air quality standards. The limiting factor for the, the roper facility as far as how they could operate was determined to be the PSD class two PM 10 24 hour uh, increment. And this dictated the limitations to the facility operation. Prior to mod modeling, I consulted with the, the New Mexico modeling section on which mixed, mix, mix, which meteorological data should be used, and it was selected to be Holloman Air Force Base. Uh, I prepared the Holloman Air Force Base meteorological data based on the years 2016 through 2020, so five total years. Uh, I submitted a modeling protocol on April 29th, 2021. Uh, fugitive dust sources were input into the model as volume sources for enemy D uh, source inputs for the for that for those each type of of, of source uh, the point sources which are the water heaters and the, the bag houses were input as point sources into the model uh, dispersion model was run using the most recent available air mod version and going back to the meteorological data um, it was processed using the the most recent available air met data. Uh, the facility amp and facility amp picks the facility impacts uh, were all below New Mexico and federal ambient air quality standards. Facility impacts were also below the Class One and Class Two PSD increment limits. Here to deflect the windrows of the meteorological data set that was selected for Holloman Air Force Base. Uh, it included the, the MET data, included the Holloman Air Force Base surface data, Santa Teresa upper air data, uh, the five years of MET to years 2016 through 2020. Uh, it, the MET data was uh, prepared using the most recent available update of AirMet, um, and it has a significant amount of calms and low wind speeds. For this type of facility, uh, low, where you have low stack releases and non-buoyant fugitive emissions, low wind speeds cr conditions create the highest concentrations at the facility boundaries where all pollutant highest concentrations occurred. In conclusion, while the facility was run at maximum operations of 125 cubic yards per hour, uh, the application to stem demonstrated compliance with applicable regulations, the national ambient air quality standards, and PSD increments. Uh, the NMED proposed additional conditions to the permit, including additional monitoring and record keeping requirements. Even though the facility as proposed meets applicable requirements, the additional permit conditions proposed by the NMED are accepted by Roper. And that concludes my uh, 
summary of my testimony. Uh, Mr. Wade, do you have a summary of your rebuttal testimony as well? I do. Could you please give that? As part of the uh, Sonterra SOI, there was a discussion on uh, the correct meteorology that could be used for that site and suggested that Sierra Blanca meteorological data would, re would, uh, would be best used in this modeling analysis. Uh, I consulted with the NMED modeling section on the appropriate meteorological data to be used for the modeling analysis. To show support that the Holloman Air Force beta data was the correct meteorological data set to be used, I created and ran the models using the Sierra Blanca meteorological data and it resulted in lower cumulative concentrations for all pollutants. The issue with the Sierra Blanca uh, meteorological data is that it does not meet the EPA requirement of a 90% complete database before substitutions. Uh, the, the missing data, as you can see in the, the wind rows, was over 22%. Uh, the use of Holloman data resulted in higher uh, modeled concentrations, therefore it is more conservative. The Sonterra SOI uh, also had an opinion about which version of AirMet and AirMod should be used. I ran the model for this facility prior to the availability of version 21112 for AirMet and AirMod. The updates to AirMet and AirMod version 2112 did not change anything that would have impacted have it changed the impacts from the facility in the modeling results. I, I did, though, I reran the meteorological data in the updated version 21112, and then I reran the dispersion modeling uh, under the new version for AirMod of version 21112, and it did not change the results. Uh, for any modeling model concentrations. Additional opinions from Sontero had to do with haul road trips. Uh, modeling was performed for the facility operation operating at maximum production of 125 cubic yards per hour. Uh, the draft permit condition A112 permits 305 round trips per day. Uh, this, dis this condition does not discriminate against the type of haul road trips. So that it, it will include water, product delivery, and raw material trips, uh, and will, they will all be treated the same in the daily count of, of the 305. For the additional opinion was the uh, incorrect particle size, particle density size. Uh, all particle density size used were NMED approved values supplied by the NMED. Uh, I did make a an, an error. I used lime uh, density instead of cement density. The lime density is 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter and the part of the density for cement is 2.85 grams per cubic centimeter. In looking at this, the uh, what happens is the, the weight of the, the particle will allow it to drop out of the plume when using uh, plume depletion, uh, which was used in the PM10 model. Uh, what, what that does is allows the, the material to drop out faster uh, as, it, as the plume travels away from the source. Uh, since all um, model concentrations were highest at the boundary, the, 
quicker the particles drop out, the higher the concentration would be. So lime would be have a higher density result in higher concentrations in the boundary, uh, which would be, a, would be a more conservative result. Uh, to, to verify this, I reran the model for PM10 with the correct particle density for cement, and that confirmed that the model concentration decreased slightly with, with, uh, with using cement, a lighter particle density. For fugitive dust at the aggregate piles, uh, the, the original calculations in the model uh, represented no controls uh, applied to the aggregate piles. The, so both the uncontrolled and the controlled emissions in the application are based on an uncontrolled value. This uncontrolled emission rate was used in the modeling analysis. Uh, modeling was with the uncontrolled aggregate piles demonstrated compliance with the applicable regulations and ambient air quality standards. Uh, NMAD has proposed the option of adding additional moisture content at either the storage piles or at the unloading of the feed hopper onto the feed hopper conveyor in draft permit condition A502. Additionally, in that, that condition is a visible inspection that determines how much uh, determines the amount of additional moisture that should be added to control any fugitive dust. Um, with the addition of moisture on the aggregate storage piles, uh, this will reduce emissions further than what was originally modeled. We have five minutes. And that completes my rebuttal testimony. Mr. Hingos, I have a couple of questions on Sir rebuttal. If you want to do it now or later, um, I can certainly do it now. That's fine. That was fine. Uh, Mr. Wade, did you review the rebuttal testimony or rebuttal opinions provided by Santera's witnesses? I did. And did any of those opinions change your opinion as to the approvability of this application? It did not. I have no further questions of this witness, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, uh, so Mr. Wade, uh, we now come to the cross-examination part uh, of your testimony. So I will open it up to the parties. Uh, Mr. Vigil, do you have any cross-examination? The Bureau has no cross-examination, thank you. Mr. Hanasco? Mr. Hearing Officer, um, and may we control the screen for purposes of using documents? Please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wade, uh, can you hear me all right, Mr. Wade? I can. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please let me know if you don't, because we want to make sure my questions are clear and your answers. You get an opportunity to answer uh, false and wait. Uh, Mr. Wade, Mr. Uh, uh, Rose stated at the outset that the only thing that was relevant here was the exceedance or lack thereof of opacity limits of 20.2.61. Would you also agree with me based on your 27 years of experience as an air quality expert that the application has to accurately reflect the conditions of the site and as represented in the proposed permit? Is that a fair statement? The application should represent the uh, permitted emission sources for the site. All right, very good. So you're familiar with EPA subpart W concerning the use of meteorological data? I am. And let me just, if I may, put this up on the screen for you. And incidentally, uh, Mr. Wade, we will have all these numbered today, so it will be easy for your counsel to track uh, later on when we're looking at all of this. Uh, first of all, you see the reference in the, the highlighted area, the subparagraph B, uh, indicating that the parameters selected to uh, uh, should represent the conditions of the area of concern? Yes. All right, and below that, we're talking about the uh, proximity of the meteorological data. 
uh, should should it should be considered for the site. Is that right? That is correct. And that, in fact, your uh, meteorological data chosen uh, can be adversely affected by the distances between the site and the uh, the domain chosen for modeling. Is that right? The the distance from the meteorological data collected to the site is is not always an issue. All right, but it becomes an issue where you have topographic uh, characters. Districts of the area that are different than the site selected for the modeling. Is that right? The the selected meteorological data uh, provides uh, wind speeds and wind directions throughout the radius of the facility. Uh, the meteorological data for selected was uh, used because it had a, a, a large amount of low wind speeds and calm winds that um, that uh, produced the highest concentrations for this type of facility. So, Mr. Wade, I'm not asking you why you chose what you chose. I'm just asking you to affirm what the EPA guidance is here. And I think it says in the last sentence that's highlighted, that the representativeness of the data can be adversely affected by differences in topographical characteristics. Is, it, is that just, a, I just wanna know, is that a fair statement? The, the way it's written, that's a fair statement. All right, and if we go to the uh, next page of subpart W, if we could please. All right, and again, uh, subparagraph I is referring to data used to input, as input to your air map model. Do you see that, sir? Yes. Excuse yeah. me, Masco, could you, it looks like the page number of the exhibit that you're referring to here is cut off on the top. So if oh, you're talking about yeah, page I'm not happy to you. Thank you, thank you, Lewis. It's 5232. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Wade, again, the data uses input that AirMet should possess an adequate degree of representativeness, right? To ensure that the wind, temperature, and turbulence profiles are, are representative of the impact here. Correct? Correct. All right. If you go down below there, the uh, it talks about atmospheric input variables. Uh, do you see that, sir? I do. And do you see where wind speed and direction are factors that should be considered in determining representativeness? Yes. Now, in your your rebuttal on page two, I think you talked. You, I think you made an affirmative statement, which you just adopted, that you chose the quote best available end quote meteorological data, and that it was actually NMED who had selected the data. Is that is that correspond with your recollection? Uh, that is correct. With the ex with the caveat that I had originally selected Alamogordo, Alamogordo data as being the most representative because of proximity. Um, Holloman Air Force Base is right next to Alamogordo, so he selected Holloman Air Force Base as more representative. All right, well, let's, let's, uh, let's explore that a bit and look at the emails you exchanged with the Environment Department. And uh, the next exhibit is an email. Can we get the date on that if we go up? That's dated March 16, which is Tuesday. And that is from Mr. Peters of the Environment Department to you. You see that? I do. And this is uh, uh, Mr. Peters suggesting to you, not the other way around, that Alamogordo might be more representative of Alto than Holloman since it's closer to the same mountain range. You see that reference? I do. Well, we don't see any other emails telling us how Holloman ultimately was chosen over Almagordo, even though uh, NMED told you here that Almagordo would be more representative. Do you recall any other emails with, on this subject? No, I just recall a, a phone discussion with Eric. All right. Uh, did you have an opportunity to look at the terrain differences uh, between Holloman Air Force Base, the 
the the area you ultimately chose for modeling and the uh, subject location. Well, what you're showing me is a, a land use data. Yeah, land, I'm land you, use. Excuse me, I'm just asking you if you had an opportunity prior to. I, I have seen that 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 picture in in the testimony. Okay, we we can't talk over each other. I'm sorry. If we let's just make sure that. You know, you get an opportunity to respond and I get an opportunity to finish. So the court reporter doesn't have difficulty. Uh, this is this something you looked at prior to. Your choice of Holloman Air Force Base as the area to conduct your modeling. Prior to no. All right, you see, you, you can see what this depicts. It's a pretty arid area, correct? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Would you agree with me that this depicts? What what one would call an arid desert like area. It is yes, a, right. a combination of high desert and 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 I think there's some some shrubs or it's it's basically desert. Yes. All right. Very good. Can we go to the uh, next? Uh, this is the proposed site. Have you did you have an opportunity, Mr. Wade, to? View this topography before you chose Holloman Air Force Base. I did not. All right, and you see the difference here to the naked eye, do you not? Uh, of the proposed site and Holloman, can we compare the two? Yes, I see that the, it does include some high desert and some. It should be the next one. Some this some deciduous forest. All right, here I put up a comparison for you that might be easier to see. So we're looking at a market difference in the type of vegetation and terrain uh, for the proposed site versus Holloman. Is that is that a fair statement? That is that is a fair statement. Incidentally, you're, you're well aware of the altitude differences. I take it uh, four thousand feet roughly at Holloman versus seven or so at at the proposed location. There, there is a difference in elevation. All right. Let's go. Let's go look at the uh, other aspect of EPA so far. W, which talked about wind directions. I'd like to um, pull up the wind roads at Holland if we could. All right, all right. He testified quite a bit at this Holland uh, uh, a directional. Uh, this wind roads plot and indicating uh, a couple of things here that I'd like to note. First of all, the direction itself is primarily. Uh, to the southeast, is that uh, is that an accurate summary? For the for the high winds, but those high winds are not which what causes the maximum concentrations in the model. Correct, and I think you testified about that. But they do influence markedly the dispersion of fugitive emissions, do they not? At the property high winds. Country. I'm sorry. The high winds have a direct impact on the amount of fugitive emissions at the boundary when they occur. Not as high as the, the, the low wind, low and calm winds. Well, if we're talking about truck traffic and things of that nature, Mr. Wade, at the southeastern part of the facility during a high wind event, one would expect larger fugitive dust emissions than during a low wind event. Isn't that a fair statement? Um, no, I don't I wouldn't I would not characterize it as that. You would not characterize a more windy day as causing more fugitive emissions at the in the directional uh, the primary direction of the way the wind blows in a low windy day. The when we're comparing ambient standard, looking at the ambient standards uh, for this type of facility, it is the calm and low wind speeds that cause the highest concentrations. So uh, the higher wind speeds do not. Cause as high a concentrations uh, for the yeah. for the roads the for the roads the emissions are generated as the truck is driving over the the paved area if this paved area is kept to clean to where it minimizes the, the fugitive emissions then I would not expect anything more from high or low winds. Uh, Mr. Wade, I'm not I'm not quarreling with your your uh, conclusion on, on how standards are measured, and low wind events versus high winds. But I am going to push back with you on the notion that a truck traveling during a windy day at the southeastern part of the facility here uh, 
is going to is going to create additional emissions, is it not? If that road is not maintained properly. Well, the the permit, the way the draft permit reads, it has to be maintained. All right, we'll get to that in a moment. Now, I'd like to just show you the uh, wind roads that I made from uh, the close in Sierra Blanca Airport, and, and this is. Uh, as you can see here, the wind direction is quite different, is it not? It is quite different. And the high wind areas are actually going toward the southwest, which, as we've discussed, could influence fugitive emissions if the roads weren't maintained on a windy day. Correct? Well, I, I'm, I'm disagree with your assumption that the high winds are going to cause increased emissions from, from haul road traffic. Well, I know you are, but just indulge me for a while that the if the road were, is not maintained with sufficient water or, or other suppression mechanisms, you have the potential for more fugitive emissions going to the southwest at this facility due to that road traffic. Uh, I've already discussed this in my rebuttal testimony, and when I modeled this meteorological data set, it produced concentrations lower than the Holloman Air Force Base, Air Force Base data set. So yeah, your assumption, the the mission, the the question you're asking me, uh, I can just say from from doing the modeling, the answer is no. All right. Well, I'd like you. To, I'm going to get to your modeling in a moment, Mr. Wade, and give you an opportunity to expand on that rather than just putting down a couple columns in your rebuttal testimony. But for the time being, all I want to know, for us folks who aren't air quality experts, it seems to me to be pretty common sense that if it's a windy day and, a, and the haul road is not maintained properly with the addition of sufficient moisture, that there are going to be more fugitive emissions in the southwesterly direction from this facility. Objection, Objection. asked and answered. Mr. Hanasco, um, I agree. It has been asked and answered several times at this point. I'm going to ask you to move on. All right. All right thank you. Uh, Mr. Wade, let's go back if we could to the uh, uh, terrain map for the uh, Sierra Blanca Regional Airport. All right. So, Mr. Wade, you, you just testified, and you, and you mentioned this on pages three to four of your uh, testimony, that, you know, I ran the model using Sierra Blanca, and the emissions were actually less. And so, basically, what you're telling us is no harm, no Concentrations. Cost. I'm no, sorry, no, not emissions were less, concentrations were less. Concentrations were less. Thank you for the clarification. But what you're really telling the hearing officer today is don't worry that Sierra Blanca is more representative than Holloman because the emissions are less, so it doesn't matter, or the concentrations are less, so it really doesn't matter based on what, the modeling run you did. What I'm saying is the use of the Rio Doso Regional Sierra Blanca Airport data would not be allowed under EPA subpart trip or, or monitoring requirements for for meteorological data sets to be used in modeling. Well, but you, all, you, said, you, all, you said that today, but you didn't say that in your rebuttal testimony. What you said in your rebuttal testimony is that you ran a model using Sierra Blanca and the concentrations in your view were actually less. So using Holloman, even though it's not representative, turned out to be more conservative. No, what I, what, I, what I said was that Sierra Blanca Airport had uh, over 22% missing data. EPA requires 90% uh, collection data of, of meteorological data to be used for dispersion modeling analysis. Yeah, I, did like, run, you, you I did today. run. Today you said that, but you didn't say that in rebuttal testimony. I said it in a rebuttal testimony. All right, and you ran the or, model. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. I have to look back at my rebuttal testimony to, to see if that was what was said. Well, that was new information today. It kind of surprised me that you said that you wouldn't use it, but yet you did use it. And when you did use it, you found out 
based on your run, that the concentrations were less using Holloman than they would have been using Sierra Blanca. Is, is that a fair summary? What I did was I ran it just to to compare to see if there there was going to be an issue if uh, Sierra Blanca airport data was was used in the modeling analysis, and I found the results that was actually less that Holloman Air Force Base data produced higher concentrations than would be the use of Sierra Blanca airport data. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. I don't mean to be coy here, but if I, I mean, why don't we just use Fargo? I mean, if that turned out to be more conservative, that'd be okay, right? Under your analysis, even though it's not representative. I mean, what's the difference between using Holloman and if it's not representative and using some other location far away, so long as you can conclude that the results are more conservative? There isn't any, is there? The, the meteorological data for Holloman is the, the closest and most representative of the proposed area for Roper construction. All right, well, we just went over the terrain maps and the wind roses, Mr. Wade. I think you, well, agreed, you, you, that you agreed that the terrain maps show market differences in the type of topography in these different locations. Land use. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question on the on the your so-called modeling you did on the Sierra Blanca. If you look at the Sierra Blanca Regional Airport, if one wanted to get a representative uh, modeling result using Sierra Blanca Airport, would you agree that it wouldn't be appropriate to extend that distance parameter to one kilometer only? Because in so doing, you would pick up concrete and runways and parking lots and things of that nature. I'm not following the question. I'm sorry. Well, let me phrase it alternatively. Uh, we're trying to get representative data, correct? Isn't that our goal? Our goal is to to get representative data that will will um, show compliance with ambient air quality standards. All right. Well, then the answer is yes. We want to get representative data, right? So, so. Uh, in this instance, if one were to try to replicate the conditions of the Roper's proposed site, wouldn't it be advisable to extend your distance parameter to say at least three kilometers here so we can capture the train, which is more similar to the Roper location? The, the, the train that was used in the modeling uh, is far exceeds three kilometers. But did you did you go out five kilometers to to determine whether that uh, terrain was sufficiently similar similar to the Roper terrain to give accurate modeling results? The, the the model was run initially with terrain, I, and I can't remember the what the receptor grid was exactly, but it was over. I think it was over five kilometers. It probably was more like ten kilometers. You don't know that. We don't have any data demonstrating that, do we? Say that again. We don't have any data in the record demonstrating that, Mr. Wade, do we? It it is in the it is in the modeling records. Yes, it is part of the modeling protocol. I mean, modeling report. No, you're talking about Holloman, not not Sierra Blanca. I'm talking about the data the, your modeling run for the Sierra when you use Sierra Blanca data. That is not in the record. What your your spatial uh, your spatial data points are not in the record. We don't know if you use one kilometer, three kilometers, or five kilometers, or whether the the the, the numbers that you derive in your testimony at page three to four in that column, you don't know what the basis is for those. We don't know, do we? What distances were used from the, from the Sierra Blanca Regional Airport? What distances were used from the Sierra Blanc Regional? I'm not understanding exactly what you're asking. All right. Can you go back briefly to your 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 uh, rebuttal testimony, Mr. Wade? Do you have that in front of you? You put a chart together there, which indicated the results of your so-called modeling run. I believe it's on page four to help you out. I'm just trying to find the correct 
file. It's testimony adopted. I can help you today if you want. I can summarize it for you. Okay, which page was it? It's page four of your rebuttal testimony. Of my rebuttal testimony. How come yes, I'm not sir. seeing that? Well, you have a you remember making a chart there? You had you had the uh, column and met cumulative concentrations in one column, and you had the Sierra Blanc in the other, and you did a little percent reduction in the third column. Right. So that's trying to indicate that Holloman was actually more conservative. Okay, I'm on. I'm on that table. Right, you see that table? Yes, I do. So, so this is all we've got on your so-called modeling run on Sierra Block. Is that right? This table. Correct. And this table doesn't tell us the distance factors you used at Sierra Block or Regional Airport to come up with these cumulative concentrations. The the distance used is the same as what was used in the Holloman met data. No, I'm not for, worried about for the modeling. But, for the modeling. Well, Mr. Mr. Wayne, you understand we disagree with the use of the Holloman data because it's not representative. What I want to know here is did you use a distance that was sufficient to capture the terrain of the, of the proposed facility? Yes. You're confident of that? Yes. And that's not the, indicated in this document? Some, the, the, the modeling results will show, does show, again, that the highest concentrations are right at the facility boundary for a roper. Uh, it does not extend, as it extends past that, it drops off significantly. And that's what would be expected for this type of facility where you have low release stacks and 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 non buoyant fugitive sources. So I, I don't I think we're ships passing in the middle of, of, of each other here, Mr. Way. I'm not talking about the Roper facility. I'm talking about the use of the Sierra Blanca data. Your columns don't indicate a number of things. They don't tell us, so we can't examine what your distance parameters were, whether those parameters include terrain that is substantially similar to the Roper facility. You see I, I, I think you're confusing terrain with with land use data. Is that what you're talking about? Because when I when I prepared the 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 uh, Sierra Blanca met data set with Air Met, I did include uh, land use data uh, for the the Sierra Blanca airport. And again, I'm not. I'm going to leave this go. We'll, we'll handle this in our our own testimony, Mr. Webb, because I don't think you're quite understanding that I'm asking whether you use data extending far enough out to actually capture uh, land use and land terrain that is substantially similar to the Roper facility. It doesn't appear that you can answer that. Well, I, I can tell you that I did use the through Air Met, the latest version of Air Met. I did use land use data that was representative of the Sierra Blanca uh, regional airport. So that, that, that data file that was submitted into the air met uh, was probably uh, 50 miles square. And we don't have that data file, do we, that you used? No. All right. Now, you also you made a lot in your rebuttal testimony and in, in about calm winds and things of this nature, indicating mm -hmm. that uh, when you ran the models, you you uh, you found that there was there was more calm at Holloman than there was at Sierra Blanca. Is that is that right? That's correct. Now, now you're you're the pro at this, but don't, aren't you supposed to exclude calm hours when you run your modeling? It's the the low wind speeds is what what I was discussing, and if you look at the the uh, both both uh, wind roses side by side, you'll see that the Holloman Air Force Bay data uh, has a lot more low wind speeds than 
does the uh, Sierra Blanca data. Did you, did you, but you agree with me that you, ex you exclude uh, fall, fall hours, is that correct, in, in determining your model, running the model? No. So you included call hours. The the model includes whatever mo whatever data you submit. And you submitted the you submitted that data which included the call hours, so that that was included, correct? Correct for All both right. and, and Sierra Blanca. And did you have an opportunity to to note based on the meteorological data when the call hours and low wind hours occur? At these locations, what time of day? That uh, that can be found in the uh, the results from from Air Met. The right. and, and, from Air. And, and you'd agree with me that the calm hours and the low wind speed hours are generally late in the afternoon and evening hours in these locations. Right. And that, that is correct. Be, and that would be during times the facility supposedly would not be operating, right? That's correct. All right, so it doesn't really do us any good to discuss low wind speeds or, or calm hours if there's no operation at the facility. The facility should have not, the, the modeling should have not reflect the operational aspects of that facility. Low wind speeds usually occur in the early morning or in the late evening. Uh, Mr. Wade, let me uh, let me direct your attention to to the part of your testimony where you you kind of you said again it's a kind of a no hard no foul aspect that look it doesn't matter what kind of trucks you have because we're limited to 305 round trips uh, uh, during what period during a particular period of time. So again, it was it, it seemed to be your testimony that the type of trucks would be immaterial to that determination. Is is that is that right? Yes, especially since the model was run uh, in error of doubling the emissions from haul truck traffic. So you, so you, you actually had a mistake at first, correct? You had a doubling, and then you, you, you dialed that back to three hundred five round trips. Is that right? That was based on uh, how many trucks it would require to do one hundred twenty five cubic yards an hour. All right. Well, let's look at section six, page seven of the application. If we could put that on the screen. Uh, can I? Can I? When I was interrupted on a previous question, you were. Can I finish my response on uh, the low wind speeds? Yes, absolutely. Because um, I, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, somebody was talking over me. Um, low wind speeds usually occur in the early morning. And and early evening hours, um, and Roper uh, will be operating in those hours during those hours, uh, especially in the summertime and spring, summer, and fall times. Did you have an opportunity, Mr. Wade, to determine how those low wind speeds and compare that with the proposed hours of operations? I did not. All right. But that Let's, is based on my experience of 27 years. Uh, it is usually those early morning or late evening or not early evening hours, which 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 uh, has the low wind speeds. All right. Well, based on your 27 years of experience, you also know that different trucks have different emissions, correct? The input it into the the no, truck. No, no, Mr. Wade, Mr. Wade please listen to my question. Different specifications for different vehicles result in different emissions for those vehicles. Is that an accurate statement? That is correct. All right, let's look at uh, uh, session six, page seven. And, and you do a nice job here, I must say. Let's go. All right, you identify the trucks here. It's a fly ash truck. The cement truck, you have an aggregate sand truck, and you got a concrete truck, right? Correct. And for each one, you're having different emission factors. 
because there's different specifications for each of these drugs. Mm, not, not really. Well, uh, the, 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 the okay, so go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt you, but the, the calculations of these emissions are based on the specifications of a fly ash truck, a cement truck, an aggregate sand truck, and a concrete truck, right? The the number of trucks that will be required to operate uh, at 125 cubic yards per hour is uh, included in that, that, that what you have highlighted. Well, the emissions are based on uh, the, the really the only variable between all the trucks is the the weight of the truck. And for the weight of the truck, uh, the concrete trucks are slightly different. If you scroll down a little bit from that, uh, you'll see where there's a, a discussion on the weights. For all the others, the fly ash, the cement, the sand and sand and uh, aggregate trucks are all the same weight. So they are, are represented the same in the, in the in the modeling and in the in the emission calculations. And very good, Mr. Wade. But what we're what we're would you agree we're missing here is a, a, a similar calculation on water trucks. And you testified earlier, even when you're talking about the aggregate piles, you're gonna use water to suppress right. future emissions. So there's nothing in here about a water truck and its specifications and how those emissions would would impact this final result. Is that correct? That is, I mean, based on the number, the the number of trucks that are allowed in a day, uh, they will include water trucks, whether even if it is not specifically specified in this calculation. Well, I, I understand you've, you've already testified that the 305 round trips is inclusive of all truck traffic, whether it's water, fly ash, cement, aggregate, and concrete. Like, we right. understand that. Okay, we're in agreement on that. But my point here is that you don't have any emission factors or calculations for water trucks because you don't know the weight of the truck. You don't know if it's a six-wheel truck. You don't know if it's an eight-wheel truck. You don't know any of the specifications, correct? The, the, the number of wheels has nothing to do with the emission calculations. It is the weight of the truck. The weight of the truck for the water trucks will not exceed the weight of the truck for aggregate sand trucks, cement trucks, or fly ash trucks. And that's not that's nowhere to be found in this application, is it? The weight of the weight of those trucks is just below if you scroll down. No, no, I'm talking about water trucks, Mr. Wade. There's no reference to any calculations on, on emission factors contributed by the delivery of the water that's necessary to implement these pollution controls. There's nothing in here. Can we agree on that? Not specifically, but all what right. I can say is the water trucks uh, will not, so long as you stay below the, the number of trucks per day, you will not be exceeding the emission rates that were uh, calculated for the model. At 305 trucks per day. It doesn't matter if it's a water truck or an aggregate sand truck or a cement truck or a fly ash truck, they all create the same amount of emissions. So if I said uh, take away one sand and gravel or sand and uh, aggregate and substitute that for a water truck, it's going to give me the exact same emissions. Mr. Wade. You just testified earlier that the weight of the truck is going to drive the emissions from that particular truck, correct? Correct. All right. So let's let's go to the, this. Let, let me first identify this next document for you, Mr. Wade. Um, can you scroll up, please. This is an email from you to uh, to uh, Deepika at the NM uh, ENV and uh, CC to Mr. Roper. If we go down to number four, there's a question asked to you here, okay, about your 304 and a half trips per day. What's that based on? Well, the, the question here is, are they, and, and the answer to you is, 
that you can provide is in 304 trips per day are based on maximum production of concrete, right? The, it is based on the maximum production per day of concrete. Yeah, the maximum one being the, the 1,875 cubic yards per day. Got it. And that's all I wanted you to affirm because there's not one trip within that 304.5 trips that you say is devoted to the transportation of water. No, what I said was the, it doesn't matter if that's an aggregate, a cement fly ash, a truck, uh, or a water truck. They will all be considered the same when you when you calculate the emissions that were used in the dispersion modeling. If we don't have any record, Mr. Wade, do we, in the application or in your testimony concerning the relative contributions of these water trucks driven by their weight, as you said, to the total emissions? I think in my testimony, I said that if you stay at the 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 daily truck count, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a water truck, an aggregate sand truck, or cement or fly ash truck. Yeah, I, I understand They're that. All these considered that. the same. I, I understand that, Mr. Wade. You made that very clear. You said, and I, it's clear as a bell that the 305 trips includes everything. I just want you to affirm for the record that we don't have any relative contributions specifically for water trucks with embedded within this application. That is true. All right. So I'd like to direct your attention to section 10, if I may, of the uh, application. And this is a, a, a uh, the, the routine operations of the, of the facility. Um, we, we scroll down here. Uh, that's about all we have there. There's there. I don't see anything in here, and I don't know if you see anything in here. Uh, but as far as routine operations, as far as uh, you know, managing uh, fugitive emissions from the aggregate piles by the application of water, uh, uh, using water on the paved roads, or using anything in the routine operation of this facility, which would require the significant water consumption. In order to implement these pollution controls that the draft permit says need to be implemented. You see anything in here in the operational plan? Uh, I guess I'm, I'm misunderstanding your question. Can you repeat that? Well, I'm, I'm just curious because you, you go through the operational plan. Could we scroll up and get the title of that again? This is a routine operations, but the routine operations according to section 10 don't include the application of the significant water that's necessary to achieve the emission controls that the draft permit reportedly requires. There's nothing in here. There is not. Um, and Mr. Wade, I'd like you to direct your attention and keep in mind for future references, second to last sentence on this particular exhibit, indicating that haul roads on site will be paved and maintained to reduce particulate emissions from truck traffic. You see that reference, sir? Correct. There's no reference to what the maintenance is or is not. It just says it'll be maintained, right? Correct. All right, well, we, I want you to remember this statement because we're going to come back to that shortly, if you would, please. If I go to the next exhibit, uh, 14, uh, section 14. The next page. Next page. Yep. All right, this again is the uh, operational plan to mitigate emissions. Do you see this? You're familiar with this, obviously, aren't you? Correct. And again, talks about maintenance uh, procedures, but in haul roads and 
service control methods, but there's no reference to the application of the, the water that's going to be required to operate this plant. There is none. So except, except for where, where it just says um, water sprays. That's only during shutdown. But that, that, that refers to the shutdown aspects of the facility, not the routine mitigation measures, correct? Actually, I was looking in maintenance. Yes, it will be maintained during starters. You're looking at maintenance? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Uh, during startup and shutdown, you see that reference to the qualification? The, the discussion is, is how to mitigate emissions from startup and shutdown. So it addresses that there will be water sprays. This water yes. sprays will be functioning all the time uh, as needed. Uh, but, but I guess my particular question is, and this reference to maintenance really is talking about doing shutdown and start up. Correct? That is correct. All right, let's go, uh, if we may, Mr. Wade. I want to have a, you mentioned earlier in, in your test, which I thought was, was interesting. Um, About, uh, it was, I think you, the words you use is it was typical of the facility to rely on the uh, AP42 guidance from the EPA. Is that you recall right. that? All right. It is typical, isn't it? You want to look at the AP42 guidance to determine how you should calculate your emissions and so forth? Correct. Is that up so I can see them? All right, so uh, I'm curious because uh, the tall road emission calculations, and this caught my eye uh, during your testimony, you, you appeared to use 0.6 grams per square meter to determine the maximum emissions from these tall roads based on this ubiquitous baseline right. contained within AP42, right? Right. All right. Now, you're aware, based on your 27 years, that this particular emission factor uh, is, is, is used for publicly traveled roads, paved roads, not industrial roads. It is, I mean, it is for roads that are driven less than 500 uh, road trips a day. But that's not all, that's publicly traveled roads. Would you agree with that? No. All right, well, let's, let, maybe we can refresh it's, your memory. Are you, are you familiar with this, the differences between the uh, EPA's preference for emission calculations based on publicly traveled roads versus roads confined within an industrial complex? No, I'm not. All right. Well, let me let me let me try to enlighten you a little bit. Let's move down if we can further into this document. And that's so I'm going to stop you here for a moment. The witness has said he's not familiar. You're not going to educate him. You, he's, well, here I, as a fact, he's here as a fact witness. Please that's right. But I think Mr. Hanasco, don't speak over me. You're here to ask questions to him. He's a fact witness. If he says he's not familiar with what you're going to show him, then move on. But don't sit there and try to educate him because that's not why he's here. So please don't educate him. Please ask your next question. Mr. Wade, are you familiar with the particular designation for paved roads for a concrete batching plant? I know that there's a table that represents an average of what was calculated for uh, concrete batching roads. All right, and, 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 and 
Have you seen this table before? The uh, table 13.2.13, indicating that the how many grams per square meter one should include for a paved road within a concrete batching plant? I can see that, but I, I know again, I'm going to say that that's uh, based on what was measured at concrete batch plants. It's is it is why I have uh, when I calculated the emissions for the paved roads uh, that it was going to be maintained much higher uh, so that no visible emissions are 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 being presented from from haul road traffic at this at Roper's concrete batch plant. So, but I guess that's not my question, Mr. Wade. You, you just that's why. Stated, you stated you're familiar with this table and EPA's requirement that you use 12 grams per square meter for emissions for a paved road within a concrete batching plant. It and is not. It is not a requirement. Well, it's certainly a preference, is it not? It is what they kind of came up with when they when they did their analysis on uh, what paved roads at the concrete batch plants that they uh, were testing at. That's what they what it came out as. So let me understand. You use the emission factors recommended by EPA for everything else, but for the paved roads within the concrete batch plant. I recommended the the emission factor for paved roads based on uh, travel of less than 500 trucks per day. And you use the ubiquitous number, which is roughly 15 times less than the concrete batching number recommended by the EPA. That's correct. Do you know what happens to your emissions when you use the 12 grams per square meter. Objection. Uh, this sounds like direct testimony. Cross examination. Mr. Hinesco, um, again, this is a fact witness. I'm asking you to ask him factual questions. He's, you asked him a question, he said no. And I agree with Mr. Vigil that this next question sounds to me like you're going to try to get him to agree with a conclusion that you've come up with, and that's not an appropriate cross-examination question. Well, I'm not going to have him uh, agree with my conclusion, Mr. Vigil. So I've only asked him whether he has made the calculation to determine what would happen to these emissions if he, in fact, used the 12 grams per square meter set forth. In AP 42. Either answer, and Mr. Wade, did you answer that question? Uh, the answer is no. Okay. Mr. Hanasco, there's your answer. Please move on. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, I'll pass the witness. Mr. Rose, this is your witness. Is there any uh, redirect? Let me unmute first. Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Officer, just a couple of questions. Please. Um, you were questioned by by Mr. Nasco about the use and the propriety of using Sierra Blanca um, met data, were you not? Yes, I was. And my understanding is you explained uh, why that was not used. And could you again briefly explain why you didn't use Sierra Blanca data as part of this applica application? The the use after discussions with the uh, the enemy D modeling section, it was determined to use Holloman Air Force Base data. And was that the recommendation or the requirement of the Air Quality Bureau's modeling section? That was. Uh, the recommendation and what I had submitted in my modeling protocol. Okay, and and you testified as to at length about water trucks and whether or not they were included in your estimates. Um, do you normally you've done a number of these, have you not? 
applications for concrete batch and other plants? Yes, and other I have. Do you routinely include water trucks or though in, in your calculation of emissions? Not usually because most facilities have access to, to water on site. And, and I believe you testified about what the impacts of including the water trucks would be. Could you clarify that as to whether you would expect the, the emissions in your models to be any different if you included the water truck trips? The emissions in the model would not change with including water truck trips as part of the daily count of trucks that enter the site. And I believe you were, you were questioned by Mr. Nasco about the use of dust suppression equipment or watering of the, the piles at the site, were you not? I was. And did the application include um, any provisions for watering those piles? The application did not include provisions for watering the, the storage piles. It included application of water at the exit of the uh, feed hopper onto the feed hopper conveyor. And is the requirement to, to include dust suppression or water to the piles, is that a condition of the draft permit? The requirement, no. It is an option that uh, Roper industry can use that accomplishes the same thing of adding water at the feed feed loader, feed hopper unloading to a feed conveyor, um, ex with the exception that it will actually decrease the emissions because you're adding water at the storage piles. And so that means that there will be additional controls at the loading of the feed hopper, which was not in the original application. And let's clarify. You testified about the modeling results, um, and I believe your testimony was that the model was run without any additional moisture for those piles, was it not? The model was run for no additional moisture to the piles or loading the feed hopper. Okay, and so the additional requirement imposed or proposed here by NMED would lower emissions Low, would lower them beyond what you you modeled in your modeling analysis, correct? Yes, the, the application of additional moisture to the storage piles would reduce the emissions uh, beyond what was originally modeled. And I believe you also testified about the maintenance of the haul roads. Uh, was there any provision in the application submitted concerning how those roads would be maintained? I think I'd have to look back at, at that draft permit condition, but the, the facility will have to um, maintain monthly a fugitive dust plan that addresses any fugitive dust from the site. Um, if the if there starts to be fugitive dust coming from the roads as trucks are driving on them, uh, then they're going to have to increase either, you know, increase the maintenance either by uh, water washing the, the roads or uh, doing more sweeping. And, and let's just clarify that, that those conditions were not in the, in the application. They were additional requirements that NMAD is proposing as part of this permit, correct? Uh, take your time. Yeah, I'm trying to, to find the exact wording. And they, they are the, the, the condition of the permit, the, the draft conditions uh, require that you maintain and minim to minimize the, the silt built up to control particulate emissions. Thank you. Uh, the, the monitoring, uh, you know, the permittee shall monitor the frequency, quantity, and location of water application or equivalent control measures such as sweeping. And that's in the draft permit, is it not? That's in the draft permit. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Hangar, so I have no further questions. Mr. Nasco, before I go to you, Mr. Vigil, uh, are there any cross-examination specifically to those redirect questions? Uh, no, but we know the Bureau has no cross-examination with regard to that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Nasco, are there any cross-examinations specifically to the questions asked? Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Officer. Um, Ms., uh, Mr. Wade, you're aware that this particular facility has no water available on site to control or implement the emission controls, correct? I have been told that there's there's no water directly at the site, but Mr. Roper has assured that enough water to control fugitive dust and to make the concrete mix will be provided. But none on site, correct? Well, they'll, the 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 trucks coming in will store material, uh, store water on site in uh, storage tanks. It's my question. There's no source of water on the property, like. A well authorizing the appropriation of water for this purpose. Uh, I'm I do not have any direct knowledge of uh, this the the site as far as if there's water available. No, thank you, Mr. Wade. No further questions, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, Mr. Rose, does that conclude your case in chief? It does, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, uh, Mr. Vigil. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, the court reporter has been at it for a couple hours now. I don't know if she needs a break or whether you want to just move on to, to the noon hour, but this might be an appropriate place to break for a few minutes if the if the court reporter thinks it's appropriate or necessary. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting that the court reporter will let me know uh, when she needs a break. Uh, Ms. Myers? I'm Okay with the break, if you have time, if not, then we can keep going. I'd rather keep going. Ms. Myers, you'll let me know. Um, you can chat with uh, the hearing um, with the host, the WebEx host when you need a break and uh, we will take a break at that time. But Mr. Vigil, uh, do you wanna give your opening statement? Thank you very much. The Air Quality Bureau is here today to provide direct technical and rebuttal testimony in support of a recommendation to grant the draft permit in this matter in accordance with the Air Quality Control Act and associated state and federal regulations for issuing an air quality construction permit. In this hearing, we're going to hear a lot of testimony by Sonterra's witnesses. It's all designed to bring not to bring subst substantive challenges to the application or, or to the permit, but rather to muddy the water and sow doubt. Taken as a whole, Sonterra's entire case can be summarized as this. Yeah, we know that the application and permit are valid, but we just wish it was different. Sonterra's expert witness testimony reflects this approach. Sonterra's witnesses will offer testimony that is academic and divorced from the practical reality of environmental protection. Their testimony will attempt to create a simplistic, idealized view of the statutory and regulatory requirements that ignore the very real considerations that go into crafting a permit that is protective of human health and the environment. The Air Quality Bureau has a serious statutory and regulatory responsibility to protect the environment and human health. That is their job. It is not an academic or platonic exercise. And the Bureau's testimony in this matter will show that they take that role seriously. Today, the Bureau will offer witnesses whose testimony will show that the Bureau has given a thorough and complete administrative and technical review for both the permit application and the draft permit, ensuring that the respective documents meet all the legal and technical requirements under the Air Quality Act and associated regulations. And with that, the Bureau calls its first witness, Deepika Saikrishnan. Uh would you tell and me Mr. how to pronounce Hill, your name? You, Hold on would, one second, you, Mr. Vigil. Yes, would, you, yes. would, would you tell me how to pronounce your name? Deepika Sai Krishnan. Sai Krishnan. Yes. We are going to swear you in. Um, which of the exhibits are yours? Exhibits. Um, 
one um that is my testimony and i think exhibit two which is my uh resume and you have a rebuttal um yes exhibit yes i have okay. a, re a rebuttal exhibit six seven and eight uh -huh. so one and two are direct and resume yes. six seven and eight are your rebuttal and Mr. V Hill will take you through those to adopt them in a moment after we get you sworn in. Uh, Ms. Myers. Can you raise your right hand for me, please, ma'am. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Would you spell your name, please, for the record? Yes. D E E P I K A. And Sai Krishnan is spelled S A I K R I S H N A N. Please proceed. Mr. Hearing Officer, I have one question. Um, uh, I, I'm assuming that um, you want us to go ahead and go through uh, direct rebuttal, and uh, uh, Ms. Sai Krishnan has uh, Sir rebuttal. She's the only witness that has Sir rebuttal. Should we go ahead and do all, all three yes. in succession? Yes. Please. Thank you so much. Good morning. Could you please state your name for the record? Uh, Deepika Sai Krishnan. And where are you currently employed? I'm employed by the Air Quality Bureau of the New Mexico Environment Department. What is your job title? My job title is Permit Specialist, and I work in the Technical Services Unit of the Permitting Section. What are your job responsibilities as a Permit Specialist? I review air quality permit applications for administrative and technical completeness and accuracy. I coordinate with the public, industry, consultants, air quality bureau staff, and other regulatory agencies to provide quality customer service during the permitting process. If a proposed facility meets air quality regulations and standards, I authorize an enforceable permit that specifies all state and federal regulations, as well as the emission limits that apply to the facility. How long have you worked in the permitting section? I have worked in the permitting section since February 2019. And during that time, how many air quality permitting actions have you worked on? I have worked on over 400 permitting actions. Could you briefly describe your educational background? I have a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Hertfordshire, United Kingdom. And I direct your attention to NMED Exhibit 2. Is this a copy of your latest resume? Yes, it is. And did you submit pre-filed technical testimony for this hearing? Yes. It's NMED exhibit, exhibit one. Thank you. And do you have any corrections or additions to your written technical testimony that you'd like to make at this time? No, I don't. And do you adopt your written testimony in its entirety? Yes, I do. Uh, let me circle back. I want to save us some time here. Mm -hmm. Did you submit pre-filed rebuttal testimony for this hearing? Yes, I did. And could you give me the uh, the exhibit? Do you have that on hand? Um, the exhibit numbers. Yeah, for your re for your pre filed rebuttal, just for the convenience of the uh, of the court reporter. Yes, I do have exhibit six, exhibit seven, and exhibit eight for my rebuttal testimony. Okay, thank you. And do you have any corrections or additions to your uh, rebuttal testimony that you would like to make? If so, maybe we could do it when we get to that. No, I don't. Okay, so you do do you adopt all of your written submitted testimony, both direct rebuttal and sur rebuttal in its entirety? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you, thank you. So sorry for uh, going back on that. Okay, can you please provide a brief overview of your direct testimony? Yes, my technical testimony presents my qualifications, a summary of Ropa construction. Incorporated application number 9295 for their proposed auto concrete batch plant facility. 
An overview of the construction permits authorized under 20.2.72 New Mexico Administrative Code which um, is also abbreviated as NMAC, and a summary of my review of application 9295. In my testimony, I describe the administrative review, which is an initial review that confirms all the required parts of the application are present. I also describe the technical review, which involves verifying emission calculations and determining which federal and state regulations apply to the facility. My testimony also summarizes the Air Quality Bureau's public outreach efforts throughout various stages of this permitting action and the basis for conditions in the December 30th, 2021 version of the draft permit 9295 for this proposed facility. And what is the purpose of the current permit application submitted by Rover? Roper Construction Incorporated is applying for a new 20.2.72 NMAC air quality permit for 125 cubic yard concrete batch plant per hour concrete batch plant to be operated within Lincoln County in the state of New Mexico. The facility will be identified as Alto CBP. I want to, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to uh, move forward if you if you could, and I want to ask you a question about the uh, December 30, 2021 version of the draft permit. Um, do you have any edits to that version of the draft permit that you would like to make at this time? Yes. I would like to add that conditions A503B and A503D in the draft permit version 1230-2021 have been amended to include stricter requirements and add control unit 7B respectively. Ms. Rhonda Romero will discuss these amendments in her testimony. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and can you uh, describe how the department gave formal notice of this hearing as required by the regulations? Yes. Air Quality Bureau staff wrote the notice of hearing and sent it out in accordance with the regulatory requirements in 20.1.4.200.C to NMAC. I emailed no, Ms. Sai Krishnan, let's, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let's skip reading out the uh, citations okay. just in the interest of time. I appreciate okay. uh, the okay. thoroughness, but. Sorry. Uh, Let's just move it, move it along. Thank you. I emailed the notices of hearing to the Air, Qu Air Quality Bureau administrative team to print hard copies of the notices in English and Spanish to be emailed to by postal service to citizens who had submitted only written comments by postal service or FedEx. For interested citizens who had submitted comments via email, I sent out emails with the notice in English and Spanish attached. I also sent the same emails with attachments to nearby tribes, counties, municipalities, class one area, EPA, and organizations that were identified on a list maintained by the department who have indicated in writing a desire to receive notices of application. The, uh, the notice of hearing was also published in English and Spanish in the Albuquerque Journal and Ruidoso News on January 5th, 2022. Thank you. And what other steps has the Bureau taken to facilitate public and stakeholder input? The department wanted to explain the application review process and inform the public about this proposed facility. So we went beyond the notification requirements presented in the regulations. I spoke with the people on the phone and responded to emails and sent outreach emails when the hearing determination was made by the secretary of NMED to keep citizens informed of the status of their hearing requests. I included all citizen comments beyond the comment periods ranging from prior to receipt of the ap application until January 27, 2022 as part of the administrative record. The department created frequently asked questions with answers and an introduction to air permitting document. I shared these outreach documents via email and on the ABQ pay, sorry, 
air quality bureau page maintained for application 9295 so people could access information. Air quality bureau updated the web page to provide helpful information all in one place. Air quality bureau also sent requests for public service announcements in English and Spanish to run on English and Spanish radios in Ruidoso. How does the Air Quality Bureau regulate issues such as noise, vehicle traffic on public roads, degradation of natural beauty, quality of life for residents, threat to wildlife, water quality, water conservation, and property values? The Clean Air Act and state regulations are health-based regulations and do not provide the Air Quality Bureau legal authority to regulate impacts that are not specifically related to air quality. Primary national ambient air quality standards provide public health protection. Secondary national ambient air quality standards provide Public welfare protection include protection, including protection against decreased visibility and damage to animals, crops, vegetation, and buildings. So the Air Quality Bureau cannot deny an applicant an air quality permit and based on these other issues. Many of these issues, such as noise, odor, nuisance issues, truck traffic on public roads, quality of life issues, and property values fall under the jurisdiction of local ordinances. Could you tell us about any shared regulatory processes between the city, the county, and the Bureau? These authorities and processes are independent of each other. How would this permit ensure that the emissions from the proposed facility do not exceed the levels represented in the application and application updates? First, the permit applicant is required to operate the facility as represented in the application and application updates. The failure to operate the facility as represented in the application and the application updates would be considered a violation of the permit and would be referred to the enforcement section at the Air Quality Bureau. In addition, the permit contains operating, monitoring, and record keeping conditions to ensure compliance with the emission rates in the permit. Can you describe how Roper Construction's Alto Concrete Batch Plant meets the applicable regulatory requirements? Yes, the proposed facility as represented in the application and application updates demonstrates compliance with all federal and state regulations. In New Mexico, construction permits are required by 20.2.72 NMAC for facilities with a potential emission rate greater than 10 pounds per year or per hour or 25 tons per year for any pollutant with a national or New Mexico ambient air quality standards. Roper Construction Incorporated's Alto Concrete Batch Plant meets the requirements of 20.2.72 NMAC. This application includes all the contents required by 20.2.72.203 NMAC. None of these listed bases for denial of permit in 20.2.72.208 NMAC are true for this application. Also, according to 20.2.72.210 72.210 NMAC, the conditions in the draft permit are based on the contents of the application and application updates. C compliance with all the applicable state and federal, federal regulations will be demonstrated by following requirements specified in the permit conditions. Thank you. And what is the Bureau's recommendation regarding this draft permit? The Bureau recommends the issuance of this permit. Draft permit. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, let's move on to your rebuttal testimony and let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. On page eight of Santero's statement of intent or SOI, Ms. Bernal's summary of, an, of opinion states that the applicant did not represent the operating schedule consistently throughout the application. She additionally states that, that the facility's maximum daily operating schedule in section 1E represents a start time of 3 a.m. 
uh, to 9 p.m., which does not represent any schedules in Table C of Section 16K. Could you please explain how the permit enforce, enforces the operating schedule? Yes, the draft permit does not establish permit conditions based on the entry in Section 1E of the application. Instead, the draft permit establishes conditions based on production-based limits. These instru the instructions in Section 1E state that the 1E.1 and 1E.2 operating schedules may become conditions in the permit. The 4,509 hours of operation per year comes from adding the maximum hours the facility can operate each day of the month if operating or each day of each month if operating at the maximum production capacity of 125 cubic yards per hour. Condition A108A of the draft permit sets forth the allowable hours of operation for the facility. This condition is based on the permit limit set in the modeling report, which represents the time frames within which the applicant may operate the facility in the specific months, which is a total of 5,422 hours. If the applicant chooses to operate the facility for all of the hours presented in the permit condition A108A for that specific month, the facility could not operate at the maximum hourly production capacity because of condition A108B, which limits the daily production rate. In addition to hourly and daily production limits, condition A108B also includes an annual production limit of 500,000 cubic yards per year. Exhibit six um, is a chart summarizing the allowable operation hours and production rates. Since modeling shows that the operating at the maximum production rate of 100 cubic yards per hour for each hour between 3 a.m. and 9 p.m. demonstrates compliance with air quality standards. If the facility operated at less than maximum capacity, the emission rates for those hours would be reduced from what was used in the modeling and therefore demonstrate compliance with air quality standards. I would now like to respond to Ms. Banal's second part of the question. The operating schedule represented in Section 1E as 3 a.m. and 9 p.m. captures the span of the operable hours with respect to all operating scenarios modeled as represented in Table 3 of Section 16K. This representation is also consistent with Table 1 of Section 16K, where all the allowable hours of operation for each month are represented per condition A108A of the draft permit. Ms. Bernal states on page nine of Sontero's SOI that the weighted average of moisture content for sand and gravel is stated to be 2.65%. Could you explain the basis for this value? Yes. The 2.65% weighted average moisture for sand and gravel is the correct value. This was verified in section seven of the Excel spreadsheet Material Handling Sheet, cell C65, provided on August 8th, August 10th, 2021 by the applicant. The 2.65% weighted average moisture was derived using the formula 1.77% multiplied by 118.8 tons per hour plus 4.17% multiplied by 68.8 tons per hour divided by 187.5 tons per hour. The incorrect values in section six were typographic errors and were updated by the applicant on January 28, 2022. These typographic errors did not affect the calculation of emissions. On page nine of Sontero's SOI, Ms. Bernal states that the maximum haul truck emissions are not supported. Can you provide the basis for the haul road emissions? Yes. The maximum haul road truck emissions submitted in the or original application double counted the round trips in the material handling section of the calculation spreadsheet. This is in cell D239. This was corrected and verified in section seven spreadsheet 
that was provided by the applicant on August 10, 2021. That was the reason for the reduction in the whole truck emissions. Page nine of Santer's SOI, Ms. Bernal's opinion states that the application improperly used hourly emission factors instead of annual emission factors in table 6-1 of the application. Can you explain the hourly emission factors in this table? Yes, section six, table six one refers to the pre-controlled material handling particulate emissions. These emissions have been verified to be corrected in the updated section seven calculation spreadsheet, again provided on August 10th of 2021. The process rate in table six one had typographic errors and was updated by the applicant on January 13th, 2022. The calculation spreadsheet represented the correct process rate, and I verified this. Mr. Elder's opinion on page 17 of Santerra's SOI states that for the operational plan to mitigate emissions, the application incorrectly identifies asphalt production instead of concrete production. Can you address Mr. Elder's opinion? Yes, this was a typographic error and was updated by the applicant on January 28, 2022. Okay, uh, thank you. And let's move on to your sir and final rebuttal. And let me know when you're ready. Yes. I'm ready. On page, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> on page three of Santerra's rebuttal SOI, Ms. Bernal's opinion uh, uh, states that the application does not identify the basis for a requested permit capacity of 305 trips per day for haul road trucks. Could you explain how the 305 trips per day is enforceable in the permit? The application represented the number of trucks per hour, 20.3 trucks per hour in section 2A and in the calculation spreadsheet. I asked the consultant to clarify the basis for the 305 trips per day the consultant responded and clarified that the number of trucks will be limited by the daily production rate. The number of trucks needed to produce the maximum daily throughput is 15 hours per day multiplied by 20.3 trucks per hour, which amounts to 304.5 trucks per day. On page four of Santerra's rebuttal SOI, Ms. Bernal noted that the applicant failed to account for additional moisture to explain additional moisture content supposedly added to the aggregate piles. Ms. Bernal uh, summarizes that the applicant does not account, the application does not account for the moisture content. Uh, could you please explain how moisture content added to aggregate piles is enforceable in the permit? Yes. Section 6, page 8 of the original application states that the applicant is not requesting controls for unit 11, which is the aggregate piles. The applicant also states that for this unit, the control being used is limiting annual throughput. The emission factors used to calculate emissions for this unit are uncontrolled emission factors, AP42, 13.2.4, aggregate handling and storage piles. The moisture content being added to these storage piles are voluntary controls. This is to reduce visible emissions further than what is requested as allowable emissions for the unit in table 2E of the application, but no credit for control is being taken. The applicant also requested additional moisture content to be included as a draft permit condition, A502A. Condition A 502B of the draft permit or fugitive dust control plan also requires that the stockpiles are kept adequately moist. Thank you. I have no further questions for this witness. Um, uh, I, the, the bureau, uh, the, uh, the bureau's witnesses can either stand for cross examination individually or cross examination as a panel. Um, I suggest we do it as a panel. Uh, but I will defer to counsel and the hearing officer. Okay, we're going to do it as a panel, but of course, anyone who asks a cross examination question can direct it to any witness if they so choose. So why don't you present your next witness? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? I'm having trouble here. 
Oh, thank you. I think I'm. I think I'm okay. Thank you. Okay, the bureau calls us next witness, uh, Eric Peters. I, I am. I am here. Mr. I think Mr. Peters, Peters needs okay, to be hold on, Mr. V Hill, hold on one second. Mr. Peters, which are your exhibits? Um, my testimony is uh, exhibit three. My resume is exhibit four, and I don't know what my rebuttal testimony number is. Mr. Veal, I uh, I am getting the um, I'm getting that up right now. Uh, I will be with you in one second. Mr. Peters' uh, rebuttal is enemy D exhibit two. Enemy D rebuttal exhibit two. Oh, I'm sorry, enemy D. Uh, yes, rebuttal exhibit two. Thank you. Very good. So, um, Ms. Myers, would you swear Mr. Peters in? Can you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Do you spell your name for the record? E R I C P E T E R S. Okay, Mr. Vihil, proceed. Thank you very much. Can you please say your name for the record? My name is Eric Peters. And could you briefly describe your educational background? I have Bachelor of Science degrees in Mechanical Engineering and Biology from the University of Illinois and a Master of Science degree in Environmental Engineering from the University of Kansas. And could you briefly describe your current employment? I work for the Air Quality Bureau of the New Mexico Environment Department, which I will call the department, as an air dispersion modeler. I have worked in the modeling section for over 24 years. One of my primary duties is the review of air, disper air dispersion modeling for new source review permit applications to determine if they will comply with air quality standards and other modeling related requirements. Did you submit your resume? Yes, it's the department's exhibit four. And you submitted written testimony and do you have any uh, corrections to make to your testimony at this time? I have no corrections to make. How about to your rebuttal testimony? I have no corrections to make to that either. You adopt both your direct testimony and your rebuttal testimony in their entirety. Yes. Thank you. What is the relevance of air dispersion? Air, air, excuse me, air dispersion modeling on the draft permit. Roper Construction Inc., which I'll call the applicant, applied for permit 9295, which is known as Alto Concrete Batch Plant. I'll call that the the facility. They applied that for that under 20.2.72 New Mexico Administrative Code. The permit application process requires the application to contain an analysis demonstrating that emissions from routine operations will not violate any New Mexico or national ambient air quality standards or prevention of significant deterioration, PSD, increments. Could you briefly describe these standards that are modeled? National ambient air quality standards are maximum concentrations of pollution allowed in the air. These standards are periodically reviewed by the Environmental Protection Agency and are designed to protect the most sensitive individuals from exposure to pollutants. PSD increments are limits to the increase of pollutant concentrations in an area and are designed to maintain the air quality of pristine areas. How does the applicant know what options to choose uh, when conducting their modeling? The department maintains the New Mexico modeling guidelines to provide a basis for acceptable modeling analyses. These guidelines incorporate and interpret the most recent version of EPA's guideline on air quality models, which was published in the Federal Register, volume 82, number 10. 
The New Mexico modeling guidelines also incorporate other information and guidance, such as EPA memora memorandums. Did the Bureau review the modeling submitted by uh, Roper in this matter? Yes, the department reviewed the modeling submitted by the applicant for these permits. The department verified the applicant followed appropriate modeling practices. Details of the modeling review are described in the modeling review report. And what are the conclusions from your review of the modeling in this case? Alto concrete batch plant modeling was performed in accordance with the New Mexico modeling guidelines. If the facility operates in compliance with the terms and conditions of the draft permit, then it will, then it will not cause or contribute to any concentrations above state or federal ambient air quality standards or PSC increments. The facility has satisfied all modeling re requirements and the permit may be issued. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on to your rebuttal testimony. Let me know when you're ready. Ready. Dr. Eduardo Villarreal questioned meteorological data for the modeling uh, in Santera's uh, statement of intent at page three. How would you describe the appropriateness of the data used? The facility is a minor source with respect to PSD. We do not require minor sources to collect their own meteorological data, so we are limited to existing sites that collect this data. Two stations are close to the facility with respect to the large size of New Mexico. These are Holloman Air Force Base and Ruidoso. Of these two stations, Holloman Air Force Base has more calm and low wind conditions, as can be seen from Santera Exhibits 8 and 9. Since the maximum concentrations for this type of facility are expected to occur when winds are slow and steady, the evidence shows that Holloman Air Force Base would be expected to produce higher concentrations. Since the goal of modeling is to predict the highest possible concentration, the Holloman Air Force Base data is acceptable for a demonstration of compliance with air quality standards. And Dr. Eduardo Villarreal and Ms. Bernal questioned versions of the AirMet and AirMod used to conduct modeling uh, in Santera's statement of intent at page five and eight. How would you describe the appropriateness of the model versions used? Um, AirMod is the model EPA requires for this type of permitting to ensure reliability and consistency. AirMet is the program used to process meteorological data to use as an input for AirMod. Both of these programs are mature and significant changes to calculations would not be expected for new releases. An examination of the bug fixes described in the model change bulletins revealed no changes that would affect the modeling for this permit. Since the modeling was performed before the new versions were released and no evidence of changes related to this modeling were found, the reliance on the program versions available when the modeling was performed is acceptable. Dr. Eduardo Villarreal claimed that the applicant failed to include water trucks and other missing sources in the modeling and Satera's statement of intent at page five. Would you comment on the missing sources? If water or other materials are delivered by truck, then those delivery trucks would be included in the permit condition that limits the total delivery truck quantity. Trucks bringing water would not be expected to bias the modeling compared to trucks delivering other materials to or from the facility. Comments about missing equipment may also re refer to exempt equipment. Equipment or activities that are exempt from permitting are also exempt from modeling. Exempt activities cannot be required in the modeling, but are assumed to be represented by the background concentrations added if they are large enough to make an impact. Dr. Eduardo Villarreal and Ms. Bernal observed that the PM10 and PM2.5 models were not updated to account for revisions to haul road emissions listed in table 2-E, and this is in Santera's statement of intent at pages six and 11. Uh, could you describe the changes with respect to modeling? The changes to haul road calculations reduced the haul road emissions. There is no need to update modeling when emissions are being reduced because the concentrations cannot increase. 
Dr. Eduardo Villarreal observed that the elevations were sometimes reported in meters rather than feet. Uh, how would this affect the modeling results? Reporting the elevations with the incorrect unit of measure in the results summary does not affect the modeled concentrations. Dr. Eduardo Villarreal and Ms. Bernal suggested that the Bureau has never approved use of non-default modeling options in AirMet. Could you discuss the use of non-default options? Um, there is no regulatory requirement for minor sources to write a modeling protocol and no requirement for it to be approved. In order to model um, some sources using flat terrain, the selection of non-default options is required. The facility contains many sources that are non-buoyant. Emissions from ground level fugitive sources tend to follow the terrain instead of being lifted into the air and then gradually descending. The use of flat terrain for this type of source is consistent with the AirMod implementation guide and the New Mexico modeling guidelines. Modeling these sources with flat terrain maximizes concentrations by preventing the model from moving the modeled plume above or below the ground. Dr. Eduardo Villarreal and Ms. Bernal commented on particle density parameters. Could you address these comments? The department maintains a, ref a reference that documents particle distributions and densities of commonly encountered sources. The applicant used these parameters. Additional documentation is not expected when this reference is used. The exception is that a higher density was used for source ID CSBH by mistake. The emissions from this source are very small and have minimal, minimal impacts on the results. Increasing the density for plume depletion in AirMod does not necessarily decrease the concentration. When the density is increased, it can lower the plume for that source and increase concentrations very close to the source where maximum concentrations were predicted for this facility. Because of the small emission rate of CSBH and the nearby location of the maximum concentrations, this area error is not expected to increase modeled concentrations. Ms. Bernal noted that units 13 and 14 were missing from section 16, excuse me, 16 O of the application. Uh, could you discuss the modeling of these units? The three heaters were modeled as a single heater and identified as unit 12 or CBPH. Combining separate emission units into a single point is a conservative approach to modeling because it concentrates the emissions. This combination is acceptable. Mr. Elder suggests the wind speeds used to calculate emissions are lower than actual wind speeds at the facility. Could you address this comment? The department has reviewed studies that relate wind speeds, emission rates of material handling, handling sources, and predicted concentrations in AirMod. The maximum predicted concentrations do not occur when the wind speed is at its maximum in these AirMod modeling runs, because the increase in turbulence and dispersion outweighs the increase in emission rates. An emission rate based on an annual average is, more, is a more realistic but conservative method of modeling the relationship between wind speed and dispersion for material handling sources. Considering the new information presented and the modeling provided by the applicant, uh, what are the conclusions from your review of the modeling analysis? Alto concrete batch plant modeling was performed in accordance with the New Mexico modeling guidelines. If the facility operates in compliance with the terms and conditions of the draft permit, then it will not cause or contribute to any concentrations above state or federal ambient air quality standards or PSD increments. The facility has satisfied all modeling requirements and the permit may be issued. Thank you. I have no further questions for this witness and the Bureau calls its next witness, Rhonda Romero. Now, Mr. Vigil, I have a question for you before we proceed with swearing in Ms. Romero. Um, originally, when the first witness testified, she said that her rebuttal exhibit I thought was six, seven, and eight. 
and her direct was one and two. When I look at the list of exhibits in your rebuttal, it looks like her exhibit is one in rebuttal. What am I missing? That's, that is correct. Her, uh, yes, her rebuttal testimony is exhibit one. Um, I, I uh, uh, Ms. Sikrishnan is, um, I mean, she, she's, a, she's not an attorney. She was referencing came along with her rebuttal testimony. Yeah. So, so, uh, and there, uh, her sir rebuttal, of course, was not pre-filed. So let me, let me make sure that the court reporter and I have this straight. So far, NMED has admitted, <clears throat> well, I have admitted into evidence, um, NMED's exhibits one through eight and their rebuttal with uh, exhibits one through eight and through testimony um, exhibits exhibits now a uh, direct exhibits one, two, three, and four have been adopted under oath. Is that correct? That's correct. To end rebuttal exhibits one and two are adopted under oath. That's correct. All right. That's fine. I just wanted to clarify. Okay, so now we have Ms. Romero. Um, Ms. Romero, you're going to be sworn in first. You solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Okay, now, Ms. Mr. Romero, Mr. would you start? Hold on one second, Mr. Beal. Ms. Romero, would you spell your name, please? Sure, it's R H O N D A Romero R O M E R O. It's very hard to hear you. Would you get closer to the microphone and or speak louder, Mr. Vigil? Oh, I uh, I was just saying that uh, Ms. Romero's uh, testimony is NMED Exhibit Rebuttal Exhibit Three. Only rebuttal exhibit. There's no direct. Then there is no direct. Perfect. Thank you. So please proceed. Could you state your name for the record? Rhonda Romero. Ms. Romero, could I, I know it's a headache. Could you try to get closer? If so, you're, you're, you sound a little far away. Sure. Does that sound better? It does sound better. Thank you. And where are you currently employed? I am employed by the New Mexico Environment Department Air Quality Bureau. And what is your job title? I am the staff manager for the minor source unit of the permitting section. And what are your job responsibilities as staff manager? I guide staff in the minor source unit through the review of technically complex air quality permit applications and the development of enforceable air quality permits. I have written and reviewed hundreds of air quality permits to ensure that they are legally enforceable. In addition, I interact with various stakeholders, including the public, industry, consultants, other air agencies, and internal colleagues at the Bureau. How long have you worked in the permitting section? I have worked in the permitting section since February of 2013. I started in the minor source unit as a permit specialist and eventually got promoted to staff manager in the minor source unit in July of 2018. And could you briefly describe your educational background? I have both a bachelor and master of science. And your uh, resume is, uh, your latest resume is NMED Exhibit 5? Yes. And your uh, your uh, rebuttal testimony was directly filed in this matter as NMD uh, rebuttal exhibit three. Correct. And do you have any changes to this that you would like to make? I do not. And do you adopt your rebuttal testimony in its entirety? I do. Thank you. And what was your role in the Air Quality Bureau's review and development of the Roper uh, permit? I reviewed all applicable regulations and reviewed the permit language and supporting documents for legal enforceability of the construction permit regulation 20.2.72 and map. On page 9 of Santero's statement of intent, uh, uh, 
Uh, the summary of Ms. Bernal's opinion states that the application is incomplete because the applicant did not check the box indicating emissions due to routine predictable startup, shutdown, or scheduled maintenance are no higher than those listed on Table 2E. Can you explain how uh, SSM activities are addressed? And, and I just want to say that uh, SSM stands for startup, shutdown, and maintenance. So can you explain how SSM activities are addressed? On page 26 of the original application, the applicant indicated that no startup, shutdown, or maintenance emissions are predicted for this site, and that no maintenance would be performed during periods with no production. Permittees are required to develop and maintain an SSM plan per 20.2.7 and MAC, as acknowledged by the applicant in section 14 of the application. In addition, they are also required to minimize emissions in accordance with 20.2.7.109 and MAC and 20.2.72.203A5 and MAC. On pages 15 and 16, of Santero's statement of intent. The summary of Mr. Elder's opinion states that a 99.9% .9 control efficiency uh, of emissions using a bag house is unrealistic. Can you explain how a 99.9% .9 control efficiency is enforceable in the draft permit? The bag house manufacturer guarantees up to 99.99% .99 control efficiency. If the control device is maintained and operated per the manufacturer's recommendations. The permit conditions A503A, A503C, and A503D and a 503 establish requirements, monitoring, and record keeping to demonstrate compliance with the 99.9% .9 control efficiency that the applicant used to calculate allowable emissions. These requ these require I'm sorry. These requirements include the installation of a differential pressure gauge, continuous monitoring of the different differential pressure across each bag house, and a no visible emissions requirement for each transfer point as determined by EPA reference method 22. If the differential pressure readings are outside of the manufacturer recommended differential pressure range, the permit requires the operator to cease operations immediately until the deviation is rectified. In addition, if visible emissions are observed at transfer points outside of EPA reference method 22 requirements, the permit requires the operator to perform a maintenance check on the bag house and perform all necessary maintenance in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. On page 16 of Santero's statement of intent, the summary of Mr. Elder's opinion state the applicant's failure to implement emission controls for the aggregate handling and storage pile will cause significant fugitive dust emissions. Can you explain how fugitive dust controls from aggregate handling and storage piles are enforceable in the draft permit? In condition A502A, the permit requires that a wet dust suppression system be used to minimize fugitive emissions from units three, four, five, six, and 11. In addition, condition A502B in the permit requires a fugitive dust control plan for minimizing emissions from areas such as aggregate feeders, conveyors, storage piles, and other types of fugitive dust emitting sources. The permit requires that piles be either covered or kept adequately moist to control dust during storage and handling. On page 17 of Santero's statement of intent, the summary of Mr. Elder's opinions also states uh, the claim that the in the application that fugitive dust can be controlled by a central dust control system is unrealistic. Can you explain how control by the central dust control system is enforceable in the permit? The central dust control system is represented as a control for units 7 and 8 in the permit application. Permit conditions A105A, a503B, A503C, and A503D require that fugitive emissions from the cement fly ash batcher and the concrete truck loading be controlled with the central dust con control system. And 
a no visible emissions requirement as determined by EPA reference method 22. On page 18 of Sontero's statement of intent, the summary of Mr. Elder's opinion states that the application is incomplete because it does not identify the emissions from the cleaning operations that are necessary at a concrete batch plant. Can you explain how emissions from cleaning operations are enforceable in the draft permit? The permit condition A502B requires that a fugitive dust control plan be implemented at the facility to minimize fugitive dust. Any observations of visible dust emissions from the pit no. require that the fugitive dust control plan be updated in order to address visible emission, visible fugitive dust emissions. Can you briefly describe the Bureau's recent revisions to the draft permit? In response to Mr. Edler's concerns on the central dust control system, the department strengthened condition A503B to establish more stringent requirements on the central dust control system, as well as establishing solid monitoring and record keeping requirements to ensure that the requirements are properly performed and documented. In addition, the permit condition A503D was also revised to include the bag house unit 7B. The detailed changes to the permit condition can be found in NMED rebuttal exhibit three, and the revised draft permit can be referenced at NMED rebuttal exhibit five. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions and the Bureau uh, calls its uh, final witness. Mr. Uh, Mr. Vijo, excuse me. We're going to go now to public comment. It is uh, 12.02. We are going to take the first 12 people who signed up. Um, if your name is called and you're not ready to uh, provide your public comment, then we will move you down one on the list and we will call your name again. Um, each public member will have up to five minutes um, <clears throat> after you are sworn in. So, Mr. Vigil, we're going to uh, hold on um, your last witness, Ms. Kathleen Prim, for now, and we will come back to her at 1 o'clock um, as time allows us. So, Ms. Corral, are you ready? Ms. Corral, there seems to be something wrong with your microphone. It seems to be muting you and unmuting you. Um, let's try it now. Okay, I apologize. I'm not sure what happened there. There you are. Okay, um, we're going to start off with Susie Santos and then Tom Stewart will go next. So, Ms. Susie Santos. And I believe they're going to be in the jam location. In. Okay, Ms. Myers, would you please swear in the first public speaker? Will you raise your right hand, please? Sure. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please spell your name. S U Z A N N E. Last name is Santo. S A N T O. Okay, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Air Quality Board members, uh, my name is Suzanne Santo and I live in Enchanted Forest. I own three properties in the Enchanted Forest area that were never notified about the plant in 2021. My properties, which are valued at over 750,000, are approximately 33 linear feet from the proposed site. I selected this area for the clean mountain air to retire in, having lived in El Paso for many decades and have invested in a clean air, dark sky community that has a thriving amount of wildlife in the area. I am opposed to the development of a CBP 
at this location and will pray that the hearing members will hear our plea to reject the permit and not allow the plant to negatively impact the Alto community. The White Mountain Wilderness Area, Lincoln National Park, and our homes that we have worked all our lives to enjoy in peace and health. Having worked as a manager in the city of El Paso building and planning department, I'm very familiar with application processes. The application presented is and has been flawed since submission and should have been rejected. The fact that the site cannot meet the minimum distance to the designated federal wilderness area should have resulted in a rejection of the application for that site at, on that merit alone. Please consider the following. Personally, I have seen the amount of particulate matter that is released from a CBP, even with proper emission controls in place in El Paso. My husband was a quality control manager for the largest concrete plant in El Paso and witnessed the impact of surrounding neighborhoods that live with silica dust. The dust settles over the community and adversely impacts those neighborhoods and residents who are suffering with current breathing problems or will cause breathing problems and or possibly cancer in the future. From my home, I will see the emission clouds in the air. I will breathe the silica emissions that will be deposited on my home and my land. And I will hear the constant noise of a BBP running 12 to 18 hours a day. The county does not have a noise ordinance, so there will be no relief for those of us that live nearby due to the continual movement of truck carrying concrete or heavy equipment needed to load the raw material into the facility. A CBP will require high intensity lighting for safety issues resulting in light trespass and will negatively impact the community's appeal as a dark sky community. I have a rental property that provides revenue to the county of Lincoln that will be negatively impacted by the foul air loss of water availability and the possible groundwater contamination and noise generated by the plant. I will be negatively impacted by this plant regarding my property values, which in turn will result in lower tax revenue for the county and the state. Lower revenues across the impacted areas will reduce budgets at local and state levels. The state will have significant losses related to the maintenance of roads and safety issues with large trucks entering the scenic byway of Highway 220 as well. The White Mountain Wilderness was devastated by the Little Bear Fire in 2012 and it's just beginning to revive. Silica dust will harm not only the grass, plants, and the trees in that area, but will also severely impact the health of our local New Mexico wildlife that will ingest the silica dust as they're grazing. Our subdivision and many surrounding subdivisions will be negatively impacted by the amount of water required to produce concrete and maintain adequate dust control methods that is normally mandated for an industrial facility like this. We are struggling with the current wells for our communities, seeing them declining each year. Watching a surface irrigation system spraying raw materials and the plant road for dust control is an insult to every water entity in the area trying to conserve this precious resource. Groundwater contamination will become a serious concern to our community. Simply put, having a third RP, uh, CBP plant in our area is an atrocity to the sanctity of the Sacramento Mountains. Your mission statement is to protect and restore environment and to foster a healthy, prosperous New Mexico for present and future generations and your agency further states to protect the public health of New Mexicans and the nature of the state by preventing the deterioration of air quality. Protect our community, please. Applications that completely fail to meet the standard, um, excuse me, the standards of your department requires that the air quality permits should be denied. I plead with you to reject this application on the technical failure of the permit application and the negative impact of New Mexico air water and soil quality to this region I'm and for the health of our citizens. Respectfully, Suzanne Santo. Thank you. Ms. Corral is next. Up next, we have um, Tom Stewart, and then after that, we'll have Jim um, Spiral, if he could be ready. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, you're going to be sworn in? <clears throat> Yes, sir. Go ahead. 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed, sir. Mr. Hearing Officer, my name is Tom Stewart, and I reside at 116 Tanglewood Lane in Alto. The proposed plant is approximately 1.2 miles from our residence. I've been a resident of the area for 23 years, and the only reason that I came to Lincoln County in the first place was because I was hired as its county manager. I served in that capacity for 13 years. I resigned that position and ran for county commission in 2014. I'm currently in my last year of an eight year tenure. I wanna be clear, the Board of County Commissioners has not authorized me to speak. But as a potentially effective resident, I do feel an obligation to provide my personal observations and opinion on this subject. Making laws for governing our society is supposed to be hard. As one of five county governing elected officials, I can attest to the fact that it is often difficult to gain a consensus on any given issue. Issues of private property rights are especially sensitive. And in my opinion, however, those rights should not be permitted to impact your neighbors in a harmful way. Ever since Roper Construction decided to seek an environmental permit for the concrete plant, I have heard about little else from the constituents in my district. I feel that the price of land in the area of Alto is such that I, and I believe the county commissioners I have served in the past as manager, could never have imagined the need for zoning in such a pristine area as Alto, especially when there is almost 5,000 square miles in this county to consider for all conceivable activities. The best I could get out of my fellow commissioners thus far has been the nuisance resolution 2021-24 that you have been provided. I believe the resolution actually accurately presents the situation and I feel that I am starting the lengthy process of trying to sway the governing body toward considering zoning to prevent this type of proposed activity in areas that are clearly not appropriate when it has so many negative impacts on the surrounding area. As a nearby resident, I realize that this NMAD hearing, as specified by the hearing officer, is dealing with just the air quality issues when there are so many other factors that need to be considered. Deed restrictions, proximity to a national forest, critical water supply for just dust suppression, a scenic byway, concentrated in prolonged construction activity in a residential area, and potential health issues for the surrounding reg residents should all be eventually considered. A reasonable county zoning ordinance could have precluded this entire process, and he, he, it needs to be considered in the future of this county. Unfortunately, such an effort in this case would, would be, excuse me, would be more than a day late and a dollar short. Speaking as a potentially effective local resident, I would ask that the hearing office officer and NMED carefully consider all the expert testimony you have heard in rebuttal of the applications and the NMED experts and find the permit ground, to find the permit, the grounds under its charter to deny granting the permit. I would like to repeat that in slightly stronger terms and in another way, please deny the permit because the proposed activity could destroy the fragile community I live in based on the necessary water usage for dust suppression alone. If the permit cannot be denied and the plant is subsequently constructed, please ensure monitoring of the plant to see that the standards of air quality are strictly enforced for the very health of the residents and the environment. Thank you, Mr. O Hearing Officer. Thank you, sir. Ms. Corral, who's next? Thank you. Um, next is Jim um, Spiro, and after that, we'll have Jim um, Calvo Lynch. Can you spell the last name of the first person? Yeah, S-P-I-R-I-L. 
Okay. Are you ready, sir? Uh, yes, he's in. He's coming up to the camera. Okay. <laughs> and who's the next person in line? Um, okay, so I have Jim Calvin Lynch. And how do you spell that? Uh, K C A L V E L A G E. Okay. Uh, Ms. Myers, would you swear in this witness? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I absolutely do. Sir, with your mask on, it's hard to hear you. Okay, you have five minutes. Please proceed. Oh, would you spell your name, please? A A L V as in Victor E L A G E. Okay, please proceed. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to to speak with you. Uh, I live. Uh, we live. Uh, less than a mile from the proposed plant, and that has been a concern. But after listening today, I really would urge you to reconsider the modeling used. Uh, you talk about using climate data from Holloman Air Force Base, but that's very, very different than the proposed plant location in Alto. Uh, what really struck me was look at where these places are, Holloman and Alto compared to the mountains here, the, the Sacramento Range. Holloman is on the west side of the mountain range, and the plant is proposed for the east side of the mountain range. That that sounds very different in location. Also, it was already brought up that uh, Topographically, they're very different locations. We saw that in the maps and uh, very different locations. Uh, we, we're used to, you know, the, the winds can vary dramatically here, depending on what the weather conditions are. But simply, I ask, why simply not use a local location to, to fit the information into the permit? And the other thing, and I realize we're talking air quality, but the environment department looks at more than just air quality, uh, using water to try to limit the air particulates, uh, whatever possible pollutions, to bring that down to the ground. My gosh, I live right next to a creek. My well is right there and the creek I, I can guarantee you the creek plays a big role in what my well has we found that out when we've searched we've looked to see how deep down the water table is and we've done that several times so the creek plays a big role if the creek is flowing my water level is higher if the creek's not flowing my you know my well is further down into the ground why would uh, the environment department and i realize it's the air quality bureau and they're looking at you know what we're breathing but we have to drink that water too and if it's going to be precipitated if it's going to get moisturized whatever to get that uh, those air particles down to the ground when they go down to the ground eventually they're going to go down to the groundwater and that's right where little creek is little creek is right there and that's an important water source for me. Please think of us here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Corral, who's next? Okay, I have Jim Kellen Blitch. And then after that, I have Stanley Mathis. Okay. Uh, Meta E, that was Jim K. So oh, we're okay. bringing Stanley up right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, would you spell your name, please? Stanley, S T A N L E Y, Mathis, M A T H I S. M A T H I S. Uh, Ms. Myers? Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. 
Would you proceed, please? I'm sorry. Would you please proceed? Oh, sure. My name is Stanley Mathis, and I live less than a mile and a half from the proposed plan. I'm not going to reiterate what has already been said. I just want to add, because I mean, we all have the issues with the water. We believe that the winds will move the particulates to our uh, property. But I just want to just put my two cents in that this board uh, take a look at far more than just what is modeled. The modeling, I'm sure these uh, permits are going to uh, fit in to what your models say that they should. But from what we've seen and from what I've seen personally with the same, with another plant owned by the same owner in Carrizozo, it with the dust all around there and the lack of vegetation, it's a totally different thing than what your model suggests. I'll give this up for someone else to speak. Thank you, sir. Mari. E. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to start with um, Bill um, Horton. And I believe they are in the convention center. I see. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Would you sit down so that we can see you? Ah, oh, there you go. Would you spell your name, please? Bill Horton, H-O-R-T-O-N. Very good. You're going to be sworn in, and then you'll have five minutes. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed. My wife and I live in Legacy Estates, uh, which is directly across the road from the proposed site. We moved here uh, 14 and a half years ago. Uh, when we moved here, my wife had been diagnosed with reactive airway disease prior to our moving here. Within two years of moving here, we moved here for the pristine environment, the clean air, less traffic, noise, etc. Within two years, her reactive airway disease symptoms disappeared, and she no longer requires an inhaler. With this concrete batch plant being 660 feet away from our home, it's inevitable that those symptoms will return and get worse. We are both in our mid to late 70s. We're in that age group where we are much more susceptible to the dangers of pollutants in the air. We are not unique. Our community has a very high concentration of retirees. There's also a Christian school camp within a half a mile of this plant that operates year round. I voice the same concerns that many of the people who, well, the people who have spoken ahead of me have stated. We are very concerned about the impacts not only to the class one wilderness area, to the wildlife, as well as the people, obviously. But we're also concerned about the impacts to the Fort Stanton Snowy River cave system. We, we do not, nor does anyone else seem to know what the potential damage to that critical system is. We do know that the grave system extends out to <clears throat> Little Creek, which you've heard mentioned before, which is just down the road from where I live, very close to the plant, very close to our house. We risk doing irreparable damage to these areas and to our future generations. If this plant goes in, I see no choice for my wife and I other than to leave our home. I cannot risk her help to what this plant will, will produce. Unfortunately, that also means we probably can't sell the house. No one will want to live within 660 feet of a concrete batch plant. I've heard lots of discussion 
about how the permit and the bureau enforces compliance with standards. I've heard nothing about monitoring, about observation, which is going to be critical to make sure that the, the plant stays within its limits. We have tried to find out the history of the plant in Carrizozo. I have been able, unable to find any evidence and others have been able, unable to find any evidence of, of an inspection ever of that plant. So who is going to be looking out for us? If you're truly concerned about New Mexico citizens, you have to consider all of these factors. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Corral. Okay, Mr. Hearing Officer. Uh, next person we have Penny uh, Horton, and she's also in the Convention Center. Okay, Ms. Horton. I think my husband. I think my husband has. Uh, you sure? Let's see. Here we go. Miss Horton, would you yes. please spell your name? Uh, Penny, P E N N Y, Horton, H O R T O N. You're going to be sworn in, ma'am? Oh. Yes. Okay. Raise your right hand, please, ma'am. Do you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please proceed. That was my husband that just talked. So uh, I think he covered just about everything. But I, I am very concerned for my own health being, uh, having reactive airway disease. I don't know if uh, any, any, in the air of uh, so, and we live so close. We live just right across the street from where this plant is supposed to go. So, I'm very concerned about that. I would hate to have to move. Point. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horton. Ms. Corral? Okay, up next, we have at 12 o'clock, uh, Galen uh, Farringston, and he's also in the convention center. Can you spell his name? Yeah, F-I-R-R-I-N-G-S-T-O-N, and I apologize if I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> okay. Sir, can you spell your name, please? Uh, yes, um, first, we have an echo here. Can you hear us? Okay? Yes, you're, you're coming in just fine. Thank you, sir. Okay. My name is spelled first name Galen G. A. L. E. N. Last name Farrington F. A. R. R. I. N. G. T. O. N. You're going to be sworn in, sir. Yes. You raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please proceed. My name is Galen Farrington, and my wife and I live in Legacy Estates, directly due south from the proposed site for Roper Construction's concrete batch plant. Mr. Roper states on his commercial website that, quote, we have a commitment to our community and our customers count on our integrity, unquote, which he references as a core value. I now find his statements disingenuous. On June 3rd, four senior retired property owners in legacy estates, realizing the consequential negative health issues resulting from Mr. Roper's proposed project faxed letters of opposition to Nemet AQB. Not only had he ignored the well-being of an established residential community, he filed his permit request on June 22nd, indicating that there was no opposition to his proposed plant site. His application response shows he defiled his statement of commitment and integrity. 
In my July letter, I stated that the application was not truthful and honest. It was deceptive and incomplete. How could the permitting process continue? I then made an argument for denying the permit due to outdated meteorological data gathered at Holloman Air Force Base because of, quote, similar elevation, topography, terrain, vegetation, and climate at both sites. My objection to the applicant's modeling was, quote, there is an elevation difference of almost 3,500 feet, a terrain and topographic change from high desert to mountainous, two vegetative life zone differences, and eight climate zone differences, unquote. How can data der derived from such dissimilar sites 45 miles apart be comparable? The NEMBED website proclaims, quote, plants, animals, and humans all, all rely on clean air to breathe, unquote. The residents and business people of the immediate surrounding area of Mr. Roper's proposed industry will be negatively affected by any added pollutants in the air. Nemet's position that no particulates will advance beyond property boundaries is ludicrous. Nemet is also tasked by the New Mexico Water Quality Act and the Water Quality Control Commission to prevent water pollution in the state at sites which pose a significant risk to the environment and human health. For cancer survivors, appropriate filtration systems are a necessary financial investment. Our home has a five-stage drinking water system and a three-stage rest-of-house filtration system. The system is not designed to deal with the crystalline silica of airborne cement dust, which will infiltrate water sources. The health and well-being of over 150 residents within the unsafe zone will be negatively impacted forever. Mr. Roper is the interloper and his application to construct a concrete bash plant in this location demonstrates his lack of concern for members of his community. Residents currently living in the area did not choose to live in a life-threatening environment. Nemet has been tasked with, quote, protecting the quality of air for a healthy environment, which plays a critical role, unquote, in their decisions. This is no, there is no fail safe zone within a half a mile of any concrete batch plant operation. Ethically, Mr. Roper should withdraw his application and consider the alternate opportunities offered him. Ethically, Nemet should describe it, <clears throat> excuse me, should deny his application to protect the lives of often marginalized New Mexicans. Nemeth has not even come to put boots, up, boots on the ground to see what this uh, environment is like. After all, Mr. Roper is on record as admitting that Nemed would deny his permit request if it was deemed, quote, socially unjust. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrington. Ms. Corral? I have next Kathleen um, Wink. Also in the convention center. Okay. Ms. Weem. Thank you, ma'am. Would you spell your name, please? K A T H L E E N W E E M S. W E E M S? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're going to be sworn in? Right <laughs> Yes, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do. Uh, my husband and I have uh, been in, we've retired educators. We've lived in the Redoso area since 1975, just built our home last year, two tenths, less than two tenths of a mile away from the proposed site. And uh, so much of what it, I was going to say has been said. I won't take the time, but I just, again, would uh, reiterate what uh, Mr. Farrington said about how can a decision that's going to affect so many people be made without a visit from some of you from Santa Fe? Uh, it's one man's profit versus literally thousands of people's health, well-being, and, uh, and properties, especially health. The issue of containment, uh, we 
have gone over the permit and he's gone over the permit, but you cannot contain the light and the noise and the emissions and the water uh, contamination on his property. It will impact all of us that are in the area. Um, I'm not going to reread the mission of uh, New Mexico Environmental Department because it has already been stated a couple of times. But I would like to say that if, if not you, where do we go? Where do we go as an advocate for all the aspects of the environment? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank Ms. you. Bell. Okay, up next we have uh, Donnie uh, Wimp, also in the convention center. Okay. Mr. Weems, would you spell your name, please? D O N N I E W E E M F. Thank you, sir. You're going to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please proceed. Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, we um, I, we live at uh, 116 Legacy Lane. That was my wife, Kathleen, there that just spoke. And we are less than two tenths of a mile from the proposed Roper Concrete Bench Plant. And one of the requirements that I understand of the permitting process is to be provided by certified, uh, certified mail to owners of record as shown in the most recent property tax schedule of all properties. B, within one half mile of the property on which the facility is located or is proposed to be located. We purchased our property on February the 7th, 2020. We have a warranty deed from the county clerk of Lincoln County, New Mexico, dated February 10th, 2020. We paid taxes on said property, according to the Lincoln County Assessor's Office in November of 2020 and May of 2021. <laughs> we did not receive the required original certified letter from Mr. Roper, which was in June of 2021, notifying us of the intent to build a concrete batch plant on Highway 220. Instead, it was sent to the previous owners, Bart C. and Lucretia C. the Sturgeon of Bernie, Texas, even though we were listed on the county records as the landowner. Then on January the 4th, 2022, we received this letter, certified letter. Weems, Donnie R, and Kathleen A. PO Box 563, Rio New Mexico, 88355-0563. Quote, dear neighbor, this notice was mailed on June the 7th, 2021, by Roper Construction Incorporated to the landowners of record identified by Lincoln County to be, with, to be within one half mile of Roper's proposed concrete batch plant in Alto, New Mexico. Council for the Ranches of Santerra Property Owners Association, Dom, broke Donnie R. and Weems and Kathleen A. Weems, had represented, represented that you did not receive this notice. Roper Construction is providing you with this notice six months after the fact. Sincerely, Roper Construction Incorporated, Box 969, Alto, New Mexico, 88312. We were listed as landowners of record by the Lincoln County uh, prior to the June, uh, June 7, 2021 letter, but did not receive the certified letter. We were actually living in our home at that time. So our question is, why didn't, receive, why didn't we receive the original certified letter if we were listed as the landowners of record prior to June 7th, 2021, and what method was used to determine land ownership at that time? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weems. Ms. Corral. Okay, um, Mr. Hearing Officer, next I have Bren, um, Brenda Restivo. Is and also, 
Uh, she's also in the convention center. Thank you. Would you spell your name, ma'am? Brenda, B-R-E-N-D-A, Percivo, R-E-S-T-I-V-O. You're going to be sworn in? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed, ma'am. I come here today representing my family and as president of the Ranches of Sontero Property Owners Association, a community of over 480 property owners that is directly northeast and anywhere from one half mile to four miles of the proposed site. And I'd just like to say that I concur with previous public comments and thank them for their participation here today. In early June of 2021, I received a phone call from a resident of the ranches asking what I was going to do about the proposed cement plant on Highway 220. I had no idea of what she was talking about. On June 7th, I drove to the site and took a picture of the permit application posted 40 foot off the roadway on an eight and a half by 11 uh, poster. And so it began a fight against a moving target, one where you have continuously allowed Mr. Rover to amend his flawed application to resolve issues addressed and discoverable evidence submitted by our attorney. We were given deadlines. Mr. Rover wasn't. We, the ranches of Zontero, started with letter writing, which led to this public hearing. Phone calls and research. This was an arduous task and our concerns grew to where we felt we had to hire an attorney to rep represent us. We formed a coalition of the surrounding community and reached out to those outside our Highway 220 corridor boundaries, a costly venture for a predominantly senior community. The ranches of Santerra community voted to approve 50,000 to start our litigation fund. And we have received donations from over 250 individuals to aid in this fight. We are putting ourselves in debt to fight for our rights. Individuals concerned about air quality, water rights, the environment, safety, wildlife, the very air we breathe. With passion, we are in this fight. Personally, my husband and I live less than three quarters of a mile from the site, which we can see from our living room and deck. You have victors. If you live here, you have experienced the continuous springtime winds in excess of 30 miles per hour, which carry fugitive dust to the ranches of Santerra, directly northeast of the site. This past year, we've had winds carrying over to the fall and winter, thus of over 60 miles per hour. We retired here in 2010. This is our only home, and we came here to escape the noise, traffic, and pollution of a large city in New Jersey. We were attracted to the area because of the beautiful, pristine views, quiet, clean air, and the abundant wildlife. In 2012, we thought we were going to lose all of this in a little bit of fire. We were fortunate to have only lost trees and vegetation as the fire came within 150 feet of our home. Our thanks to the courageous efforts of our firefighters. And now, here we are, fighting to preserve our homestead again. If this plant is allowed to be built, we will no longer be able to enjoy our beautiful land because of the air and noise pollution. And we fear that our well will also go dry because of water needed to sustain this cement facility. I'm urging you to come down here and visit the site of the, this proposed batch plant to see the lives that will forever be disturbed by allowing this project to go forward. Homes directly across the street and behind the site a business that will be destroyed from the fugitive dust and pollutants. Lifestyles and health of individuals, the homes that will be unsellable, and the life savings of these residents will be depleted, all for the sake of one individual, Mr. Roper, and his greed. He doesn't care about any of us. I hope you do. We are not a piece of paper or a model. We are real people living in a real community. Please deny this application and protect this community. The project doesn't belong. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Restivo. Ms. Corral. Okay, up next we have Craig uh, Kathy. 
<clears throat> and also on the convention center. Would you still spell your name, please? Craig C R A I G, Kathy C A T H E Y. You're going to be sworn in, sir. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please proceed. I'd like to talk about the human elements of this situation, not the mathematical elements, but it, it pains me to see that the Air Quality Bureau did not do its own study. Roper's expert witness did not do his own study. What he did is take numbers that are standard and put them into an equation and spit out some numbers. And what happened was Mr. Roper submitted an application which was approved and is deemed to be uh, what, what's the word administratively complete on the 22nd of July, my birthday. Uh, this application has been modified again and again. Uh, and the site where it's proposed to go is surrounded on all sides by established residential neighborhoods. And you've heard from some of the, our, my neighbors. It, it is a threat to our very existence in these neighborhoods. My home, where my, myself and my wife live, my property is less than 100 yards across the highway from the perimeter where Roper wants to build his concrete batch plant. He proposes to run that plant 18 hours up to 18 hours a day, beginning at as early as three o'clock in the morning and running till nine o'clock at night. I can't imagine how the plant would be able to operate during nighttime hours without violating the 1999 New Mexico night skies ordinance. And I can't imagine the noise noise which experts predict will exceed allowable federal noise levels in my neighborhood, Legacy Lane. I can't imagine the, that wet suppression techniques will eliminate all of the fugitive respirable silica dust that the concrete batch plant will generate. I can't imagine that even if it is possible to control that dust with wet suppression, I can't imagine where Roper is going to get the water to run the plant in the manner described in this application. And I can't imagine that NMED has, a, has an air quality permit application process that allows the applicant to submit an application. And when it is being reviewed, if omissions and inaccuracies are quest or questionable data is found, NMED goes back to the applicant, discusses the issues, and allows the applicant to revise the application again and again and again and again and again, up to 10 times in Mr. Roper's case, addressing over 20 separate issues. It seems like unless an applicant is dumber than a rock, they finally figure out exactly what NMED wants them to say, and they say it. And then they get NMED approval. 
Now, there are many states in the country where uh, setback laws from concrete batch plants are being uh, introduced to allow concrete batch plants to be no closer than 440 yards to schools or residences. In, in some cases, it's 880 yards. I wonder why New Mexico can't do that. It's not in practice here. This plant, if it goes in, is going to destroy lives. It's going to destroy property values. I cannot understand how the state of New Mexico would allow this to happen and allow a company to build and operate a concrete batch plant that is based solely on air quality. Your time is up. It's been five minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. May we have the next person, Ms. Kudal? Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Officer, um, and this would conclude the 12 um, members, the first 12 okay. members of the public, um, and this is going to be Ellen um, Hightower, also in the Convention Center. Good okay. Would you spell your name, please? Yes, E-L-L-E-N-H-R-G-H-T-O-W-E-R. Ms. Hightower, you're going to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please proceed, Ms. Hightower. Thank you, officer. Uh, initially, I was going to reiterate letters I've written to the state, but they're too numerous. I've made phone calls, emails, I've spoken to Vivica. And Madai, can you speak, uh, Ms. Hightower? Can you yes. speak a little louder so that the court reporter yes. can catch your? Yes, thank you. I think thank you, ma'am. Because <laughs> they know I'm loud. This group is. Um, Closer to this one. Thank you. Somebody. Are we good? Yes, we are. Now. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, I'm Ellen Hightower. My husband and I purchased 11 acres of land in 1997 and built our home in Alto after having lived in Lincoln County for over 40 years. We live directly on Little Creek, which has been mentioned. It's a water source that we love. We have two springs. We also bought land with an enormous apple orchard already established, and we built a cherry orchard as well. So Little Creek is a water source that's invaluable to us. We were not notified, as were so many other residents of the area. We live less than a half mile and have resided there paying taxes for over 25 years. That is a problem with me with MED permitting. Supposedly that's a standard. I want to make exception also to Mr. Hill's statement, sir. We take exception to the testimony that you presented just a little while ago. I don't think you have done a job well. The permit has been rubber stamped way prior to the last two hearings. We are an apparent, unconcernable group of people who have no valid concerns with health, welfare at all as New Mexico residents. Now, I'm going to continue and say I've submitted numerous letters, many phone calls, and I have gone over the following. Violations of New Mexico Night Sky Act, violations of federally protected White Mountain Class 1 wilderness area, violations of deed restrictions, violations of federal and state regulations for the United States, as well as New Mexico Scenic Byway, violation of proximity to a federally protected Native American established reservation, violation of the proximity to a school and camp that houses children, I'm appalled that this has gotten this far and I'm saddened by it. I have one more statement to make. And it's on a personal note. Having said that our issues as a community are not so much about just air quality as you have outlined. Everyone is opportunistic without exception. 
only the degree of one's opportunism separates from others. How far is one individual willing to go for how much he wants to profit? To get what Mr. Roper wants, he's willing to go to any length, any length. He will and has gone beyond what's lawful, decent, or moral. He will continue along with his financial backers to hurt his neighbors, friends, and family. I pray that you all at the New Mexico MD will not in turn just turn a blind eye to the obvious attempt to greed, hurting thousands for the benefit of one. And as a footnote, when your friend and neighbor turns his back on you after you have offered to purchase the land, the site for double what he invested, and create a community park for our environment, when you have held his hand at a hospital, and you have prayed with his wife and children, and you have pleaded for your community, it is obvious to us it's about greed and profit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hightower. We are going to return to the New Mexico Environment uh, Air Quality Bureau's uh, case in chief. Uh, Mr. Vigil, you were about to call Ms. Prim. Yes, Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, can we have about 30 seconds to prepare? By all means. And then for the public, we will come back at five o'clock and we will take more public comment at that time. Uh, again, uh, using the virtual sign in sheet uh, to. Uh, to order the uh, testimony, thank you. Uh, Ms. Prim, would you spell your name please? Sure, it's Kathleen, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N, last name Prim, P-R-I-M-M. -M. Okay, and you're going to be sworn in? <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And before we begin, Mr. Vigil, which exhibits uh, are you, is Ms. Prim carrying in? She's enemy uh, rebuttal exhibit four. Okay, so no direct, just rebuttal. Just rebuttal. Very good, number four. Okay, please proceed. Please state your name for the record. Kathleen Prim. And where are you currently employed? I'm employed by the Air Quality Bureau of the New Mexico Environment Department. And what is your job title? I'm a supervisor in the minor source unit of the permitting section. And what are your job responsibilities as a supervisor? I manage assigned staff in the minor source permitting unit and regulatory and technical activities, including their review of air quality permit applications and their development of enforceable air quality permits. I also coordinate with various stakeholders, including the public, industry, consultants, other air agencies across the nation, and internal colleagues here at the Air Quality Bureau. How long have you worked in the permitting section at the Air Quality Bureau? I've worked in the permitting section since June of 2008. Prior to becoming a supervisor last April, I was a permit writer at the Bureau for about 13 years. I reviewed air quality permit applications for administrative and technical completeness and accuracy and wrote legally enforceable permits that specified all applicable state and federal regulations, as well as the emission limits that applied to each facility. In your time with the Bureau, how many air quality permitting actions have you worked on? I've worked on over 600 permitting actions. Could you briefly describe your educational background? Sure, I have a Bachelor of Science degree from New Mexico State University. And is your resume, has your resume been submitted to your knowledge as NMED Exhibit 6? Yes, that's correct. And you submitted a pre-filed rebuttal testimony in this hearing as NMED uh, Rebuttal Exhibit 4? Yes. Do you have any corrections or additions you'd like to make to your testimony at this time? No, thank you. And do you adopt your written testimony in its entirety? Yes, I do. 
I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip your summary in the interest of time, uh, and I'll be asking you today to address the opinions provided by Mr. Martinez in his testimony. On page 12 of the property, pro, or, uh, excuse me, on page 12 of Santerra's statement of intent, Mr. Martinez states, uh, gave the opinion that the application is complete because the lack of identification of a source of water that constitutes the majority of emission control equipment. Does the Bureau have the regulatory authority to request that Roper identify the water sources available to control particulate emissions as represented in the permit application? No, the Air Quality Bureau does not have the regulatory authority to require permit applicants to prove that the water resources are available to control the emissions as Mr. they represented Mr. in their permit. Mr. Hearing Officer, I'm going to lodge an objection if I made and that's a legal conclusion beyond the expertise of this particular technical witness. Mr. Beal? Oh, uh, well, I mean, she. Uh, <laughs> She uh, is a, uh, a permit specialist. Um, they have to uh, refer to the law in order to write permits. Um, and so it, it is, they have to know uh, the legal requirements. It is not, um, it's not conceivable on the one hand to say that bureau staff did not do a good job because they didn't write a permit that adhered to the uh, legal requirements. And on the other hand, object when they are explaining why they did adhere to the legal requirements. So, it, it, you know, I, I respect the, the oh. zealous advocacy, but it seems a little bit like they're asking to have, have it both ways. Okay. Mr. 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 Uh, hold on, Mr. Mr. Hearing Hearing sure. um, first of all, I think the court reporter would like to take a break. So we are going to take, uh, and I will think about this objection over the break. We're going to take a 10 minute break. It is 101 PM. We're going to come back at 111. Uh, Ms. Myers, is that sufficient? Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, we're off the record. Uh, I'm going to sustain the objection. Uh, Ms. Prim is not an attorney. However, Mr. Veal, I think you can ask the question in another format. To get the same answer. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hangoffer, before you get there, um, I noticed I wasn't allowed to opine on, on the objection, but since you've already ruled, mm -hmm. um, I won't offer, but I did have a response to the objection as well. Well, Mr. Rose, uh, since it wasn't your witness and um, it didn't occur to me to uh, to ask you your opinion about someone else's objection. And I want to be careful that we don't have parties uh, basically ganging up on each other. So uh, I, I kept that between Mr. Hanasco and Mr. Mr. Vigil, but thank you for, thank you for, for that. Um, Mr. Vigil, would you proceed please? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Prim. Uh, is there anything in the regulations uh, or the statutes, the air quality, the air quality control act or the construction permit regulations that uh, require that the bureau um, require an applicant to prove up water resources uh, for the purposes of an application? No, in, in matters relating to water rights, um, those are not regulated in the clean air act or the New Mexico Administrative Code. Okay, uh, let's see here. Under the, air, um, under the air quality section, I should specify. Okay, thank you. Um, I, let me, uh, let, give me just a second. I'm trying to reformulate the second part of this question. May I interrupt again? again I, I don't have a, I'm gonna object again. I don't wanna interrupt Mr. Deal's examination. It's simply not productive to do that. But the, 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 the I think the hearing officer was, implying that we, he, she can certainly testify as what the practices of the Bureau historically in using or, or requiring the applicant to demonstrate a sustainable water supply. I have no objection to that. I do have an objection when she says what the Clean Air Act requires and what it allows. So that that's that's a point. It's a fine point, but I think you're almost there. But but I don't I, I think it's objectionable as asked again. 
Okay, so Mr. Hanasco, I've already ruled on the objection. Um, is there a new objection to that answer that she gave? Yes, yes, sir. And can you concisely state what it is? Yes, I don't think the witness is, is qualified to testify as to what the Clean Air Act allows or does not allow. I think she is qualified to testify as to what the Bureau does in terms of requiring the applicant to demonstrate a sustainable source of water to enforce a pollution control. Mr. Hanasco, I'm looking at Ms. Prim's um, resume and she is the supervisor of the minor source unit of the permitting section of the Bureau. Um, this is a minor source, uh, which is my understanding. Um, uh, I take her answer within the bounds of her um, of her resume uh, from her experience. So I overrule the uh, the second objection you've just made, and I'm going to ask Mr. Vigil to continue. Thank you, uh, Ms. Prim. Uh, now, what happens if uh, there is a failure to apply water? Uh, as represented in the application? Well, the Bureau does have the regulatory authority to enforce on the failure to apply water as represented in the permit application and emission calculations and as required by the air quality permit. Okay, thank you. On page 14 of Santero's SOI, Mr. Martinez states that the application is incomplete because it does not identify the amount of water for the additional moisture content required to obtain the emission controls necessary to control emissions at units three, four, five, and six. Should the Bureau require the permit applicant to identify the amount of water required to control emissions at units three, four, five, and six? No, the amount of water required to control emissions for these units is not quantified in the application or the draft permit because the amount of water required to control particulate emissions from these units depends on multiple variables such as precipitation, wind, and temperature. Compliance with allowable particulate emission limits for these units is demonstrated by maintaining and operating a wet dust suppression system according to requirements in condition A502A of the draft permit. Okay, I want to drill down a little bit and just ask you a little bit more technical uh, question, maybe not technical. Um, so, uh, would based on your experience and based on what you know about the permit, would the amount of water required for dust suppression be different, say, when it was snowing outside than when it was uh, uh, sunny and warm? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, are the Hall Road fugitive emissions from water trucks delivering water to the facility accounted for in the draft permit? Allowable particulate emissions limits from the paved Hall Road at the facility are established in Table 106A of the draft permit. Compliance with those limits is demonstrated by limiting truck traffic. Condition A112A of the draft permit limits the truck traffic on the paved roads at this facility to 305 round trips per day. This condition requires the permittee to monitor the total number of round trips per day and keep records of the total number of halt trips per day. Water trucks are not excluded from this condition. Okay, uh, at, um, at risk of, uh, of irritating you, I wanna circle back to this issue of uh, seasonal water use. I just wanna be very clear about this. Now, you, what you said a second ago was that the amount of water when it was, uh, say, snowy and cold outside used for uh, emission controls is going to be a little bit different or maybe drastically different. I, I, I'm not a witness here. Um, in uh, the warm, uh, warmer months when it's warm and sunny outside, is the, is the variation between those two amounts of water, at least in part, the reason why? the amounts of water are not necessarily uh, required in the permit? That's correct. Um, the condition for the wet dust suppression system speaks to visible emissions and inspecting equipment to make sure that uh, visible emissions are minimized. So it's not, um, it's not a quantitative 
value in the permit. It's based on real life conditions. These facilities are outside, of course. So the, the elements um, have a big impact on the emissions and how much water is required to minimize fugitive dust. Okay, thank you so much. I have no further questions. Uh, Ms. Prim is our last witness. And so uh, the Bureau's witnesses will stand for cross-examination. Okay, and we'll start out with the applicant, uh, Mr. Rose. Mr. Hearing Officer, we have no questions of these witnesses. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Hanasco. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. We do have questions, and uh, I'll begin briefly with Ms. Ms. Prim, if I may. Uh, Ms. Prim, did I notice you, you said earlier that there's nothing in the Clean Air Act that quote requires end quote you to consider water usage uh, in a permit application. I think that was your term, requires. So, um, in, ge in general sense, do you know of anything in the Clean Air Act that prevents you from considering the availability of water if the use of that water is a condition of the permit to control emissions? No, um, I don't know of anything that prevents me. But I do want to clarify, um, I said that it doesn't require me to ask the applicant to prove what their source of water is. Um, nor does it require, nor does it re uh, prevent you from requiring the applicant to prove what their source of water is, does it? Nope, that's correct. Well, let's look, let's just, let's bolster this by looking at section 7427. I'm spe uh, specifically looking at the highlighted portion in paragraph D. Do you see that, Ms. Prim? Um, is it possible to make that a little bit bigger? It's tough yeah. for me to see that. Uh, yeah, sorry, absolutely. Just one second, Ms. Prim. I'm sorry about this. That's okay. Is that better? Is that better, Ms. Fro? Yes. All right. All right. So, let me move forward. so clearly, out of the statutory authority of the department, the, the, you can specify conditions under the permit, correct? Correct. And, and one of those conditions you may specify is a requirement that the source install and operate control technology as determined on a case-by-case -case basis, sufficient to meet the standards, rules, and requirements of the Air Quality Control Act. Did I read that accurately? Yes. All right. And that's a pretty broad statement of authority to implement and operate control technology and impose conditions on it. Am I right? Um, it's... That's an observation, but you read the, the citation correctly. Well, I'm, a, I'm here to ask you questions still. Would you agree with me? If you can, you can install and, and operate control technology to turn the, on the, the question asked and answered objection. The question was asked and, and Ms. Prim answered. Mr. Hanesco, Mr. Hanesco, uh, I sustained your objection a little while ago because Ms. Prim is not an attorney. Um, I, uh, and you're now asking her to interpret a statute and I, I'm going to sustain the objection, but on different grounds. So please move on. Ms. Prim. So the reason I'm asking these questions is you did in fact. Impose certain requirements on Roper and the strap permit. Is that right? We did. And 1 of those requirements you imposed was the use of water to effectuate control technology. Right? That's correct. Now, let me ask you a question. Just put aside water and all the technical jargon we've been speaking about today. Let me ask you if if the applicant said, I'm going to put jello on the aggregate piles to control emissions, and I'm going to need 14 acre feet of jello to make sure I comply with the regulations, 
Would it be a reasonable question to ask where you're going to get all the yellow? Objection that's calling for speculation based on a silly, uh, silly uh, analogy. Mr. Hinesco? I don't know if it's silly. I think it's pretty apropos. Mr. Anasco, you're asking the witness who was a fact witness to uh, to, uh, to a hypothetical question, which I feel is out of bounds. So please rephrase your question or move on. Okay, let me try to rephrase it for you, Ms. Groom. So you're remind me, are you there? You're the supervisor of the of the uh, uh, minor source air quality permit division, or however you divide up your responsibilities. Is that right? Yes, sir. I'm the supervisor of the minor source unit. I think you said you've done like you know 250 air permits or supervised that many air permits. Is that a right number? I've done more than 600 permitting applications. 600. I'm sorry, I undercounted. So you know, based on your experience, I'm, I'm just using this. It may be an absurd example, but I think it drives home the point of ensuring that emission controls. Are actually effectuated as per the applicant's representations. So back to my Jello example, based on your 600 applications that you reviewed, and someone proposed a particular methodology to implement controls on emissions. Wouldn't you require them to show you that they have the ability to satisfy and implement that methodology? Is that a reasonable request? Well, I I don't disagree with your. Um, your opinion that the use of water water is critical at this facility, this proposed facility, but where we differ in opinion is you're implying that it is our job to source their water, and uh, that is not something that the Bureau does. Well, I want to correct that. Please, Ms. Prim, I'm not implying that you source their water. What I'm asking, and please tell me if you agree, is that you, as the department, determine whether the applicant's proposed sourcing of water is sufficient to meet the control technology that you've required. Is that an unreasonable request? We review their calculations, and when their calculations are dependent on the use of water as a control, um, a method of controlling fugitive dust, um, that is required to be a condition in the permit, and it is a condition in the permit. Um, in this case, it's condition A502A for the wet dust suppression system. They also have a fugitive dust control plan that's required in condition A502B of the permit. Right. I, I understand where you are on this, Ms. Prim, and, and, and the Bureau, that, that you're going to impose a water requirement, but not find out if they can actually meet it. I get that, but, no. but in, in, well, hold on now. You're only gonna you're only gonna shut them down if they don't meet it. But if they if they can't meet it, you're not you're gonna issue the permit anyway. If they don't they don't demonstrate that they have a satisfactory water source, isn't that right? If they are not operating um, according to condition A five hundred two A, and visible emissions are not minimized according to A five hundred two A or A five hundred two B, that is a violation of the permit. They have to cease operations. We could enforce on that. Right. Well, you and I at least agree on one thing, don't we? We agree that there's no prohibition in the Air Quality Act saying that the Air Quality Bureau cannot require the applicant to demonstrate the ability to comply with the condition of the permit. Um. I am not prohibited from asking them what their source of water is if I wanted to. I think that's what you're asking me. Yeah, that's that's good. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Prim. I'd like to move over to Ms. Romero, if I may, Mr. Hearing Officer, briefly. Is Ms. Romero available? I'm here. Hi, I just don't see you on the screen yet, I guess. There you are. Hello, Ms. Romero. Hello. So, Ms. Romero, I just just a couple of questions, and you're uh, uh, you made you made some comments about enforceable restrictions in your testimony. Do you recall that? I do. 
And yet, are you, are, I assume you're, you're familiar with the concept of federally enforceable restrictions under the Air Quality Act? Yes. And uh, of course, we're doing a state act, but but you mentioned that that the the there's an enforceable restriction in this permit uh, on the aggregate piles in particular because water has to be applied in order to control emissions. And in your judgment, that's enforceable, right? Yes. All right. So let me just understand. Are you are you suggesting today in your testimony that the requirement to apply water to the aggregate piles is an enforceable restriction in this permit, proposed permit, but yet you have no idea how, because Roper hasn't disclosed to you how, water is going to be made available to be applied to those piles. I just want to get that straight. Is that is that correct? That's right, but they in their application, they did represent that they were going to use water. So that demonstrates to me that they have the intent to use water to meet the requirements of the permit. Okay, well, better yet. So if I just state in an application, I'm gonna use water, that's sufficient and I, it's presumed that I will have that available water to achieve the emission controls mandated by the permit? Yes, otherwise they're, you know, they're not meeting the requirements of the permit and they are going to be in violation of the permit. But they have, there's no requirement in your judgment to demonstrate that, that they can comply with the permit before the permit is even issued. We, the requirement is there and if they don't meet it, then we enforce on them. That's. Okay. So we wait and see, is that right? We wait and see and see how they do. Well, the yes. representation of water will be applied. If they don't have water, then we'll, we'll act after that. Instead of before, well, they certify in their application when they submit it, they certify that that is the, the intent. Everything in their application is true and accurate, and that's what. And that's nothing in the application tells you where that water is going to come from, right? Objection asked and answered. I'm going to sustain the objection, Mr. Hanasco. You've asked the question multiple times in multiple ways. Please move on. And that's all I have for uh, Ms. Romero. Please continue your cross examination. I'd like to uh, direct some questions to Mr. Peters, if, if we may. I'm here. Hi, Mr. Peters. Hi. Put you up there. There we go. All right. All right, Mr. Peters. Um, your job, part of your job, or someone under you is to approve all modeling submitted to the department, right? Yes, not all modeling, but I approve, I review modeling and approve it if it's approvable. All right, so so no one can go forward without do a modeling run and, and, and submit it unless that's approved by the environment department, correct? Um, if there's a permitting requirement to do modeling, then they are required to do modeling in order to get the permit. All right, and here there is a permit requirement to do modeling, correct? Yes. All right. So in this instance, I'm, I'm just focusing on, you saw the rebuttal testimony of Mr. Wade, where he put those two charts together and mm -hmm. there were emission factors for uh, Holloman, based on Holloman data, and another column of emission factors on uh, what he thought were Sierra Blanca. Oh, he ran that model. Did you see that? Yes, I saw those. Those were concentrations, not emission factors. Did he present those modeling results uh, to you? Um, I I saw that in his uh, testimony. No, no, that's not what I'm asking. Did he present those modeling the modeling runs and the results to you for approval? No. So you, like I, am simply relying on the columns he has on page three and four. Of uh, his rebuttal testimony, correct? Could you repeat that? I said, you, like I, are relying on Mr. Wade's columns that he put in pages three and four of his rebuttal testimony, correct? Yes, for those, for the points that he made, yes. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Now, uh, Mr. Peters, let me direct your attention to uh, the uh, 
air dispersion modeling guidelines that we have up on the uh, screen. Can you see those okay? Yes. All right. And you're, if we go down to page one, looks like you're, uh, looks like you're an author here. Uh, is that right? Is that Eric Peters, is that, is that your handiwork? Um, yeah, I'm one of the yeah primary authors of these of these guy authors and editors of these guidelines. No, and these are guidelines you, that that are used, generally speaking, by modelers when they're going to submit an air quality application that requires modeling. Correct. Yes. Right. Can we go to page two. So, uh, can you go get some the first paragraph? You see the uh, can you move like this? One? See the first paragraph, Mr. Uh, Peters. Let me just read this to you. It says, "Quote: The meteorological data used in the modeling analysis should be representative of the meteorological conditions at the specific site of proposed construction or modification, or else use." Screening uh, meteorological data, which contains worst case data. You read that Did I read that accurately? You read that correctly. All right, all right. So it's clearly the 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 idea here. I take it is to make sure that you have representative conditions at the site. The 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 guidelines are taken as a whole rather than one specific thing but uh, but yeah that that is the that is the goal to have data representative of the site all right we go to the next uh i think we have the terrain i want to go back to the terrain maps if i could briefly so here's what we used or what mr wade used Holloman air force base and then of course here you have the uh, proposed site Topographical features. Uh, I mean, I don't think it, I'm not. I'm not going to be little obvious. Uh, objection. I, I, I'm concerned that uh, Mr. Peters is being cross-examined on Mr. Wade's exhibits and testimony. Um, I'm not. You know, I, I'd like to hear from Mr. Nasco uh, how this is not uh, cross-examination on Mr. Wade's uh, testimony and exhibits, and how this is relevant uh, to Mr. Peters' testimony. So, Mr. Vigil, are you saying objection? This is out of the scope of the of Mr. Uh, Peter's uh, testimony and rebuttal testimony. Uh, yes, I, I'm concerned about that. Yes, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, Mr. Hanasco, uh, are you able to ask questions to Mr. Peters without using these um, these uh, these exhibits that were not um, that are not uh, uh, developed by Mr. Peters. Well, I, I, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know why I would, Mr. Hearing Officer. They, he has just testified about the about being the primary author of modeling guidelines, and that the modeling analysis should be representative of the meteorological logical conditions at the proposed site. And he knows about these two sites, and these show markedly different sites. So he's certainly this is certainly susceptible to cross examination on this issue. He's testified. Okay, Mr. Mr. Canasco, I'll allow you. I'm going to override the objection. Uh, I'll allow you to ask questions, but if Mr. Peters, um, you're going to be stuck with Mr. Peters' answer. And that's perfectly fair, Mr. Hearing Officer. Thank you. Okay. Please proceed, uh, Mr. Peters. So, I mean, in, in terms of terrain. When I look at these two maps, to me, they look very dissimilar. And I just want to get your, uh, could you confirm that for me, that the Holloman Air Force Base uh, at a uh, uh, high desert or desert location versus this alpine location are markedly different terrains? I agree, they look different. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Can I get the next? And incidentally, uh, Mr. Peters, going back to the uh, keep that up. Going back to the, uh, the 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 concentration numbers that Mr. Wade provided in his rebuttal testimony, and for which he did not submit a modeling analysis to you. Do you know what kind of distance Mr. Wade used to to uh, 
from the, the source of the modeling run to obtain those concentrations? I'm, I'm a little bit confused by your question. The uh, terrain in the receptors are different from the terrain around the meteorological data. So could, could you re-ask the question? Yeah, I, yeah thank, thank you. I'm just curious if you knew how far out he went from the uh, Sierra Blanca Regional Airport to obtain data based on those receptors in terrain that's probably more similar to the, the Alto terrain. You know? I, I don't know how far he went out for land use okay, and the, uh, yeah, the terrain in the model itself is uh, in the modeling report. Uh, and we don't know because we don't have a modeling report for the uh, Sierra Blanca concentrations, right? Um, if if someone were to rerun a model using a different meteorological data, then all the inputs other than that meteorological data would be the same. I'd... Fair enough. So, and there was also some testimony earlier that uh, I think from Mr. Wayne in particular, and you had some, uh, your testimony addressed this as well as to who made the decision to use Holloman uh, versus something else. And then I think you compared your testimony, Holloman, and uh, you called it Rudadosa, which I call Sierra Blanca Regional Airport. Uh, this, this, uh, Email here dated March 16 from you to uh, Mr. Wade seems to indicate that you're preferring Alvagorda over Holloman in that instance. Do you remember sending that email? Could you repeat the last sentence? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this email, if you can read it, 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 it says you say, Paul, quote, Alvagorda might be more representative of the Alto location than Holloman because, because Alvagorda was closer. To the same mountain range, or since Almagorda is closer to the same mountain range, do you remember writing that email? Yes. And uh, I guess Almagorda was uh, was not was not chosen, correct? Correct. And who did you choose, Holloman, for Mr. Wade, or did he choose Holloman and present that to you? I'm I'm not certain. The, I mean, this was an initial email exchange. And uh, like you heard Paul say earlier, he had a phone conversation with me. Um, I don't recall that in, in detail, that phone conversation. Um, if he did say that the uh, there was not enough data in the Alamogordo that it didn't meet EPA requirements, then the Holloman Air Force Base would have become the default to use for that facility. All right, but in any event, at least as of March 16th, you, you had expressed the view that Alma Gorda was more representative, correct? Yes, that was my in, initial um, observation. And you're familiar, uh, Mr. Mr. Peters, with uh, uh, EPA published AP42, the general guidance on, on the emission factors and what should be used for particular emission sources. I'm somewhat familiar with that, yes. Well, I'm going to ask something you're not familiar with here, but, but uh, uh, you know, we've been through this with Mr. Wade, and, and I suggested to him during my cross examination that he, he used the wrong uh, value. For industrial paved roads for the haul roads. And in fact, he used publicly traveled uh, paved roads, uh, which, are, uh, which are right there at, at 0. 0.6 grams uh, per square meter, uh, when in fact there is a particular value ascribed for concrete batch plant paved roads, which is. Uh, the average of 12 grams per meter. Were you aware of that? Objection, uh, Mr. Nasco is, again, uh, outside of the scope of Mr. Peter's testimony. If he wants, I, I would again request the hearing officer require Mr. Nasco to stick to Mr. Peter's testimony. Mr. Hanasco, um, how is this within Mr. Peter's scope of his testimony? 
because it goes to the, the emissions and the draft permit. And my question is permissible because I asked him if he was aware of it. If the answer is no, then I'm done because he's not aware of it. So we have to know if he's aware of it to conduct a proper cross examination. Mr. Peters, what was your answer to whether you were aware of this table here? Um, I did not talk about this table. I said I was generally familiar with AP 42. And my particular question, Mr. Hearing Officer, is whether he is, he is familiar with the uh, emission uh, concentration requirement for uh, concrete batching plants with respect to paved haul roads. And Mr. Peters, uh, have you answered that question yet? No, no I, I'm not clear what the, could, could you repeat the question? Uh, well, it's not my question, sir. Uh, Mr. Hanasco, repeat the question. Yeah, I'm sorry, and maybe we can, clear, we can clean this up a little bit. Uh, Mr. Peters, I just want to know, when you're looking at uh, table 13.2.1-3, all right, uh, in uh, AP 42, whether you're familiar with the silt loading average emission concentrations of 12 grams per square meter ascribed to paved haul roads and concrete batching plants. I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular number. The uh, permit writer reviews the emission calculations and the modeler in the Air Quality Bureau compares the emission calculations on the application form with the values that were in the model. So it's probably not appropriate for me to, to talk much more about it. Okay, this. Mr. Peters, thank you. So I'm gonna sustain the objection, Mr. Hanasco. So let's move on. Uh, well, that is, uh, he answered no, so I can't ask him any questions on it anyway. So that's perfectly fair. And I, I thank you, Mr. Peters, and uh, let's move on uh, to, uh, uh, Dr. Sai Krishnan. Who are you asking for? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sai Krishnan. Okay. Repeat Please, please proceed. She's there, Mr. Panasco. Please proceed. I don't see her. Oh, did I pronounce your name correctly, Dr. Sai uh, Krishnan? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you very much. I wasn't quite sure about that. Um, Dr. Uh, a couple of questions in, in your, your, your testimony. You talked about uh, your duties, and, and you were you know, charged with determining administrative completeness of the application. Is that correct? Yes. And also, you know, coordinating with the outreach for the public. Yes. Yeah. And so making sure notice and things of that nature were complied with. Yes. Um, so with respect to notice, I, I wanna I wanna pull up something for you if I may, because uh, I'm certain I'm certain you're familiar with 20.2.72.203. Yes. And do you see, we're talking about public notice to those who are within one half mile of the proposed facility? Yes. And do you see the word that should be provided by certified mail? Uh, to yes. the owner's record as yes. shown in the most recent property tax schedule? Yes. And so you're familiar with that regulation, I take it? Yes. Let's go to the next. And, uh, Doctor, do you know what a tax schedule is? A tax schedule is a document. This is from my uh, understanding, but I do not know whether this is right. It is a document that shows. Uh, Objection. The residents Objection. listed. Doctor Sai Krishnan is not an expert in tax law. Uh, she is a technical staff bureau of the air quality, uh, the air quality bureau. Um, the affirmation on the application is the guarantee of the veracity of the information in the application. 
That is the Bureau's responsibility. Uh, and I, so I, I objected. This is outside of the scope of, of this, uh, Dr. Sai Krishnan's uh, uh, expertise. Mr. Hinesco, where are you going with this question? I want to, I want to take Ms. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sai Krishnan through the notice provisions of the statute. And the what, what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to show that notice was not given properly to landowners within one half mile of the facility. I have every right to do that. Mr. Hanasco, this was the subject of a motion to dismiss. This has been ruled on by myself after a full briefing. Uh, I, I provided the legal opinion that the applicant did substantially comply with the notice requirements. So this subject is off limits. For your questioning to miss to this witness, and so well, I'm I sustain. Gonna, I'm going to sustain the objection. I'm going to make an objection to that, Mr. Hearing Officer, because I, I absolutely entitled to make an offer of proof. Let me Please. add that that Please. and to make my offer of proof that that that. And let me add that during the hearings on the motion to dismiss, you ruled on that as a preliminary matter. Mr. V Hill himself was the one who su suggested it be fully vetted during the hearing. I have every right for any appellate body that looks at this to develop a very solid record as to how one uses a tax schedule to determine ownership of property within one half mile of the facility. Now, yes, you have ruled against a ruling on a, uh, would you, you view this a doctrine of substantial compliance? I have the right to go through this as a factual matter and show precisely how easy it is to use the tax schedule to find the owners, which the applicant didn't do. And by the way, to Mr. Veal's comment about attestation, it is the environment department and Ms. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sai Krishnan who has the, have the duty of oversight to make sure that this information, which the statute requires to be readily available to the public, is, is used properly. So with all due respect, Mr. Hearing Officer, I would like the opportunity to go through this. You can disallow the evidence in your consideration but I would like to take uh, Ms. Ms. Krishnan, Krishnan, uh, Sai Krishnan through this and develop my, my record. Mr. Hanasco, you have submitted the evidence in the form of affidavits from people who did not receive uh, their notice. There were 13 of them, if I'm not mistaken, in your renewed motion. Um, that evidence is in the record already. This is not a fact witness to that type of information. She was not involved with communicating with the Lincoln County Assessor. She is not the proper witness to ask these questions to, but before you say anything else, Mr. Hanasco, um, I wanna hear from Mr. Rose, since it is his, his witness who ended up um, submitting an affidavit showing the involvement with the Lincoln County Assessor. So Mr. Rose, what do you have to say about this? Uh, Mr. Nasco had the opportunity to question Mr. Waitis, assuming this is relevant at this stage, and I think we agree with the hearing officer that, that you've already ruled on the question of whether or not uh, notice met the requirement of the statute and the rules, and, and therefore we don't believe that it, it's appropriate to look at this further in this hearing. Assuming you're to consider that evidence, um, the question of what was done, how it was done, what the communication was with the Lincoln County office would have been with Mr. Wade. Mr. Nasco did not raise those questions with Mr. Wade. And my understanding is that this witness certainly has no firsthand knowledge of what was done and therefore can't testify as to whether or not notice was given and how notice was given. And therefore, I, be I don't believe it's relevant or appropriate. To, to ask her May I respond? Questions. Yes, please go right ahead. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, whatever what Mr. Rose says is true with respect to Mr. Wade, but I am not questioning Mr. Wade. I'm questioning uh, Dr. Sai Krishna on the oversight responsibilities. She was directly involved in this. She received the list from Mr. Roper, and it's going to take me no more than 120 seconds to demonstrate that that list is not a property tax schedule, and that's her her job is to determine current ownership based on a property tax schedule. And I'm just, I'm gonna show, and I'd like to hear from Mr. Beal. Objection, no, objection, objection. Hold on, hold on. Mr. Nasco, Mr. Nasco is testifying. Mr. Nasco does not know what he's talking about. 
He is speculating. He is, he is inventing out of whole cloth a fantasy of what he fantasizes our staff's job is. He has no idea. She, she just testified her job to be regulation. She just testified her job included providing notice to the public and making sure that that was uh, done according to the rules and regulations. Okay, Mr. Hanasco, what she meant by that, and I understand what she meant through her testimony, um, that was not the same thing as what you're asking her now. That's a different, that's a different matter. What you're asking was the responsibility of Mr. Wade and Roper Construction, and it was their communication with the Lincoln County Assessor to arrive at that list and to do the certified mail. They attested that they did. This was the subject of a pre-hearing motion. That motion has been denied. This subject is off limits at this point to this, you're questioning this witness. I sustain the objection. Please move to a different subject matter. All right, and I just want to make it clear that my obviously my objection is noted to this. This should be fully vetted. Clearly noted, sir. And then for the record, I want to uh, uh, just I want to state for the record that in NMED Exhibit One, page six, uh, Doctor uh, Cy Christian states as follows: "Quote on July 19, 2021, I sent an email to RCI's consultant Paul Wade requesting the property tax record." A certified mail received for Ronaldo Cervantes, an example of the letter sent to the land orders. That is noted. That is noted. Let's move on. Uh, Dr. Sir Christian. Let me again just briefly look at uh, section 14, the operational plan to mitigate emissions, if you can. Can you identify, Mr. Hanasco, which exhibit and page number you're looking at? Section 14 of the application. This is section 14 of the application. So, Mr. Hearing Officer, what we've done, and um, we have over the noon hour, we submitted our exhibits, but for these cross examination exhibits, this is simply part of the original application. So, we didn't number those, uh, those exhibits. Okay, that's okay. I'm not asking, I'm not asking that. What I'm asking is, are you using an admitted exhibit at this time or are you not using an exhibit? Yes. Okay, which exhibit are you using? It's NMED re rebuttal exhibit five. I, I apologize, I, but I, I'm not sure if they have it at their fingertips. That's, that's fine. The... exhibit number five here. What page are we are we talking about? This is a page, uh, section, 14. section 14, page one, Mr. Hearing Officer. Section 14, page one, Mr. Vigil, which page of your uh, enemy D exhibit five is that? I want to follow along. I don't have it up. I will have to get it. I apologize. I, I'm working on that right now. Okay, I have the table of contents. Do you have a table of contents, Mr. Hanasco? That's what we're looking at. We just need the table. The table of contents. So one moment, please. I'll get that. Sure. So, Dr. Sai Krishnan, if you have a page number, I, I can use that as well. Okay. What did he just say was? Um, I'm going to say. That's the record proper. Is if if it's for the the application page number, is that what I need to do? Yes. yes. Okay. It's section 14 that you're looking for? Yes. What? It's going to be page 148 on the admin record. Okay, well, I don't have the admin record. What I have here is NMED's rebuttal exhibit number five. So before we have any further questions, would someone point me to the proper page in NMED rebuttal five?
I have part A, I have part B, I have part C. Can someone point to those sections? I think I may have, uh, I think I may have misguided you. Oh, okay. Uh, so our, I have our team work. I have our team working on it. Okay. All right. So then it's the not an exhibit. This, 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 I, I'm wrong. I, it's the wrong. It's the wrong exhibit. Um, okay. And the, the bureau, the bureau is fine with with with, uh, with what is up on the screen. Okay. Very good. Okay, Mr. Hanasco, please proceed. And, and I'm sorry for all the problems here because it's not that significant. But I'm curious, uh, Doctor. Uh, Cy Christian, is if you look down at the yellow part, it looks as though, you know, all the way up to January 22nd, 2022, you know, we had this asphalt uh, production mistake in the application. Is that, is that, did I get that right in terms of timing? Yes. So, um, you know, and I'm not going to take you through each and everything here, but there were some interesting public comments I thought over the noon hour. I don't know if you had the opportunity to hear them about all the changes to this application. And I take it you're the one who's responsible for incorporating changes to the application or accepting the changes. Is that right? Yes. And I'm not going to take you through all these, and I really don't want to do that, but I'm counting them up all the way from November 18th, 2021 uh, through just uh, January 28th, uh, uh, 2022, and I mean, by, I'm not, I'm not going to say agree with me or not agree with me, but there are dozens and dozens of changes to this application. Has that been your experience with this application? Any application has uh, many updates that are made to the application. There have been uh, several corrections in this application. Yes. Okay, I appreciate that very much. Um, you also mentioned about the, uh, the, 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 I'm still stuck on this truck traffic thing, the 305 trips per day, because in, in, and I think your testimony indicated that the truck trips were limited by production rates. Is that right? Yes. I mean, there's nowhere in there. Is there any reference to, you know, water trucks being part of that uh, equation, is it? It has not been indicated that the water in the application, the water trucks. Yes, I agree. And also, uh, Doctor, you know, on the aggregate piles, I think the requirement that you put in there is they got to be quote adequately moist end quote. Right? But you know, again, there's no requirement on, on demonstrating the water to keep them adequately moist. Correct. Can you repeat your question? Yeah, I just, it's, a, it's not necessarily, a, you know, I think when you testified, you talked about, uh, you know, the stockpiles having to be kept adequately moist as a condition. Yes. Right? Yes. right. But there's no corresponding requirement of how, where the water is going to come from to keep them adequately moist, correct? Yes. Now, I just want to know one thing that kind of, you know, I don't know when this got corrected or if it did, but are you aware that in a public notice that went out, about this facility that originally the, the September, the entire month of September was omitted from the operational uh, hours. Did you catch that eventually? Sorry, the public notice? Yes. You mean the public notice that went out did not capture the month September? Correct, yes. Which public notice are you referring to? The, the the public notice that was posted by the applicant yes no i did not i was not aware of that uh mr here i'll pass the witness thank you thank you doctor i appreciate your time thank you mr v hill are there any redirect questions for any of your witnesses no i have no redirect thank you okay does the department um rest its case the department rests its case Okay, thank you, Mr. Vigil.
Mr. Hanasco, it is time to, for you to put on your case. How many witnesses do you have? We have four witnesses, Your Honor. Or Mr. Your four witnesses. Let me get to your first NOIs. So <clears throat> now you said that you sent out exhibits at the lunch hour. Let me confirm that. To Matt, yes, we did. Okay, and who did you send them to? Because I would like a copy of them. Ms. Corral. Ms. Corral. Ms. Corral, do you have a, did you get that email from Mr. Hanasco? Um, give me one second, Mr. Hearing Officer. Um, I believe I did see them come through. Can you forward them? Mr. Hanasco, did you send them to the parties as well? Did we send them to the parties as well? No, they're going now. Sorry. Okay, look. Mr. There. Rose, do you have them? Uh, no. And once he sends them, I think we'll need some time to print them before he begins his testimony. So once we get that, maybe we should take about a five minute break to make sure we can print them. Well, Mr. Rose, these are just these are exhibits that you already have had for weeks now. They're just numbered. OK, so all we're talking about is the exhibits that were attached to the Direct NOI and the rebuttal NOI, then just with that's, what, that's my understanding, Mr. Hinesco. Am I correct? You are correct. Okay, yes, Mr. Rose, as long as we have them already, that's fine. I wouldn't ask you to proceed without them, Mr. Rose. Yeah. And what, it wasn't clear from the from the dialogue whether it was something we've already seen. Thank you, Mr. I understand. So, uh, Mr. Hinesco, would you um, let me know when you've sent them to uh, the parties, please? Yes, I will. And Mr. Hearing Officer, would, may, may I suggest, uh, request a 10 minute break? It's now uh, 205. We will return on the record at 215. Thank you. Thank you. Wednesday, February 9. And before you begin, Mr. Hanasco, I want to work this out with the court reporter. Um, let's see. Ms. Myers. Yes. Ms. Myers. Um, the hearing clerk will send you all of the exhibits indicating which ones were admitted and which ones were not. Obviously, so far, none have been uh, excluded, so all of them are admitted. But I want to make sure that you get the latest um, submission from Sonterra with their uh, labeled exhibits. And I want to see, okay, so it says exhibit one. Okay. All right, Mr. Hanasco, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Um, a brief opening statement first. Please. Thank you. So, Mr. Hearing Officer, we really uh, believe that uh, Based on you, the hearing officer's initial comments, who has the burden of proof in this matter and how the hearing should proceed, that uh, LOPER has not sustained its burden at all in this case to demonstrate that the permit as applied for should be issued. A couple of points now. I know Mr. Rose was suggesting that the only thing you got to determine is whether opacity requirements are satisfied. But in fact, the permit application has to be accurate match the operations of the facility. There are a number of reasons why this is not true, and I'd like to go through them. First of all, uh, as uh, our witnesses are going to testify, Dr. Tuarte starting out, uh, this is not a representative data used by Mr. Roper. He can uh, backtrack as much as he wants and determine, uh, say, well, no harm, no foul, because it's actually more conservative. Uh, but the fact is that represent, representative data needs to be used um, in this matter. So uh, that's number one. Number two, there's serious, serious problems with, I think, what the hearing officer has been all read nauseam and what you ruled on earlier uh, last Saturday, as a matter of fact, on the absence of a demonstration of sustainable water uh, supplies. There is none. And the NMD's testimony in this regard is very perplexing because on the one hand, they're arguing that they don't have to do that, have the applicant demonstrate a, a reliable source, but on the other, they can impose the use of water to meet their emission requirements. So uh, 
we're, we're going to be having witnesses testify about that, uh, and, and particularly Mr. Lud Martinez will discuss that. Uh, we're going to have other witnesses as well talking about this. Mr. Edler will be speaking about the concrete operations. The Brianna is going to be speaking uh, and addressing uh, some of the issues with the permit. So that's a main issue. I think it's going to be important to note that uh, uh, when we go through this, uh, uh, Dr. Torte to start out is going to talk about the lack of representativeness of the modeling done by Mr. Wade. But secondly, you know that the application itself, and this is what happens when you have all the omissions and changes that have occurred over the lengthy period of time this application has been alive, uh, we think we're going to offer uh, some, uh, some primary testimony, direct testimony, rebuttal testimony, and from Ms. Dr. Torte's perspective, a brief sur rebuttal on the raw use of the wrong values for the paved all roads. And in that regard, Mr. Hearing Officer, I'd just like to alert you, I've just discovered that the entire AP42 document is not included within the application. As a matter of fact, the AP42 document submitted by Mr. Wade stops at the use of the uh, six tenths of uh, a value for uh, all roads uh, that are traveled by the public, paved all roads, but does not go on for the couple pages later to include the concrete match paved all roads, which has approximately 15 times uh, more emissions. So we're going to respectfully request after we do that, that that document uh, in its entirety be admitted uh, into evidence. So based on the applicant's failure to meet its burden in this matter, to demonstrate A, that the modeling was incorrect, the emissions are incorrect, there is no reliable source to comply with the emission controls mandated by the NMED under the Air Quality Act, yeah, because we do know, of course, that, uh, and I think Ms. Prim, uh, uh, Ms. Prim uh, verified that the Air Quality Act certainly does not prevent the Bureau from imposing uh, the requirement to demonstrate a reliable source of water based on these omissions that the applicant has not sustained its burden and the permit should be denied on that basis. Okay, Mr. Hinesco. As you call your witnesses, we're going to get them sworn in one at a time, and I'd like you to identify with uh, with your exhibit new numbers which ones they will be carrying in through their adoption. So, Thank if you're you. ready to begin, I'm ready. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. And who is your Who is your first witness? Uh, Dr. Carlos Torpe. Okay, sir. Would you spell your name, please, for the record? Uh, sure, Carlos, C A R L O S, Ituarte, I T U A R T E. And Mr. Ituarte, which uh, exhibits are, are you, uh, have you submitted um, either on rebuttal or indirect? Uh, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the numbering for, for the uh -huh. exhibits. So, uh, Mr. Hinasco? Yes, uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, those are number two through seven. Two, did you say two through seven? Yes. So to be to, so for the record, it's two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Correct. Well, wait, one, one also one is this curriculum vitae that should be in there as well. One through seven. I'm sorry. Okay. Of the uh, of the direct of the initial SOI. Yes. Yes, Mr. Hume officer. Is there any rebuttal? Not for that. Uh, none in the rebuttal for Mr. Uh, Dr. Torte. Okay, very good. So, would you proceed? Uh, oh, well, we need to get him sworn in. Ms. Myers? Will you raise your right hand, please, for me? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed. Uh, Dr. Torte Villarreal, uh, would you state your name, please? Uh, my name is Carlos Marco Duarte Villarreal. Mr. Hinasco, let me just remind you that each witness has 15 minutes to provide a summary of their testimony. If they have rebuttal, they get another 15. So uh, it is 222 now, and 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 by my calculation, Mr. Uh, this witness hasn't uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Mr. Hinasco. Thank uh, you, sir. 
Um, and, and for the record, Mr. Hearing Officer, Dr. Itwart Betty Villarreal will have rebuttal testimony and uh, direct testimony. And as I mentioned, we'll include within that a brief sir rebuttal as well. And uh, so we would respectfully request a 30 minute time uh, to, to accomplish this. Uh, uh, Dr. Itwart Betty, would you stay? Okay, hold on, Mr. Hanasco. So you're saying that this witness has rebuttal testimony but didn't file it? No, you are, he, he did file it. Uh, I, I'm confused I, because I've asked several times what the exhibit number is for his filing. There are no there are no additional exhibits in his rebuttal testimony. There is yes. only rebuttal testimony. He relies on the exhibits previously put in in his direct testimony. I see. So you're saying you're saying that he you're saying that this witness is responsible for bringing into the record. Exhibits one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and he did not file a rebuttal exhibit, but has rebuttal testimony. Correct. Okay, then he has thirty minutes. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Would you state your name for the record? Uh, Carlos Marco Ituarte Villarreal. Uh, Dr. Villarreal, could you get closer to the microphone? I think you're a little bit uh, unclear. There. Is that better? Okay. Uh, could you briefly describe for the hearing officer your educational background and your place of work? I'm currently employed by SWCA Consultants in El Paso, Texas. I have received my Bachelor's of Science in uh, Industrial Engineering, also a Master's uh, in Science uh, also for Industrial Engineering, and a Doctorate for uh, Environmental Science and Engineering. And when did you receive your doctorate? Uh, 2015. Okay, and what are your duties with your uh, with SWCA? Um, um, basically, uh, an air quality and modeling specialist for for the air quality group. And, and Dr. Vero, uh, thing, if you could just give a summary without me asking questions, we'd save a, a lot of time. So, please go over your 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 work history with respect to air quality permitting, modeling, and and your position with SWCA, if you would please. Well, I have. Uh, almost 10 years of experience uh, doing modeling for air, air quality, both um, um, also includes uh, noise modeling. Um, before that, uh, I was working as a compliance specialist for a, a, a power um, utility here in El Paso, Texas. And before that, uh, I was working for uh, uh, the University of Texas, El Paso, as a uh, both uh, research associate and teaching assistant. And how many in that capacity for your your uh, experience? How many uh, modeling uh, air quality modeling runs have you personally done? Uh, it's hard to put a number, but I would say around fifty. And and you filed uh, in this case direct testimony and rebuttal yes. testimony. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. All right, and do you adopt as your testimony today both the direct testimony and the rebuttal testimony? I did. Okay. And, and Dr. Torte Villarreal, uh, what is the purpose of your testimony today? Well, my part, uh, the purpose of my testimony is to explain my file direct testimony and rebuttal testimony, and also uh, discuss the rebuttal testimony filed by NMD and Mr. Wade um, in, on behalf of uh, Rubber. Okay, and let's first start with your direct testimony and maybe segregate that from your rebuttal of uh, Mr. Wade and uh, the NMED. Um, could, could you briefly summarize, if you could, please, what, what you, the points you wanted to make in your direct testimony for the uh, members of the audience today? Um, well, uh, basically, um, my opinion is that the modeling results are not representative of the operation or the proposed operations of the facility and therefore uh, are not reliable uh, or a, a reliable basis on which to grant the requested permit. And uh, do you rely on certain uh, uh, EPA guidance documents for that purpose? Correct, yeah, uh, from well, both federal and state documents. And I put up uh, uh, on the screen here the uh, document we previously used on the meter on uh, EPA subpar. Can you identify this please, first of all? Explain what, what that means. Um, yeah, I, I cannot clearly see it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the 40 CFR 50 subpart W, also known as the modeling guidance, uh, federal modeling guidance. 
And, and what are the important factors in this guidance? I'm sorry. What are the important factors in this guidance? Just summarize what they are, please. Um, well, basically, uh, well, in terms of, uh, of meteorological data, or, or what do you mean? Uh, in, in terms of what, are, what, what is the guidance pointing to that one should, what, what's important for selecting meteorological data? Okay. Well, as, as you can see here in, in the exhibit, um, it's pretty clear uh, that the uh, federal uh, requirements or, or the federal regulations require that the meteorological data used as an input for modeling uh, should be selected on the basis of both the spatial and climatological representativeness and as well as the availability of the individual uh, parameters selected to characterize the transport and dispersion conditions in the area of concern, meaning the area of concern, basically the, the uh, proposed site for, for the project. And turning the page to the next uh, yellow, uh, the highlighted material, uh, you see a reference in there to uh, uh, wind direction and ambient temperature and, and uh, these other atmospheric input variables being important. Correct. Yeah, basically, um, the federal regulations require that the inputs to RMET, which is the uh, preprocessor for the MET data, should be uh, or should possess uh, uh, a fair, uh, adequate degree of representativeness uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that the wind, the temperature, turbulence profiles, and other uh, other factors uh, are both laterally and vertically representative of the source of the impact area. And how does wind direction play into that? Yeah, w wind direction it's it's basically uh, um, part of the laterally and vertically uh, representative uh, representativeness of the uh, source area. And and what effects does wind direction have on the dispersion of particulate matter? Well, basically, wind wind speed and wind direction uh, drive the dispersion here. Uh, it's one of the most significant uh, conditions for, uh, in this specific for for uh, projects like this, with a significant amount of fugitive emissions. So, and, and do you have a uh, an opinion as to whether the modeling, uh, uh, the meteorological data selected by the applicant was appropriate in this instance? No, it, it, it's it's not appropriate. I, I don't think it's representative of the conditions at the project site. And why is that? Uh, well, there, there are several factors, and, and as mentioned before, um, one of this is, uh, as you're showing here, uh, land, land use and land coverage plays a, a significant factor when you're uh, characteriz uh, characterizing the surface conditions. Um, as, um, I don't know if you can make that. Uh, yeah, closer, but yeah, as you can see that the difference between the two sites are are are, are obvious. Where this proposed site, uh, it's mostly covered on their evergreen forest and the, uh, land use conditions, and even shrub. Uh, some some parts are are covered in shrubs. Uh, the Holoman Air Force uh, Base, it's mainly shrubs and desert uh, conditions. All right. Or, and in your view, what is what is the what is the more representative data? I'm sorry, can you repeat what, the question? What would be the most appropriate data to be representative of the sort of the site? Uh, in my opinion, the the, the um, closest representative uh, uh, med station should be uh, the Ridoso uh, Regional Airport. And could you explain what you see here? Yeah, that's the land use and land cover. Uh, depiction uh, around the uh, Ridoso Regional Airport. And what, um, what, does that, what does that show you in relation to the conditions at the site? Well, this, this is closer to what we we expect at the uh, project site with evergreen forest and shrubs, uh, rub, uh, shrub coverage. So, um, were you present? I, I think you probably heard of, of Mr. Uh, Mr. Wade's subsequent statement that he. Uh, you know, he went and did it. He, he he ran some some apparently a model based on uh, using Sierra Blanca data, and that in his judgment, uh, 
uh, the, the model actually showed the greater emissions or, or greater concentrations uh, using that data than using the Holloman data. How do you respond to that? Well, there are two. I'm not two. sure. I did. Before you answered, Dr. Duarte, Mr. Hearing Officer, my understanding is that, in fact, Mr. Wade testified exactly the opposite. That his testimony was that the use of Sierra Blanca data actually showed less of an impact than the use of Holloman data. So I think the question is incorrect in terms of what the representation of Mr. Wade's testimony is. I, I, think, I, I think I said this, said it, Lewis, just the opposite way. I said the use of Holloman data uh, increased concentrations. I think you said it the other way. Yeah, okay, um, okay. Well, I, I apologize if I did. But in, in any event, uh, uh, Dr. Tuarte, let me clean that up. Uh, you heard Mr. Wade's testimony that the use of uh, Sierra Block airport data would actually cause greater concentrations. How do you how do you react to that uh, statement? Well, first of all, the goal of modeling is to predict the worst case concentrations without going beyond that case with overly conservative assumptions. So that go back it goes back to representativeness of of the uh, data, but. Um, Additionally, uh, Mr. Wade reviewed all testimony and states that there, there were more low and calm wind conditions for Holloman Air, Air, Air Force Base than for Sierra Blanca. And therefore, the low wind speed uh, leads to higher concentrations at the um, model boundary. Uh, the problem with this statement is that the assumption that the number of calm and low wind conditions or, or low wind hours is sufficient justification for selecting or dimming a met data set as conservative. Um, additionally, uh, in terms of calm, calm hours, um, AirMed substitutes most of these hours through the different um, um, processing routines uh, for calm and missing hours. And, ad and, and additionally, it, the, the AirBot software, um, along with, with the processing routines, calculates uh, or basically sets the concentration values to zero for missing and calm hours for um, and those um, for those hours basically uh, assumes a zero concentration and calculates short term averages according the uh, to to EPA's calm policy. Um, and in turn for low wind or uh, hours at in the specific to uh, to this project, low low wind conditions or low low wind hours. Are generally or generally occur uh, in the late afternoon or evenings, um, and based on the application, the uh, the proposed schedule for the, for the uh, rubber side, it's mainly daytime hours. So most of these low wind conditions should uh, are going to have no impact on the uh, results because they are uh, outside of the scheduling uh, or the operation in the schedule. Um, yeah. Mr. Mr. Hearing Officer, again, um, I didn't want to interrupt Dr. Duarte, but um, I think the way Mr. Nasco phrased the question was, again, um, the exact opposite of what Mr. Wade testified to. I think he, again, phrased it that the use of the Sierra Blanca data re resulted in higher concentrations when, in fact, the testimony was it resulted in lower concentrations. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Okay, Mr. Hanasco. Okay. Right, and I, I apologize, Mr. Rose is exactly correct. So you know what I meant, Dr. Tuarte. Okay, hold on, Mr. Hanasco. When there's an objection, you have to give me an opportunity to make a ruling so that we have a clean record. Certainly. So I sustain the objection that Mr. Rose made previously, and I sustain this one as well. So please rephrase the question. So, uh, Dr. Tordy, your testimony in, in comparing the various uh, 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 Sierra Blanca and comparing that with Holloman, so Mr. Wade, Mr. Wade testified that using Holloman was in fact more conservative uh, in terms of the application versus using Sierra Blanca. And your response to that, you've given the reasons why that may or may not be so. Is that correct? That that's correct. All right. And and would we know unless we do an appropriate modeling run with with all the relevant factors on the Sierra Blanca using the Sierra Blanca data. Uh, I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. 
I'm sorry. I'm trying to determine how how we would find out because Mr. Wade has, has set forth in page three to four of his testimony the columns of, of, of uh, concentrations suggesting that Holloman is more conservative. And I'm asking you, what would we have to do to really make that determination in this instance? And has it been made here? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I think the only way to to make that assertion is to actually actually rerun the model, and um, I I don't think any of the inputs are uh, used for for uh, Mr. Wade's um, rerun is, are included anywhere in the application. So there's no way I can duplicate this this effort. Okay, so can we go to the next, next one? The next one? Next one? The, the comparison? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Dr. Tuarte Villarreal, could you describe what were, is depicted on the screen here? Uh, yes, those are the green rose plots for both the Ridoso Regional Airport and the Holloman uh, Air Force Base. Um, basically, what uh, green rose plot is, is it's just uh, a plot of the frequency of wind, wind speed, and wind directions for a specific uh, location. And how do the uh, how do the various wind directions uh, affect dispersion at the site? Well, um, I think it's easier if I use a, a, a simple example. Um, just by looking at, at the depiction here. If you see the Holloman Air Force Base um, uh, wind rows on on the on the uh, left, you can see that the, the uh, majority of the dispersion events from the uh, Holloman data will occur um, on the uh, or or from wind uh, blowing from the southeast uh, area. So. Uh, for fugitive emissions, this means that basically, for example, trucks transporting materials used to the so southern border of the facility will be expected uh, to cause greater impacts uh, in that direction. While for the Ridoso uh, case, you have the majority of the wind hours um, blow, uh, blowing from the southwest and therefore impacts at uh, the northeastern boundary should be uh, higher. And how does that affect the reliability of the of the modeling? Well, the, basically, this 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 model is not representative uh, of the area because there's no uh, it's not therefore not reliable because we don't know what the results will be if, if the Sierra Blanca meteorological data. Uh, it's, it's used and, and what inputs were, were used when uh, estimating or pre processing the uh, MET data uh, when Mr. Wade uh, rearranged the model. And, and is there a, I'm a little bit confused, is there a, uh, a parameter for distance that one can input into the model to more closely replicate the proposed site conditions? Right. Yeah. If, if you go to the, um, the uh, land use uh, and, and land cover of uh, figures. Yeah, right there. Um, I don't know. You can see uh, on, on that figure that uh, uh, that um, radius there. It basically represents the one kilometer radius from the the. Uh, um, location of the med, med station at the air, uh, with also, um, airport. So, if we don't know that what, uh, parameters were used for, uh, for calculating the surface condition when pre-processing this data. Um, so in this case, if you use 1 kilometer, you're basically, uh, assuming, or, or you're going to have, uh, more impact from like cement or tarmac or parking lot than the actual uh, surrounding cover for like shrubs or, or evergreen forest. So, but what happens if you extend that 
that radius to three kilometers or five kilometers, then you are going to capture the actual um, conditions at, at uh, surrounding the, at that airport. And those conditions are more uh, in line with the conditions at the uh, Alto New Mexico site. Okay. So there's, so, uh, there's always an unknown here what, what parameters were used when uh, estimating, estimating concentrations using the Sierra Blanca uh, MET data set. Dr. Tuarte Villarreal, um, trucks. You were, I, I think you were present when you heard some testimony on trucks, and it doesn't matter. They're all basically the, the same in, in emissions. And, and what's your response to the absence of water trucks in this application? Well, it's, 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 it, everything relates to, to the emission factors and the equation there to calculate the emissions. Uh, as we can see, a, a, a significant parameter there is the weight of the trucks. So, if they're saying that, um, if well, if they're saying that uh, this many slash uh, uh, trucks are are gonna be um, assumed for for the operation, and this this many for cement trucks, this many for aggregate sand, sand trucks, why not to include uh, water truck trips? And can we go to the uh, next the emission control? And finally, uh, Dr. Uh, did you uh, did you discover an error in the application uh, using AP forty two? Correct, I I did. And could you explain what that is, please? Well, first of all, Robert assumed a sealed loading value of, of 0.6. Uh, as shown in um, on table 13.2.1-2. Um, and this value is, is actually uh, for um, condition or corresponds to a paved public road, which in this case, is, this is not the case. This is a, uh, a road within a, a, a industrial facility. So I don't think that's, that's appropriate to be, to be uh, uh, used for calculating emissions. Um, and I think additionally, uh, section six, uh, uh, page eight of the application, um, of the permit application, basically it states that no controls will be included for units one, two, and um, eleven, if I'm not mistaken, with the exception of uh, limiting the out not throughput. So, um, therefore, I, I don't think there's any justification for assuming a still low uh, loading of uh, this. This low for for the conditions at the at the uh, uh, facility. Um, what what what, uh, what parameter should have been used in your judgment? Well, uh, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, uh, yeah, table thirteen point two point one dash three actually lists a specific value for um, paved roads at the industrial facilities in this in this. A specific case for concrete batching activities of 12, which is basically 20 times higher than the 0 0.0, uh, 0 0.6 uh, grounds per meter uh, square use. And have you done any calculations as to how much the emissions would actually increase if this uh, uh, value was used for concrete batching plants rather than the 0.6 value that Roper used? Uh, I did um, estimate it. Uh, emissions are are close to 15 times higher than those presented on the application. And based on your review of the data, the data used for modeling, which you think is not representative, and the other deficiencies in this uh, application, including the wrong uh, the wrong value for concrete batching roads, uh, do you have an opinion whether this uh, permit, based on your experience, should be should be granted? Yes, I don't think the, this this permit should be granted on the basis that the, the uh, both the em emissions and the modeling are not representative of the actual conditions or proposed conditions of the uh, of the operations of the facility. Okay, Mr. Hearing Officer, will pass the witness, but at this time, I'd like to offer into evidence as an additional cerebral exhibit the full AP42, which apparently is not included. In the application of Mr. Roper, only partially included. Go 
don't see the hearing officer, so I guess we can't. There he is. I'm here, but I didn't hear the question. Oh, the question was, Mr. Hearing Officer, I passed the witness. Oh, you're passing question. the witness. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but, do you want to present? Hold on, Mr. Hinasco. Do you want to present your witnesses as a panel? Yes, Mr. Hearing Officer. Then why don't you call your next witness, and um, who will that be? Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, one housekeeping matter, if I may. Uh, I, I don't think you heard my earlier request when uh, Dr. Atuarte Villarreal was finished testifying that we're, as a sur rebuttal uh, exhibit, we would like to introduce the, the complete copy of AP 42 because we looked over the application and it appears that only part of that was included, but not the part with the concrete uh, hall road uh, emission concentration factor. Are there any objections? No, uh, Mr. Hearing objection. Mr. Hearing officer, we, we have on. no objection. It's just that um, I don't know exactly what that's to look like. I don't know if he's actually offering a written copy as an exhibit or asking the hearing officer whether you'll take notice of the AP 42 factor. The pages that Mr. Nasco referred to and Dr. Duarte testified on were, I think we're looking at a handful of pages beyond those included in the application as opposed to the entire AP 42 document. So I'm not sure whether all of that document is really relevant, but, okay. uh, but we have no objection to you taking administrative notice of the sections he referred to. Okay, Mr. Hanasco, before I go to Mr. Vigil, it sounds to me that what you should be doing is sending out um, the exhibit to the parties to let them see exactly what you are asking to be admitted, or Correct. are you just asking for me to take notice of it? Well, I think you can take notice, but I think it's better to have a part of the record because of the omission of the application. But I do, I do accept Mr. Rose's uh, friendly okay. amendment there that we don't need the entire document, just the uh, pages I've referenced, which are about five more in addition. Okay. So, Mr. Canasco, um, uh, first I want to hear from Mr. Vigil. Mr. Vigil, what was your objection? No, I, I was saying we don't have an objection. Oh, you don't have an objection. Okay. Mr. Hanasco, before I consider whether to allow that in or not, um, please provide the entire document that you want to be considered. Um, I understand that you want additional pages, but what I would like is for you to submit all of AP 42 that you want admitted. So the, uh, the part that's already there, plus the new part, I want it all as one. Understood, thank you. And we're going to call that what exhibit number? That would be exhibit. Fifteen. You have twenty so far, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's make it two. Um, we have to. We can't do that. We have to do it. Okay. Sure. And then exhibit twenty-one. Twenty-one. All right. Let me write that down. We will reserve judgment once the parties take a look at that. Um, are you ready to proceed to your second witness? We are, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, good. Who will that be? Um, it will be. Um, yeah. Uh, Rihanna Bernal. Okay. Um, before we begin with her testimony, what number exhibits will she be carrying in? Uh, she's three, That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Mr. Hearing Officer, we're going to obviously have to rework our submission of exhibits. We apologize for that. Um, so it, it would it should follow um you know once we put in the new um it should follow after Mr. De Tuartes. So it should be ten through eight through or eight through so you're saying that this the email that you sent around to everyone which ends with exhibit five no seven 
it, it so this is this needs to be redone. That's right. That's correct. I can we see that now, now that I've got past number seven. I see that it's it ends there um, on page thirty five without any further. Um, Okay, so we'll be resending that shortly. Shortly. Okay, so then why don't we deal with the exhibit numbers um, before the end of her testimony? Thank you, Your Honor. All right, so let's get her sworn in. Is this Ms. Bernal? Myers? Yes, is this Ms. Bernal? It is. Okay. Will you raise your right hand for me, please, Ms. Bernal? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Would you spell your name for the record? Yes, it's B-R-E-A-N-N-A-B-E-R-N-A-L. Very good. Okay, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bernal, um, could you... Briefly, tell us about your experience um, and educational background. Yes, I have three and a half years experience in conducting air quality permitting compliance and reporting driven by state, federal and local air quality rules and regulations. I currently work at SWCA environmental consultants and my educational background is I have a bachelor's degree of science in environmental geoscience from Texas A&M University. And did you file um, a written summary of your opinions in this case? Yes, I did. And do you have any changes to that written summary? No, I do not. Did you file written rebuttal testimony in this case? Yes, I did. Do you have any changes to that written rebuttal summary of testimony? No, I do not. So do you adopt the both the written um, summary of your opinions and the written sum, um, rebuttal summary of your opinions? Yes, I adopt both. And very briefly, in Sir Rebuttal to um, the rebuttal testimony of Mr. Tallway. Mr. Wade talks about annual emissions calculated in table 6.1. Are you familiar with this table in the um, application? Yes, I am. Uh, so table 6-1 uh, on page 6 of section 6, it basically shows the pre-controlled material handling particulate emissions uh, for each unit. Okay, and is there a table that, um, and then he also talks about emission rates for controlled emissions after inclusion of control equipment. Do you know where that information is found? Yes, the controlled emissions would be on table 6-2, which is page 11 of section 6. And for those units, um, process unit 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, do you know what control equipment is um, the applicant is proposing for those units? Uh, yes, for units 3, 4, 5, and 6, uh, they're proposing to add water sprays. Okay, are, are they proposing any other um, control equipment for 3, 4, 5, and 6? Um, not as far as I'm aware. So, um, going back to the uncontrolled emissions, Table 6.1? Yes. If there is not an adequate or reliable source of water, what are the emissions for those units 3, 4, 5, and 6? Um, so if there's not an adequate control of water, the emissions for units 3, 4, 5, and 6 would be as represented in Table 6-1 with the highest emission rate being a 2.46 tons per year of particulate matter for each emission unit. So if we were to combine emission units 3, 4, 5, and 6, it would total approximately 9.84 tons per year of particulate matter for those units combined without water sprays. And is there any other source of emissions um, in the application where water is the primary control? Uh, not to my recollection. Do you know what they're proposing to do with the hall roads? 
the hall roads, I believe the only, um, let me see. So in the first paragraph of page eight on section six, uh, it states that no controls will be included for unit one, which is the hall road with the exception on limiting annual throughput. So it does not mention uh, the use of water for those hall roads. Uh, and I believe that the emission calculations also did not mention the use of any water being applied to the roads. Okay, have you reviewed the draft permit um, that the um, NMED witnesses testified about? Earlier? Yes, I did. Yes, and if you look at um, the permit condition D. Yes. Wait, B. Sorry, permit condition B. Yes, so um, part B is for haul road controls uh, and it states that truck traffic areas and haul roads shall be maintained to minimize silt buildup to control particulate emissions. Um, so those controls uh, later mentioned, basically it would be water application or sweeping. Uh, the roads would be the, the controls that they are required to do for the permit conditions. And what happens to this requirement if there is not a reliable source of water? Uh, the requirement could not be met if there is not a reliable source of water unless they were to do sweeping would be the only alternative in there. Pass the witness. Actually, we'll go on since we're, we're um, we're combining our, our uh, all of our witnesses in the panel for um, cross examination, so we'll just call our next witness. Okay, so hold on. So Miss Bernal does not have rebuttal testimony. Just what we've put on the record right now. Okay. All right, sounds good. So let me let me review with you what I have here so far. You submitted an SOI. Um, originally, um, I guess it's not marked uh, as we have figured out. And then you submitted a rebuttal. You submitted a Roper sub, uh, rebuttal. And Roper uh, rebuttal is uh, shorter than the first one. You know, without exhibit numbers, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but but I do see that actually the rebuttal has actual, it looks like what you would call base numbers at the bottom. Or does it not? Good Lord. Mr. Hearing officer, I think you're referring to our You're right, I am, that's correct. <laughs> you're right. There are just no markings whatsoever. There are page numbers though. There are some page numbers Okay, well, um, Mr. Hearing figured... officer, what, what we can do is um, include the um, administrative record number for these page for both our statement of intent and our rebuttal. And that way there would be some sort of um, way to identify those documents. The, um, the scheduling order is specific that exhibits have to be marked. Uh, so I'm going to wait for you to properly mark them. I do have your email that shows that one through seven have been marked, so they are admitted. Um, I don't know which exhibits this uh, Ms. Bernal was supposed to bring in. Are you aware of how many exhibits that you filed with her testimony? Uh, it would have been uh, uh... Well, we, we marked one through seven, Mr. Hearing Officer, and um, why is it eight? It, and it would be it would be nine through thirteen is what we're. But there should be fifteen total exhibits. Oh, not twenty. Not twenty. Wait, not twenty. Not twenty. Ah, originally, originally I was told 
there was one through 10, then there was one, two, three, and then there was one through seven. So I added them up as 20. But now you're saying that there that you have submitted so far 15 exhibits, and then you will have one additional one, which will be that um, which will be the uh, AP 42 extension. She had seven. He had. So the one, three. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, uh, so uh, Carlos Eduardo de one, one through ten. One through ten, not one through yes. seven. One through ten. Uh, Ms. Ms. Bernal, at eleven through seventeen. Mr. Martinez had 18 to 21. But those again, a lot of those exhibits, the reason I think our confusion arose is because a lot of them were already admitted by others. So they're going to be du duplicatives at this point. And we, we didn't include um, things that were already part of the record proper. And that's fine with me. I'm only concerned with the email that you sent all the parties back on January the 19th that had a that had a PDF. Um, those will have to be appropriately marked, and we're going to have to go through that um, after at some point, maybe I don't know when. And then you sent something on February 2nd, which was rebuttal exhibits, and those are going to have to be appropriately marked. So if you could. If you could find those two PDFs that you emailed all the parties, appropriately mark them with exhibit numbers, send them out again, and then we can identify by the proper numbers on them which ones belong to which uh, which witnesses. Of course, absolutely. That's that's how we're going to do this because I'm not going to slow down this hearing for for uh, you guys to do that now. So who is your next witness? Mr. Dave Edler. Okay, Mr. Edler, would you please spell your name? But you're on mute. Okay, okay. there we go. David Edler. You're too, you're too, you have to turn up your microphone, sir. I can't hear you. Okay. It's David. Edler, E D L E R. Okay, and Mr. Edler, did you uh, did you submit any um, written testimony? Yes, Your Honor. He did. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that'll be an exhibit. Um, did he submit rebuttal? Yes. Yes, he did. So he has both um, direct and rebuttal, pre-filed, full written testimony. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're going to get. Yes. Uh, this is Chris Vihal. I just wanted to say, um, when it's appropriate, I'd like an opportunity to voir dire this witness. Uh, Mr. Edler. Yes. Well, okay. Yeah, Mr. Vihal, are you speaking about Mr. Edler? I oh, am. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's get the court reporter to swear in, Mr. Edler, and then we're going to do a voir dire. Can you raise your right hand for me, please, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Edler, before Mr. Vihel takes over, did you submit a resume? Because I wouldn't know where to look. Uh, no, sir. Oh, there's no, no resume. No. Okay. Mr. Vihel, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Edler, uh, can you tell us what you, uh, where you're currently employed? I am retired three years ago. You're retired. And how long have you been retired? Three years. I retired in 2000, December of 2018. Okay, great. I uh, hope to join you someday in the ranks of the retired. Uh, maybe I'll make it. Um, and, and previous to your retirement, uh, where were you employed? Um, 
I spent 20 years working for Kinstra Incorporated, and we own six batch plants, two block manufacturing plants, and a precast plant. And after that, I worked uh, at an oil refinery for 14 years. And I'm um, sorry, this last that uh, what was the last place you worked that you you said I didn't hear you? I'm sorry. Uh, in an oil refinery for a mechanical contractor. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much. Now um, you said uh, you said that you uh, that you worked somewhere, but then you said we owned. So were you an owner of this operation that you? Uh, what was the name of it again? I'm sorry. It was named. It was called Kinster Incorporated. And I did not own it. I just worked there. Oh, I see. And, and uh, what was the nature of their business? We own six batch plants for concrete, and we own two block manufacturing plants, which was made with concrete. And we owned a precast plant, which was all your big sewer pipes, septic tanks. So we pretty much did everything with, with making stuff out of concrete. Okay, great, great. And and what was your capacity? What capacity did you work there? I started out mainly as a truck driver, but I drove the front end loaders. I pretty much did a little bit of everything, but anything that had wheels on it, I drove. Yeah, that's great. Um, have you ever uh, have you ever been involved in the, the uh, design of a concrete batch plant? No, sir. Have you ever uh, have you ever been involved with the submission of an application uh, for a concrete batch plant with the New Mexico Environment Department or any uh, regulatory agency in any state? No, sir. Uh, are uh, are you an engineer? No, sir. I see. Uh, I have no further questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hanasco. Can we we can Mr. proceed? Vinasco? Yes, yes, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, I'm not I'm not sure it, who's 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 um going to be dealing with this with is it Ms. Sakura or yes. or you? Yes, Ms. Yes, Ms. Sakura. Sakura. Ms. Sakura, I'm looking through your pre-hearing submission, your SOI, in other words, and I'm starting with the January 19 one. And um, I have found, by the way, which I do find helpful finally, I did find the page where you said testimony of Carlos Etorte via Real. So um, I do have something that helps delineate the starting and stopping of the exhibits, even though they're not properly uh, marked. Then I see testimony of Brianna Bernal. I just don't know where that ends because I can't find a similar sheet to uh, help me with, with Mr. Edler's uh, pre-filed testimony. So will you help me? Of course, and we we did that a little bit out of order. We're going to do Mr. Edler first and Mr. Martinez last. So, in our um, statement of intent, Mr. Martinez comes after Ms. Bernal, and Mr. Edler comes after Mr. Martinez. And that well, would you be have the to same. Give, you have to give me a minute so I can find these things. So uh, hold on. I sure. okay. Well, I see Mr. Martinez exhibits, and uh, then it seems like. Uh, there aren't many. There's really only a resume here, uh, and I, I I don't see anything for this witness here. Can you help me? On page 15. Well, I, I don't have page numbers, ma'am. Okay. Um, you didn't so you didn't you didn't label these in any way. There's not even a page number here. Um, there's page numbers on the copy that we have, um, of, of the, of the, hold on. Are you looking at the submission from January 19? That's yes. what I have in front of me. Okay. Okay. Show me where is the, um, where is the exhibit for this witness? There's no exhibit. He's there's simply in the body of the statement. There is a Roman numeral number four. In the body of the statement, what do you mean by body of the statement? You mean the, uh, the 1st couple of pages. So, what we did is just, we provided summaries for each witness. Okay, I see that. Of 
intent. And so we didn't I see that. patch a separate. Okay, I'm with you now. I, I, I'm there. I'm there. So basically, I'm now turning to look. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. On page 15 of the uh, of the. Uh, I'm not sure what you would call this. I guess it'd be a motion or or the SOI. It's page 15. That has page numbers, and I do see here. Um, I do see here his. Um, Okay, now the following exhibits are submitted in connection with Mr. Edler's testimony, the NSR minor source permit application for Roper and I see because that's part of the administrative record. That's why it's not here. I understand right. now. Thank you. Thank you. And table 2C. Okay. The same is true. Okay, so you say here that Mr. Edler is an ex expert qualified by knowledge, skill, experience and training. To provide opinions regarding the reality of concrete batch operations, I've not heard. Um, I've not heard his qualifications to be a technical expert. Can you um, explain that? Mr. Edler is going to be providing testimony about his experience for working for 20 years at a concrete batch plant and what the day to day operations look like in, in terms of. What happens at the plant? What kinds of um, emissions occur based on his um, direct experience working for 20 years at a concrete batch plant? Okay, I understand. I understand where this is coming from. Um, however, how does it how does it um, specifically apply to this draft permit? He's going to be testifying that he does not agree with the um, emissions control efficiencies at the bag house. Um, okay. Okay. He'll be testifying about the um, uh, emissions controls at the, the aggregate piles. He's going to be testifying about the emissions controls that occur when um, concrete is unloaded into the okay. trucks. Okay. Um, you, you don't have to. I understand, and this comes from his, his 20 years of experience working in a concrete batch plant. That's correct. Okay, all right. Well, um, the rule is very uh, broad when it comes to technical testimony. I don't have an objection based on uh, from the parties. So what I will do is, is there any, is there any rebuttal testimony or is this just direct? He does have a, a, a brief rebuttal testimony, but it's it's basically just a reiteration of his um, direct testimony. Okay, then I will give him 15 minutes to summarize his testimony, although there's really nothing to summarize because he hasn't filed any testimony. He's filed summary, a summary of his testimony. Well, you filed. Is, we you filed a summary. You filed. That's, so these are your words, not his, right? Okay, so there's nothing filed in his own words that he would be adopting. So this will be new testimony. Um, I will give him 15 minutes to provide testimony. Uh, we will call it technical testimony based on his experience. Um, and we will start now at 316. So please proceed. Just one brief thing. He did file um, written rebuttal testimony um, that, that we would like to address there are there are certain things that are different okay um, let me find it hold on sure. let me find it how uh would help me find it okay if you look at the the um property owners of southern terrace notice of intent to present rebuttal technical I'm here go ahead if you go to page seven uh, i'm here yes summary of opinions and mr edler's experience Right, but these okay. This is similar to the uh, the SOI, the direct SOI, in that you are summarizing his opinion, but it's not it's not drafted by him. So there's nothing more than a summary here that you drafted. So he has 15 minutes to provide a summer or to to provide testimony. Um, um, so please please proceed, Mr. Edler. Do you have an um, an opinion about how Efficient bag houses are in controlling em emissions at concrete batch plants. Um, my, uh, in my experience, when you drive by a concrete plant and you see the, the tall silo. That the cement is in the way you can tell that they leak. Is you look for gray streaks going down the side of the silos. 
that tells you that there is cement that has escaped from the bag houses that's laying up on top of the silo. And when it rains, that's what those gray streaks are you see them. And I've seen them for 20 years. I, I always look when I go by one just out of habit. And I don't think I've ever seen one without some. So there is cement that gets out. And at what, um, how does that cement get out of those bag houses? Anytime they're open for maintenance or anytime there's a, a seal that leaks a little bit, and anytime they have to get in to change the filters, it is a pressurized system. So any pinhole or any any piece of the bag house that doesn't completely fit right, it's going to be pushing it out. The stuff is like talcum powder, baby powder. It's very fine. And in your experience, um, what kind of emissions are um, released from these bag house products? Uh, say the question again. Sure. In your experience, um, is the are the emissions that um, come from these bag house products significant? Over time, yes, they are. They, they, it's it's real fine, and it, I mean, it piles up every day. If you're pouring concrete every day, if there's a leak, it just keeps piling up till it rains, and then it washes down the side, or the wind blows it. And if the wind, um is blows stronger are those emissions do they go further absolutely i um, the, um weather is a hobby of mine has been for a long time i have a davis instrument weather station at my house that's the kind that colleges and refineries and businesses use i pay attention to that every day and quite a few people on here have mentioned the wind. Four weeks ago, I had sustained winds of over 25 miles an hour for three days in a row, 24 hours a day. The maximum gust was 62 miles an hour, and I had quite a few of them in the 50s. And that, that kind of wind just like we was talking about, if they have to open the bag house to change the filters, or it's got a little leak anywhere, that stuff's gonna gonna be in the neighbor's yard. It will not stay on his piece of property. And and the wind blows. We lived here for three years, and it is very distinct in March, April, and then in the fall again. And we just had really bad winds. Uh, just three months ago in the middle of the winter and everybody in the subdivision up here, I live approximately a little bit over a half mile from where the concrete batch plant is wanting to be built. And I mean, that's a topic of conversation. The wind up here blows a lot and it blows for quite a while. It, 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 the Holloman and Air Force thing is nowhere close to what the weather is up here. Do you have an opinion on whether the aggregate storage piles will be a source of emissions? Yes, they will, because they're talking about, they said they was gonna put water on them. Okay, so you got a pile of aggregate, which is rock. When the trucks come in, one thing I haven't heard anybody talk about, when the tractor trailers come in and dump their 50,000 pounds of rock, they lift the trailer up in the air. That's sticking up in the air about 20 foot. And when you dump 50,000 pounds of rock on this pile, there's going to be dust. It's rock. It's going to have dust in it. Now they're saying, okay, we're going to put water on it. Well, the pile of rock is going to be 10, maybe 15 feet tall, maybe 15, 15 foot across in a square. What they use that I've seen that we had was it's like a sprinkler system. So it, it's not like a fire hose. It's not going to soak the whole pile. If the wind blows, the efficiency of that's going to go down. 
because it's like holding in your sprinkler in your yard. If the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour, half the water is going to be going somewhere else on the pile. The next thing with that, when the loader, the big front end loader, when they drive into that pile to get a big scoop of rock, the the pile itself. The maybe the top inch or two of the rock has got damp. The stuff on the bottom where the where the loader's digging into, it's dry, and you're gonna have dust. The loader picks that up, drives back. He's got to drive 30 feet, 40 to go over to dump that into the hopper, so the leg can take the the conveyor system can take it up to the top of the bin. So when the loader pulls up, he lifts his his bucket up about 12 foot tall, and then you dump 4,000, 5,000 pounds of rock in the metal container, and that's dry rock. The wind's blowing, the dust is gonna carry that somewhere else. In your experience, is there a significant amount of dust that's associated with those processes you just described? Every day we left work, our cars were full of dust. So, yes. Do you have an opinion about um, the emissions that would be that would occur at the cleaning during cleaning operations at the at a concrete batch plant? Uh, you're talking about the bag houses, the cleaning operations. Oh, at the end of the day. That's correct. Yes. Uh, at the end of the day, every mixer truck has to be washed out. They'll back underneath the batch plant, get about 100 gallons of water dropped in them, and then they go to some place that's called a washout pit. And, and I've never, I haven't seen anything in the application about what they're going to do about a washout pit. Well, how that works, the truck backs up there, they reverse their drum. And it cleans out what's left in the truck from all day. And that will be leftover chunks of cement that have dried up behind the fins. It'll be some rock, some sand, and you just dump it in these concrete pits. Eventually those get filled and then you have to move to the next pit. Then the though that stuff dries out, it turns back into rock, sand, and cement dust. Well, you have to clean that out. You can either, we used to dump it. We had a, a lot more area than ropers got down there, but we'd dump it way in the back and just pile it up. Well, every time you dig in there with your front end loader, you're digging in to dry. And as soon as you pick it up and start moving, some of it's falling off the side of the, off the, side of the bucket. And when you're going down the road, it's bouncing and you, you're going to have, you got dry cement, you're digging up so that the wind's blowing, it's, it's taking it somewhere else again, or it gets dropped in the parking lot. And then every time a truck drives in, they drive over that and then it creates more dust. Now he said he uh, water the lot down. With that, if you got a water truck spraying the dust down, that turns into mud. The trucks drive through it. They go back out on the highway, and then it starts throwing it off of their tires. And then you got the stuff laying in the road. Cars are driving over it, and it turns back into dust again. So the cleaning operations um, are a source of dust emissions in your experience? Yes. Now, there was testimony earlier that um, the emissions are going to stay on, they're going to be confined to um, the Roper property, um, and they're going to disperse right at the property boundary line. Do you agree with that testimony? No. Why is that? You know, it, it don't happen like that, especially here. When you're talking 30 or 40 miles an hour wind, there's no way. I mean, unless he builds a dome over his property, there's no way he can keep that there. And I have a we have a demonstrative exhibit um, that I'd like to show Mr. Edler. Mr. Edler, this is a we will make him a presenter 
And I just want you to know that he has three minutes left. Perfect. Thank you. Ms. Corral, could you make him an exhibitor? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, okay. We would be the presenters. Okay. Oh, very good. <laughs> okay, we could try now, please. Yeah, Mr. Hedder, can you see the video? Yes, ma'am. Can you see what's in the background? Yes, that's the concrete silo and the bins for the aggregate at a batch plant. And is this a representative in your experience of what happens at a concrete batch plant on a windy day? Absolutely. And because of the um, concrete batch plant emitting this amount of fugitive dust, where are these it, plants usually located? This looks like the plant in Carrizozo. I recognize where, the, where in general are batch plants located? In outside of town or industrial areas. I don't think I've ever seen one in the middle of a residential area. And I've traveled a lot. I've been lucky to travel. Thank you. Okay, that's uh, that's all we have for Mr. Other, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay. We'll move on to Mr. Martinez. Okay, and before we go to Mr. Martinez, I just want you to know that I have received two emails from the hearing clerk. And I don't know if I should just ignore them because you're still working on these exhibits or not. But one sent out at 205 from Ms. Corral says Sonterra labeled exhibits. The next one says Sonterra labeled exhibits 1 through 15. Should I ignore both emails at this point? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. And we will endeavor to put after this hearing is over or either tonight or early tomorrow morning, we will put together a master list for you. Okay. Of the Correct numerical designations to make your life a lot easier. And yours and yours as well. Miss Myers. Miss Myers, uh, so just so you understand, even though I have admitted them into evidence, since they're not marked at this point, we're not really going to do anything more with Sonterra's exhibits until they provide them marked uh, to me. And then I will make sure to get them to you as marked. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. I don't want there to be any confusion. So now you're going to call your last witness. Uh, and who is that? Mr. Lude Martinez. Is he here? He's going to be sitting right down next to me. Oh, he's next to you. Okay, very good. Mr. Mr. Martinez, Mr. Mr. Sir, uh, this is Chris name? Vigil. I'd like to apply here this one. Uh, okay, me, sir, Mr. Vigil, after um, he spells his name and gets sworn in. Uh, my name's Elude. L. Martinez, the first name spelled E L U I D. And your last name, please? Martinez, M I R T I N E Z. Okay. Martinez. Could we get the court reporter to swear him in? Yes. Will you raise your right hand, please, for me, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And Mr. Martinez, before Mr. Vigil voir you, um, I think I saw a piece of paper. Here we go. At the end of the SOI that was submitted January 19, I have the testimony of Elude Martinez, and it says exhibits. I have a resume. And, That's correct. Okay, good. And then I see a New Mexico Office of the State Engineer uh, it looks like a well application. And then I see uh, maybe some uh, regulations or general conditions of approval. Uh, those are your those are your uh, two exhibits, is it? Uh, that particular application refers to uh, a, a well permit that had been issued on the Roper property where this plant is going to be situated. Mr. Martinez, that's not my question. Yep. My question is, are those your two exhibits? Yes, beyond what's 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 um, already in the record in the, as in the application. Of course, well, of course. I'm just asking you about what's been submitted, Mr. That's Cora. Correct. And then, yes. and then, I'm going to go to these rebuttal, Sonterra rebuttal, just to see what were there. Um, 
Were there, I see summaries here, so I guess there were no exhibits. Well, there, there is one exhibit one, but that's an email from Liz Stefanics to uh, a constituent or a house member. Okay, uh, then I think these are the only two exhibits that we're, that we're going to bring in on this, his testimony. Mr. Vigil, I just wanted to clear that up for my own um, understanding. So uh, please proceed with your voir dire. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Mr. Martinez. Uh, I've uh, been in cases with you before. I'm uh, in particular, uh, you might recall the uh, New Mexico copper case. I've uh, I've seen you testify. I know you have a long, uh, uh, long and uh, respectable career. Um, so, uh, beginning in 1971, it looks like you you began your career as an engineer, and it seems like you've worked uh, ex almost exclusively. Uh, in the area of uh, water with regard to the American Southwest. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily. Well, yes, that's correct. I see. And that includes a presidential appointment, right, uh, to the Bureau of Reclamation. Is that correct? That's correct. And a Senate appointment, uh, state Senate appointment uh, as the secretary of the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission. No, that was a uh, that was appointment by the governor of state of New Mexico and confirmed by the state senate. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, and you also served as the state engineer as a cabinet secretary. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, in uh, in your in your career, have you? Uh, what, can you tell us a little bit about any uh, experience you have with concrete batch plants? I don't recall any. I see. Have you ever uh, been involved in the the writing or development of of a concrete batch application? No. Have you ever submitted or reviewed the concrete batch plant application uh, to the New Mexico Environment Department or any state agency in any state? No. I see. And in in. Uh, uh, it, it, you could just give us a ballpark estimate, or you could give us a number about how many concrete uh, applications have you been involved in? Concrete batch plant applications? Yes. For, for air quality or water quality? Uh, uh, <laughs> a water, you're saying water quality in concrete batch applications? You have, you have been involved in concrete batch plant applications with regard to uh, Water quality? No. Okay. Uh, have you been involved in concrete batch plants at all in any capacity? No. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Rose, is there any voir dire from you? No, Mr. Hearing Officer. I'm familiar with Mr. Martinez's history and his experience. Okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see, do we have rebuttal testimony, uh, Ms. Sikora? Uh, yes, we do, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, so then this witness will be limited to 30 minutes. If he needs to use all of it, it is 3.36 now. Mr. Martinez, could you briefly describe your um, education and experience? Uh, before we start, there was one correction to my summary testimony. Okay. I need to could you, briefly, could you briefly describe your education and experience, please? Yes, I was a uh, graduate of the New Mexico State University in 1968 with a degree in civil engineering. In 1971, I went to work with the state engineer's office, which administers the waters of the state of New Mexico. Worked in that office from 1971 through 1994 uh, in various capacities. In 1990, I was appointed state engineer by the governor, confirmed by the Senate. And I retired from that position in late 1994. In 1995, I was appointed by President Clinton as the commissioner of the United States Bureau of Reclamation, confirmed by the United States Senate, and I served in that capacity for five years. Uh, after retiring from that federal position, I came back home and opened a water rights consulting company where I consult in water rights and water resources management in the state of New Mexico. And I still uh, am the principal in that company and I still consult, consult to this day. 
Mr. Martinez, did you file a, a written summary of your opinions in this matter? Uh, yes. Do you have any corrections to that written summary? Yes, and, and one of the uh, places in my summary where I make reference to potential sources of supply for, for water, I reference uh, a potential source being an application for the appropriation of water in the state of Mexico and make a comment that the Rio Hondo stream system is closed and therefore the engineer would reject an application. Upon inquiry with the Roswell Division of the State Engineer's Office last week, I was informed that they're still accepting applications for new appropriations of groundwater in Hondo Basin. So that would uh, be a change in my testimony. And that would be it. And does that change Mr. in your Sakura? Yes. Mr. Sakura, I'm looking for I'm looking for the full written testimony of Mr. Martinez and I don't see it. Are you are you referring to the summary? Yes. We we filed summaries of our Okay, I, I want to make sure that I'm looking for the right uh sure. for the right thing here. It's on, it's on page so I'm going from 11, page 11 of your summaries or your SOI to basically yeah. four, to 14. And, and I, I have a question for your um, for your witness. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but then you'll be free to continue. Mr. Martinez, did you write this? I wrote the underlying information that was you know, summarized by the attorney. Okay, so so then is the answer no then? Did I write this particular one? No, I provided the underlying information. Okay. I, I, my question to you, sir, is starting on page 11 and going to 14, are these your words? Yes, to the extent that they were taken from my underlying document. The, okay, so, sir, I'm going to take that answer as a no. It sounds like someone else has recharacterized your whatever you submitted. Is that correct? They've summarized what I submitted. Yes, that's thank you. Okay, please proceed. Um, that one change that we just spoke of to your testimony um, regarding the potential sources of water does that change your opinion about the sources of water? No, and why not? It doesn't change my opinion. The opinion I I'm referring to is that the only, only viable based source of supply would be uh, trucking of water, and it doesn't change that opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, so, do you adopt this summary um, as your uh, a summary of your pre-filed testimony? Yes, Ms. Sakura. Yes. Would you direct me to the sentence or sentences that were just modified by his testimony? Yes, of course. If you look on page 13. Okay, I'm there. It's at the top of the page and it's the first full sentence. It starts an application seeking a permit for a new appropriation. I see that. So, um, but there's another sentence after that. So, Mr. Martinez, would you please correct on the record what you are changing on page 13? Yes, um, the sentence that reads right now is, reads an application seeking a permit for a new appropriation of groundwater, underground water, groundwater for industrial purposes or industrial uses at the facility would be rejected because the site of the proposed well will be located within the underground water basin, which is now close to a new appropriation. That is changed to, the, to uh, that the applicant can seek a new appropriation of groundwater for industrial uses of the facility because the state engineer's office is, not, is accepting applications for new appropriation. What about the next sentence? Would you read that and tell me if that still applies? That particular sentence, go, sentence goes to the transfer of water rights, which is a different issue. Okay, all right. So then the only sentence that's affected is the one you just mentioned and you've clarified. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kerr. Of course. Mr. Martinez. 
do you have an opinion about the um, whether the application is complete um, based on the lack of identification of a source of water? Yes, I have an opinion, and, and the reason for that opinion is I looked at the application with reference to the use of water to address emissions that would, re that would result from uh, this particular batch plant and identified where in the application and the supporting documentation a reference is made to the use of water. And there are several places in that uh, application, or the, the report to the application where water is referred to as a means of abating uh, the uh, emissions. And it, it appears to me that water is critical to the control of the emissions. And without a showing of the amount of water would be necessary or where the water would come from, it appears to me that uh, the abatement could not occur. Do you have an opinion about how water um, could be, um, how the applicant um, would obtain water at that site? Yes, the, the, the applicant can obtain water from three sources that I've identified. An on-site well, uh, bringing in water by a pipeline, or trucking water into the site. And do you have an opinion about which is the most likely of those three um, options? That um... I, I was not able to locate a pipeline, uh, a, a water pipeline that could be made available to this site. Uh, there is no well on the property that's been uh, approved by the state engineer for commercial use based on my review of the file state engineer's office. So it would appear to me that the most viable uh, uh, way of getting water to that site would be by trucking it. And if we could um, get the ability to share our screen, can we um, I'm going to show you a, a draft permit. Water permit. Mm -hmm. Are you aware whether or not the applicant had, um, Mr. Roper had applied for a permit to appropriate groundwater at this site? Uh, yes, and the exhibit uh, that the hearing officer was referring to with respect to the state engineer document, that is a copy of an application that had been made by Mr. Roper for a livestock well at the site where the proposed uh, plant is to be located. Uh, that permit was approved by the state engineer's office, uh, allowed the diversion of three acre feet, up to three acre feet per annum for livestock purposes only. And when was that? Uh, the date of the permit, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but let's see. Uh, it's the date of the permit would have been May 7th, 2021. In the is this permit can um, the applicant use water under this permit for the operation of the concrete batch plant? No. And do you are you aware of what happened to this permit um, subsequent to the May seventh um, permit approval? Uh, the files of state engineer's office electronic files indicate that the well has not been drilled, and Mr. Roper requested that that permit be withdrawn and canceled. When was that? That was subsequent to May, to the date of uh, of the summary uh, testimony. If you look at this. Um... That, that would have been canceled on January 24, 2022. Have you reviewed the application in terms of how much water is required to produce 125 cubic yards of concrete? Uh, yes. How much? The, uh, the estimate is uh, 40, um, approximately 48 acre feet per year. And? And that's for the production of up to a maximum of five, 
500,000 cubic yards as set forth in the application. And um, how, how many gallons is approximately 48 acre feet per year? It's approximately 15,600,000 gallons. And so how many gallons is that a day to produce that amount of concrete? If you use a 365 days, you're about 42,000 gallons on average per day. Did you, um, we heard testimony today that uh, the amount of truck trips is going to be limited to 305 truck trips a day. Did you um, review the application um, regarding the delivery of water through water trucks? Yeah, I mentioned that, that uh, 42,000 gallons per day on average would require a truck load. If a truck was hauling 2,000 gallons per day, I mean, per trip, require approximately 22 trucks per day. Uh, I, where I found in the application and the, and the supporting material was the section dealing with haul roads that included uh, the number of trucks that were hauling materials into the site. Okay. Uh, water is a material that would be hauled into the site and my review of the documentation reflects that the water water trucks that would be used if the water was hauled by trucks is not included or addressed in the application. And you looked, you just testified about how many trucks that would be a day. Um, what was that number again? Approximately 22 based on a truck that can haul 2,000 gallons per load. Um, do you know whether or not um, there are water storage tanks at the facility? Uh, I'm not aware of any storage uh, tanks on the, on the property. Uh, and uh, the application documents don't refer to any storage tanks as being proposed or on site for water. Did you um, look at the um, applications um, assertion that they're going to uh, additional moisture content and is uh, the emissions factor at units three, four, five, and six? Yes, the the, uh, the supporting documentation refers to several tables. Uh, one table identifies all the units where they expect to have emissions. Another table addresses how those units would be addressed by moisture. And that one of the tables reflects units, those units as having additional moisture content as a control mechanism. And did you make any calculations regarding how much water would be required if that additional moisture content was not present in those piles? With respect to those units, there's no way for a determination to be made. There's no evidence, no, no, no supporting documentation or anything in the, in the application that would enable somebody to make an estimate. But water is going to be required at those units. Is that correct? That, yeah, that's correct. The, the, the application says water will be required at those units. Doesn't address quantity or source. What about for the aggregate piles? Now, the aggregate piles is a different issue because if you look at the application, in the calculation portion of the application, it assumes that the way I read it is that emissions will be controlled by moisture within the aggregate and sand pile. And it, it estimates, a, I believe, a 2.65 percentage of the volume of the aggregate and sand to be water. So by using that and going back to the 500,000 cubic yards of proposed concrete, I can estimate that the maximum amount of water that would be required at the aggregate and sand piles to abate uh, uh, emissions would be approximately 14 acre feet per year. And so that would be in addition to the 48 acre feet per year that's required just for operations. Is that right? That's correct. And so did you do any calculations about how much water just the aggregate piles and the operations would require? 
Well, that's the answer I gave you. It would be 50, well, probably 14 acre feet per year. To added, so it would have, if the piles were dry, it would have to be added to the piles. If the pile contained the moisture, it wouldn't have to be added. So it would be a 14.1 acre feet maximum. Okay. Um, so did you, um, are there any calculations regarding how much water would be required to um, obtain control of emissions at units three, four, five, and six? Well, I just answered that, that there's not any information available for you to make that estimate. But there would be some amount of water, correct? There would have to be because the, 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 the applicant proposes to use water to abate emissions at those units. So if you took the approximately 48 acre feet just needed for operations and added it to the cap of 14 acre feet to um, obtain moisture control of the piles, what, what's your total amount just for those two units? Approximately 60 acre feet a year. And how much water is that? Well, if you can visualize an acre of land, the water will be stacked 60 feet high. What do you have an opinion about um, whether or not the applicant needs to identify a source and supply of water? The applicant proposes to utilize water to meet the abatement conditions that would result from emission control. It doesn't appear to me personally. Uh, to, on the one hand, say we're, we're going to need water, but not quantify how much we're going to need or where it's going to come from. Uh, and it would be, I think, incumbent to have that information, because if the water is neither is not available, then the conditions cannot be met as required by approval of a permit. And if the water is available, can the applicant comply with air quality standards? Well, I think the if it's shown <clears throat> that the water is available, both at two quantities and, and, and source, then they would comply with conditions of the permit. But if they don't provide that information, what would happen? Well, if they, provide, if they don't provide that information, what you wind up with is, in my opinion, is approval of an, of an application that would allow construction of a facility that, for all practical purposes, if the water's not available, would be a construction of a facility would be sitting out there not being able to be used. Thank you. That's all we have for our witnesses. Okay, are your witnesses ready to stand for cross examination? They are. Okay, and they're going to stand as a panel. That's correct. Mr. V Hill, would you like to go first? Sure. I just have questions for Mr. Martinez. Uh, Mr. Martinez, um, you, you said just a, uh, maybe about a minute and a half ago that uh, that there you you estimate the 60 acre feet per year would be needed for aggregate piles for emission controls. Um, where did you derive this estimate from? No, what I said is the 60 acre feet would be a combination of the amount of water that would be required to produce the concrete and the amount of water that would be necessary to abate the aggregate and sand. And the I may right, take your time. It would be uh, we would address the section six, page two of the Montrose report. 
Uh, there's a section dealing with uncontrolled particulate emission rates. At the bottom paragraph, it made reference to moisture content for sand and aggregate. And the way I interpret the discussion of this subject is that the particulate matter that will result from the aggregate and sand does not require mitigation because the mitigation is the moisture in the piles, which is estimated at 2.6% of volume. So what I'm saying is that if the aggregate and the sand have the, 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 the moisture in them, then you don't need any additional water. But if the piles of sand and aggregate are do not have the 2.65% moisture content, then you need to apply water. And the estimate of the 14 acre feet assumes the maximum production and the piles being dry. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it, it's a, yes, thank you so much. It's interesting to me. Um, it, it's a very detailed answer for someone who has never uh, uh, worked on uh, concrete batch plants before. Uh, did you write this testimony and is this testimony yours? Yeah, let me answer this. I'm a registered professional engineer, been practicing engineering, civil engineering for over 50 years. I, I'm answer. asking the question, sir. I'm asking yeah. the question. Thank you very much. I calculated this. So let me move on to my next question. Uh, you gave the opinion uh, that the permit application or should require uh, that water resources be proven. Where did you uh, get that idea and what is that based on? That is my opinion. And it's based on the fact that it does not appear to be practical to, to require water as a means of granting the permit without knowing if the water is going to be available either in quantities or sources before that permit is approved. That's a personal opinion. Oh, it's a personal, I see. You're giving a personal opinion. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to move on to your direct testimony. Uh, let's see here. If I could have the sharing screen, would that be possible? Is um is the administrator able to do that for me? Can I have the share screen, please? Yes, hang on. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it for you, Mr. V Hill. Hold on. Thank you. There you go. See it. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, let me see here. Uh, can you see this, uh, Mr. Martinez? Uh, Needs to be bigger, maybe? Just, just, uh, is that better? Okay, good. Um, you give the opinion in your direct testimony or your uh, summary of testimony that the application is incomplete and, uh, and unreliable because the requested permit capacity of 20.3 trucks an hour does not include trucks necessary to accomplish the delivery of water required for the operation of the concrete batch plant for the emission control measures identified by the applicant. Uh, my question is about your your uh, uh, your uh, expert opinion that the application is incomplete. Uh, what do you, what is the basis of your opinion? How how is it that you know that the application is incomplete? I'm glad you asked that question. The the the, the application requires identification 
of trucks that are hauling material for the processing of the concrete. The application in, in, the, in the supporting documentation make no reference to the trucking of water. So if water is trucked into that facility, that has not been accounted for in the calculations. And if you don't account for something in the calculations, then it's in, the application is insufficient. And, and that, that's another personal opinion? No, that's that's a fact. The, <laughs> that's a, it's a fact. Okay, is that, okay it's a fact. But what is the fact? Based on? Like, I guess I'm wondering where how do you ask, obtain this fact. Let me ask. A, let me ask you a question. On section six, page section six, page one, under road calculations. I'm answer. I'm asking the questions I, here, sir. I'm not I'm under examination. But you ask a question. I want to answer it. Okay. It reads, if you transport raw materials, process materials, or, or product into or the facility more frequently than one round trip per day, you have to account for that trip in your analysis. And all I'm saying is that if they're trucking water in and that has not been accounted for, then the application mechanics are not correct. Thank you so much. I have one other question for you. Uh, going now to your rebuttal testimony. Um, in your in your testimony, you testify that the deputy director, uh, the deputy cabinet secretary for NMD, uh had made a claim to uh, a senator, a state senator. Um, how how did you know this? That document was brought to my attention, and the document speaks for itself. And what the, uh, uh, I, it doesn't speak to me. What does it say, sir? Can you explain to us why it's relevant to your testimony? Uh, let me, can I have a copy of it so I can read it? It's up on the screen. I can't let me see. see. Let, me, may, let me make it larger, I'm sorry. I guess I'm not understanding how this is relevant to your testimony. Could you explain that to us? The that statement I interpret to mean that the secretary has no authority on, under law or under regulation to deal with water issues. That's the way I interpret it. The, on the face of the application. Are you going to scroll back up? I'm sorry. Uh, is everybody on? You can probably hear us. But... Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Should I call back in? Yes. Okay. Yes or no? We can hear him. I don't think there's any problem. Okay. It, it, I can hear everyone. It says, she stated, does not have the authority under applicable statute and rules to make a decision on the air permit based on water quality issues. And I'm saying the permit on its face depends on water to, to be effective. So for a statement to say that the water cannot, issues cannot be considered on an air permit does new to me not make sense because the the permit is conditioned on being to use uh, being able to use water. So that opens the question as to how much water and how can the agency make sure that the water is available to affect the permit. That's the point I was trying to make. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think you have, I have one more question for you. Right above that, and if you look on the screen, it's up here. Uh, you testify that accordingly, consideration at the hearing of other evidence related to water rights well permits water resources and water consumption. 
uh, are relevant evidence in order to uh, determine the applicant can comply with the moisture requirements set above. Uh, just one last question. Um, how do you know what is relevant evidence? How, how do you do, how do you make that determination? Uh, uh, maybe I'll. Looks like they're gone. Can't tell. They're no longer on the screen. I do not hear them as well. Ms. Myers, let's take a five minute break and let them come back on. Thank you. and counsel for Sonterra and Mr. Martinez back uh, with Ms. Sakura. And Mr. Vigil, you were asking a question and I think it, there was no answer unless I am mistaken. Uh, yeah, I, uh, thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. I uh, appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Mr. Martinez. I have no further questions. I'll withdraw the question. Um, and uh, I have no further questions for any of the witnesses okay. at this point. Mr. Rose. Mr. Hearing Officer, Mr. Hearing Officer, yes. there's a uh, question pending that I think the witness is entitled to answer. And who is telling me this? That's sorry, it's Ms. Sakura. Can you see me? So I think Mr. Vihal just. Sakura, the question has been withdrawn. So there's no question to answer. Mr. Martinez was in the middle of his answer when there were technical difficulties. So it would be akin to Mr. Vigil interrupting Mr. Martinez. Okay, let me check with the court reporter. Let me let me see what's going on. Ms. Myers? Yes. Okay, would you repeat, would you um, go look at the record and would you repeat the last question Ms., Mr. Vigil asked? And I didn't hear it. If there was an answer, will you give me whatever part of an answer there was? Yes. The last question that I have by Mr. Vigil was, how do you know what is relevant evidence? How do you make that determination? And the part of the answer that I have is maybe I'm, and that's it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna allow the, the witness to uh, finish his answer. The, the, the relevancy, in my opinion, comes from the fact that the permit is conditioned upon the use of water to, to abate the emissions that will result from this facility. In other words, it, the, the permit on its face relies on the use of water. And to say that water is not an issue in this permit process, I, I cannot reach that conclusion. It has to be relevant and it has to be an issue. Mr. Vigil? Uh, thank you. I have no further questions. Okay. Mr. Rose? Let me unmute first. Um, and let me start with uh, Dr. Etuarte. And for that matter, I guess anybody can answer, but I think my questions are more directed at his testimony. So uh, I believe he's back with us. Um, Dr. Etuarte, you, as I understood your testimony, in part, you're saying that the Sierra Blanca uh, meteorological data should have been used in this permit application and should have been part of the modeling uh, that was performed in, in support of this permit application. Is that correct? Well, what I'm actually saying is that the Sierra Blanca um, data set, it's more representative of the conditions of the uh, project uh, when compared with the Holman Air Force Base database. Uh, I don't know if there's any other uh, data source or, or med station uh, that may be more uh, more appropriate. And, and are you familiar with the EPA criteria or the monitoring guide, the MET guidance concerning the, the amount of data or 
the number of days that's required for use of a net set in modeling? Correct, yes. And are you familiar with, and I'm referring to the February 2000 EPA document entitled Meteorological Monitoring Guidance for Regulatory Modeling Applications. That's what you're familiar with? Yes, I'm familiar with that guidance. And are, and are you familiar with um, requirements of that document for completeness? Yes. Um, and do you know what the document says is the requirement for a MET data set, the completeness of the MET data set to be used for modeling uh, analysis? Yeah, I believe it's 90% 90, 90 of uh, um, recorded hours. That's correct, and it's on page 5-4. Um, do you know whether the Sierra Blanca MET set meets that requirement? Uh, no, I don't know. Were, were you here when when Mr. Wade testified about the use of of the uh, Sierra Blanca data and the fact that it was approximately 22% uh, missing data in that MET set? Uh, no, I, I wasn't on, on, on the uh, hearing. Okay. Um, if, if in fact, uh, Mr. Wade's representation is correct, uh, would it be appropriate to use the Sierra Blanca MET set? Uh, correct. Yeah, or or any other more appropriate uh, data sets. And and do you know whether, for example, either the Alamogordo or the Holloman Air Force Base MET set uh, met the 90% criteria? Uh, no, I'm not aware of the uh, percentage of uh, completeness. Okay. Um, I think you also testified uh, concerning uh, running the model with either the Sierra Blanca MET set um, and the and you testified concerning uh, Mr. Wade's testimony on what the results were when he ran it, correct? Yes. And you testified that you couldn't opine as to the propriety of his answers because you didn't have access to to the data or the the inputs to the modeling analysis, is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. I, I'm, I'm there's no reference in the application or any other document uh, to the actual assumptions or the data inputs they uh, they use for for rerunning the model using the Sierra Blanca data set. And do you did you ever request access to those uh, data sets so that you could run the model? No, I did not. Um, okay. Um, let me refer to Ms. Bernal here for a second. Um, as I understood your testimony, um, you said that you prepared applications for concrete batch plants, correct? Yes, that's correct. And were any of those concrete batch plants in New Mexico? No, they were not. And were they mostly in Texas then? Yes, that's correct. Um, and are are and are were they all minor sources or were they major PSD sources? They were all minor sources. And under Texas rules, are you is an applicant required to conduct mon modeling as a part of that application? If they are a new source review, uh, not a standard permit, then yes. And of the sites you worked on, uh, were those uh, regular NSR permits or standard or permit by rule in Texas? I worked on a combination of standard permits, permit by rule, and NSRs. And so then you conducted, or or at least the mo modeling was conducted as a part of those, the, the NSR applications, correct? Yes, but I did not conduct modeling. I mainly did the application and the emissions for uh, emissions calculations for that. Okay. And let me see, Mr. Edler, I think you testified based on your experience at concrete batch plants, I guess, mostly in Illinois, is that correct? 
if he's still around. There he is. I think he's on mute. There we go. That's better. Yes, they were they were in Illinois. And how long ago uh, was that experience? Is it recent or I think you had talked about 20 years, but I wasn't sure from your testimony how long ago. Uh, we're getting some feedback, Mr. Adler. I'm not sure where from, but so we, we can't hear you. The last year I worked uh, was 2006. And are, are you familiar with um, dust control technology and whether there have been any advances in the technology in this industry since 2006? Mm, I'd have to say no. Um, for example, you were you here when uh, Mr. Wade testified earlier today? Yeah. And he used an exhibit that showed, for example, a central dust collection system. And and also had a picture of the uh, the silo bag houses. Is that correct? Right. And are you familiar with either of the the companies that supply these or the technology that's being proposed here? Um, not by not by name, no. So you couldn't opine that. If if Mr. Roper were to or Roper Construction were to employ these this technology or these uh, this equipment, that that in fact there would be emissions the way you predicted. Uh, only thing I can go by is what his other plant looks like, and I can see the cement seeping down the sides. And I would. It's the same yeah. thing. Didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you were finished. I just assumed he would use the same system that he's got down there, which. That's my assumption that could be wrong. And and my understanding is that the equipment and the technology he in, intends to use here is not the same as he's using at that facility so that it's a more modern equipment and in fact, maybe the most modern equipment of. Of any bag, or at least of any concrete batch plant in the state. Um, excuse me for a minute. Uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Officer, I have no further questions. Is there any redirect, Ms. Takura? No, Your Honor, we do not have any redirect. Okay, so then does Sonterra rest its case? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, it is 424, and I want to go back to public comment. Uh, Ms. Sikora and Mr. Hanasco, you're going to have at least an hour to get these exhibits uh, corrected and sent out um, so that we can get this done today with the court reporter um, in attendance as opposed to email tomorrow. Uh, so let's go back to public comment. And I have a list in front of me of people who have signed up to speak. Uh, there is a, a large number of people listed. So uh, because I want to give everyone an opportunity to speak, there's going to be a three minute time limit. If you need more time, you can always ask for it. But we're going to start with a Mr. Jeff Blue. Uh, Mr. Hearing officer, before he starts, are we going to discuss post hearing process after the yes. public comment? OK, thank you. Yes, and I, I, de I definitely want to get these exhibits <laughs> nailed down because I, I, I don't want the, anyone to be confused about this. So, Mr. Thank Blue, you. are you are you ready? Yes, I am. You are there. OK, wonderful, sir. Would you spell your name, please? J-E-F-F-B-L-E-A-U. EAU, thank you. And uh, please swear him in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed, sir. 
Okay, I, I live in Alto, uh, east of the proposed site, and the prevailing winds, you know, most of the year are from out of the west. Uh, I guess I would like to first start out by saying, I know it's been a long day and I wanna thank everybody for all of the help that they've they've given the NMAV staff uh, that's been here and at other sites. So thank you very much. Uh, to begin with, I wanna be sure to say that I'm not here to prevent the permit applicant from trying to advance his business. But I am here to say that the proposed location is inappropriate and possibly harmful to the community and the neighboring properties. Uh, we've talked a lot about the process today about dust generation. Um, we've, I'd like to emphasize that the, the proposed site is not a big site. So to get to the fence line doesn't take very long. And all the discussion about, uh, about wind speed and met data, it just is a function of how long, how long and how fast can a release get to the point that it becomes fallout. So that's, you know, it's gonna, we've got a lot of anecdotal data that shows that, that there's dust accumulation outside of concrete plants. Uh, so you can talk all you want about concentrations, the fact is that dust does accumulate in and around uh, concrete batch plants. Further, we've talked about the part particulate matter being suppressed by the use of water. Uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing some of the stuff because I'm trying to cut through it. Uh, the spray results in impacts to surface water and possibly groundwater. Uh, should the applicant ever use groundwater for production, it would clearly be a threat to residential well users in the area and uh, you know, and several people in the community, hundreds. Uh, additional uh, incidental impacts include air quality issues as we talked about related to transport vehicles, road issues and other equipment. These impacts will cross over into noise, light and operational nuisances. Now, for the last quarter century and beyond, uh, the area has been primarily residential and recreational use. The appeal of that will suffer in the presence of the plant. Uh, this could result in decreased values and tax revenues. This is something that I appreciate uh, Commissioner uh, Tom Stewart's position on, and I wish the rest of the county commission would get involved and, and get behind them. Um, and in essence, we really should be getting a better plan around, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a, an additional concrete resources, but they have to be located in the right place. And this, this isn't one of them. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Hearing Officer, you're on mute. Mr. Skinner, are you available for us? I'm Would you spell your name, please? Officer. Sir? Spell your name, please. Yes, it's J O H N S K I N N E R. Ms. Myers? Can you raise your right hand, please, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, so help me God. Thank you, sir. You have three minutes. Please proceed. My wife and I reside at 123 Coyote Mesa Trail, Alto, New Mexico. We have lived there for the past 24 years and have owned this seven and a half acres for the past 34 years. Our property is situated approximately one mile north northeast of the proposed batch plant. With the prevailing winds, in this area, it blows from the southwest. Consequently, that puts our house in the direct line of prevailing winds from the 
propose Roper batch plant. My wife and I have severe dry allergies or dry eye conditions as well as allergies. During the spring and the fall, the weather conditions are such that we like to have our windows open. If you approve the Roper batch plant, we would be subject to the pollute pollutants produced by the batch plant, which our doctors tell us would exacerbate the dry eye and aller allergic conditions. We would have to install central air, which we haven't needed for the past 24 years. We also object to the excessive water use, which has been previously mentioned by Mr. Martinez to be 41,000 gallons a day. Uh, this extreme water use would obviously deplete any existing wells in the vicinity of the Roper batch plant and would seriously lessen the value of our property. Several years ago, the Sonterra subdivision opposed Mr. Hubbard from transferring water rights from the Hondo Valley to his new subdivisions just north and west of Sonterra. And when the hydrologists testified in district court uh, that they would deplete uh, the wells at Sonterra, Mr. Hubbard was denied the transfer of his water rights. We contend that this is the same issue with the Roper concrete batch plant, and we ask that you deny Mr. Roper's request. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Mr. Batia. Sir, would you spell your name after you unmute yourself? K O S H B O T K I N. You're going to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm the owner of High Country Landscapes and Nursery, situated on the property directly adjacent to the proposed concrete bash plant. I'm with, with my property boundary is within less than 100 feet of where his proposed silo is, is supposed to be. Prior to beginning this business, I received my master's degree from Colorado State University in Ecology through the Warner College of Natural Resources and worked in range, rangeland ecology. My wife, a veterinarian, and I chose the Alto Rio Doso area to raise our young children because of its pristine environment and beauty. In 2013, I decided to deviate from my previous career path and pursue the American dream of entrepreneurship, leading to the creation of my business. My mission was simple, to provide, an, to provide ecologically sensitive landscapes to the public in an area where its natural resources can be preserved. At the same time, maintaining the natural beauty of New Mexico and educating the public on the various flora, flora and fauna in the area as they relate to landscapes. It has always been my aspiration to create a self-sustaining nursery and provide its plant and tree materials to the community. High Country Landscapes Nursery now provides plants and trees to the local public and surrounding area, which in large part we grow here on site. We also retail landscape products and create designs that incorporate into finished landscapes for our customers. Part of our master plan is to design and perform future public outreach programs geared for youth and the general public on site in our state-of-the-art teaching greenhouse programs that will entail horticulture and general concepts and ecology as they apply to our ecological zone. When I purchased my property in 2014, I was the only business operating within the four initial tracks, land, uh, tracks of land being sold by Frank Reed. I had three sets of criteria the land had to meet without exception as I searched for the appropriate acres to carry out my aspiration. First, the property had to be closer located to the New Mexico, sorry, Highway 48. 
Second, the property had to be flat. And third, the land had to be protected by local zoning and or restrictions that would harbor certain protections to ensure the success and the future growth of my company. The property purchased in, 2000, purchased in 2014 and which is adjacent to the CBP met all those requirements. Like many, I was not notified through mail, flyer, or by phone regarding the proposal for the construction of a CBP, even though I stand to be the most affected by its operation. Instead, I found out through a, a concerned resident, resident living in her subdivision located directly across the highway after she happened to stop and examine an 8 by 11 sheet of paper posted obscurely 50 feet off the highway through dense vegetation and stapled to a barbed wire fence. This obvious disregard for transparency by rope for construction was not the first attempt to, to the surrounding community to disguise his intentions for their property. The first came when he intentionally misled the seller and, and me about his plans for the property. Mr. Roper understood the land would not be sold to him if his intent was to operate an industrial business such as the CBP. The second came shortly after that before he closed on the property when Mr. Roper tried to unilaterally change the language and the deed restrictions that would allow him protections in operating a CBP as confirmed by an email chain between he, he and his title company. Okay. May I have more time? Mr. Botkin, can you sum it up in about 15 seconds, whatever else you had to say? Sure. So skipping through everything I had prepared, my nursery stands to lose quite a bit. Uh, the dust that, that falls, falls on my trees outside have been shown through various studies that it will cause degradation and plant health, leaf health, and all abiotic responses by the roots. I do not see how it is fair for InMed, whose mission statement has been reiterated multiple times today, how the greater good is outweighed by the by the individual in this in this instance. So in summary, I, I, again, I stand to lose quite a bit. Um, I have built this business from the ground up, and I do not know why I stand to be the one that, that loses everything uh, for the construction of a plant. Mr. Botka, thank you for taking your time to uh, advise the hearing uh, of your of your thoughts. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Thompson, Doug Thompson. Stuff turned on here. Oh, that's Mr. Great. Thompson, would you spell your name, please? Yes, my name is Doug Thompson. That's D O U G, last name Thompson, T H O M P S O N. Uh, Ms. Myers? Sir, will you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed, sir. In his opening statement, Mr. Vahil uh, cautioned many of the public comments would be emotional. That was his word. Most of my neighbors are not technical people. My expertise is in electronics, which kind of disqualifies me to be a technical expert in this area. However, what we are here to talk about is the effect of, on our lives. Oops, oops, okay. Is the effect on our lives uh, by it, and by definition, that is an emotional topic. Because this plant does not yet exist, it is unrealistic to expect technical grade comments from the public. And it is arrogant to make demeaning comments directed at us, the property owners and residents who live nearby the proposed location. During a hearing such as this one, there is no argument that can be presented to, to persuade any sentient being that this concrete batch plant will improve the quality of life for any living thing in the, in the area. If any of you folks up there in Baja, Colorado, that's north of I-40, is, uh, and if an industrial polluter of this nature were to be located within, within one half mile of your home, can you honestly say that you would not react with emotion? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Canella. Mr. Canella, after you take your mask off, would you spell your name for us? He is just walking in right now. Oh, okay. Well, um,
Ah, there you are. Mr. Canella, would you spell your name for the record? Let me hear it too. I'm not yes. listening. Yes. Uh, what? Let me hear it. Well, I, you thought you were taking a nap. Change some Can you hear that? Now we can hear you, sir. Please spell your name. Uh, Oh, this one? Okay. F R A N K uh, C A N N E L L A. Thank you, sir. Ms. Myers? Sir, will you raise your right hand for me, please? Yes. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Canella, you have three minutes to make a, a general comment. Okay, um, well, uh, my comments are that um, my opposition to the uh, proposed concrete plant, uh, he's proposing to establish this concrete plant in a residential neighborhood. It would adversely affect the air and water quality of the neighbors. I know that's been stated before, but I'll state it again. <clears throat> and I, I, I did some research and if if you look at that area, there's 11 subdivisions within um, just a mile or so of of, of that uh, concrete plant. Each of these subdivisions has its own water, and uh, and uh, you know lots of residents, so there'd be uh, impacts on the water and, and the residents that live there. And also, the uh, drains were set on top of the little creek drainage area. Which drains the Manjo area and White Mountain Wilderness. The Little Creek uh, drainage also provides water for hundreds of people in private wells and municipal water system. As the cement is made and trucks are clean, wastewater would go into the aquifer. The plant would be less than three miles from the White Mountain Wilderness area and would have a negative impact on the wilderness area. Also, the RV park and the plant nursery located nearby. Uh, would uh, would be adversely affected by the concrete plant and probably be forced to shut down. And it's for these reasons that uh, that I'm opposed to the uh, concrete plant. I just think it's an inappropriate uh, location because of the residential nature of that of of, of that uh, neighborhood. I don't think you would allow something like that in Santa Fe or Espanola. Uh, if you came down here and saw the, the land, it's beautiful land and it's totally residential and it's just totally inappropriate. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Canella. May I uh, now hear from Ms. Canella? Okay. Could you spell your name, please? It's the same as Frank, and my first name is Margaret, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T. Uh, okay, sounds good. We're going to swear you in now. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed. <laughs> Um, Frank and I uh, moved here in 1975, and we've been married for 50 years, and uh, I agree everything that Frank said, and I also want to put in that um, I read a lot about um, endangered species and how New Mexico is um, concerned about all kinds of endangered species in the Albuquerque Journal and also in the Rio Doso News, and one of the endangered species is the spotted owl. And the spotted owl is in our wilderness area, and the spotted owl doesn't stay in one tree all the time. He flies around, so he would be adversely affected by this plant and a lot of other animals, and most of all, the people that live here. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Canella. May I hear from Hank Jones if he's available? Should we move on to the next person on the list? Barbara mm -hmm. Yunt. Oh, 
Well, that was close. Miss Yoon, I'm would Dr. you please? Would My you, property. Miss you Yoon, would you please wait for just a moment? Thank you. Would you please first spell your name? B A R B A R A Y O U N T. You're going to be sworn in before you make your statement. You raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please, please proceed, Ms. Hute. I am Dr. Barbara Yant. My property is less than 100 yards from the proposed plant. Should you decide to approve this air quality permit, your decision will destroy my peaceful life of hiking, gardening, and spending hours every day and evening outdoors, enjoying the fresh air, stunning views, and night skies that brought me to Alto, New Mexico. Numbers on an application do not adequately describe the health damage that will accrue to the residents of the more than 140 properties within a one half mile radius of this site. NMED staff have told me that measures will be taken to prevent visible dust from crossing the property line. It is not the visible we fear, but the invisible. Respirable silica dust is one one hundredth the size of a grain of beach sand. This invisible silica dust when inhaled bypasses our body's defenses and goes straight to our lungs creating scars in the delicate lung fibers that can never be repaired and may eventually lead to terminal silicosis. It also exacerbates asthma, heart and lung disease, and thus starkly limits our outdoor activities, thus damaging not only our physical health, but our mental health as well. This proposed CBP with its toxic air, extreme water usage, loud industrial noise, proposed long operating hours and heavy truck traffic would reach far beyond its borders, harming the health and welfare of residents, disturbing habitats of native New Mexico wildlife, birds, plants, depleting natural resources and contaminating the scarce surface water and perhaps irreparably harming the subsurface water we all share. The benefits of this CBP will accrue to Roper Construction, leaving taxpayers of Lincoln County, taxpayers of New Mexico, and the federal government and local property owners to pay for the increased health care costs, road repairs, management of road dust and water quality, damage to local wells, loss of property value, in short, to subsidize the profits of Roper Construction. No company has the right to subsidize its profits with our physical and mental health. Concrete batch plants are a necessary part of 21st century construction, but this concrete batch plant at this location is wrong and a danger to the community. As a 78 year old little old lady with health issues, including allergies and a compromised immune system, I implore you to deny this permit. Thank you. May we next hear from Kevin Flaherty? Would you spell your name, sir? A E V I N. Excuse me. F L E H A R T Y. Ms. Myers? <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please proceed. I want to first start off by seconding Doug's comments about Mr. V Hill's inaccuracy and in descript describing us as a community that is not connected and is only mouthing off. And I'd like to second Barbara's comments about her feelings towards uh, our feelings towards the batch plant. I came to town and I came to town in 1974 for a weekend and I never left. Why? I have two grown kids, two grown grandkids, and I've been working in Lincoln County all this time 
And this is something that is beyond belief that it has gotten this far. We have nothing right to say about the batch plant. <clears throat> yes, cement is necessary in our community. The location is unnecessary. There is way too many negatives to outweigh the only positive that there is, and that is to line the pockets of Mr. Roper. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we'd like to hear from Ms. Sue Catterton. Would you spell your name, please? S-U-E-C-A-T-T-E-R-T-O-N. Ms. Myers? <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed, ma'am. Uh, my husband and I have lived in, in the ranches of Santerra, about, which is about one and a half miles away from the proposed plan. We have lived in the area for about 17 years. And I I concur with everything everyone has said here. Um, so I don't want to repeat everything because I know we're short on time, but I'm very disappointed that no one in the air quality permit office has felt the need to come to Alto to see firsthand what we have been writing letters, emails, calls, and so on to you about. And I wish you had been here in December when winds were recorded at our airport at 83 miles per hour. I am not opposed to the concrete plan. I don't think anybody is because we need concrete, but there's a right place and a wrong place. And this is the wrong place. I mean, in the middle of residential areas, come on. And after all the testimony, I just hope you will do the right thing and disallow this permit. Ms. Catterton? Ms. Catterton? Can we uh, bring back Ms. Catterton, please? I'm here. There you are. Uh, Ms. Catterton, uh, I first want to assure you and everyone else who has spoken today that I personally know people who have visited the site. So it is not the case that no one from the Environment Department has been to Airport Road, Route 220 uh, in, in Alto, New Mexico. So I first wanna, I first wanna say that to you um, because, okay. New Mexico, okay. because New Mexico Environment Department is not a heartless department. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I, I want to reiterate that zoning issues are outside of our purview. We have no control, no control over zoning. And, and I said that in my opening comments, that, that we are under a legal obligation to follow the law and the rules when considering this type of a permit. And there are many things that that the members have said that are heartfelt and 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 completely understandable, but they are without our control. And so I just wanted you to know that. Well, I thank you, but the water is under your control, and we have hardly any water. And so I don't know. We don't understand that. How you can say that it didn't applicable. Uh, but just because Roper says that he can provide water doesn't, I mean, I guess I'm so old, I'm not naive to think that just because somebody puts that on application that that's the truth and they can do it and or will do it. Well, I understand your position. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Stephen Hightower.
Mr. Hightower, um, I, I think we heard from your wife earlier. Yes, you did. Very good. Would you spell your name, please? S T E V E N H I G H T O W E R. Okay, sir. Uh, Ms. Myers? <clears throat> Will you raise your right hand, please, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Hightower, please proceed. Mr. Hearing Administrator, I uh, have lived in Lincoln County for 50 years now. I live within one half of a mile of the proposed black, uh, batch plant site. I was not notified by certified mail by the NMED. So add me to number 14. I had the circle surveyed and I'm clearly within the half a mile circle. Was not notified. I think we've missed something and this deals with air quality. I know a little bit about it. I was a commercial pilot here for 42 years. I flew out of this year Blanca airport since its construction in 1987. And there's something very unique that happens along the Little Creek Valley. It's not actually unique to New Mexico, but I'm surprised that I see it nowhere in your parameters for studying air quality. You guys talk about uh, temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, but nowhere do I see any kind of reference to temperature inversions. Now, temperature inversions happen on my property every single day in the winter time. This morning, I recorded a minus four degree Fahrenheit temperature in the valley along Little Creek and on top of the hill on my property, it was 32 degrees. That's a strong inversion that takes place every single day. The particular site is a bowl where this thing is proposed to be built. I'll promise you there's an inversion layer that takes place there every single day and nothing affects air quality in New Mexico as much as a temperature inversion does. And it's not even been considered from what I have been able to read. You guys know what this does to the air in Albuquerque. You have nights on end where you can't even burn your fireplace because there is an inversion layer. So I don't think your data from Holloman matters one bit. I don't think your data from Sierra Blanca Airport would matter one bit. Sierra Blanca Airport sits on top of a mesa. The valleys that surround that airport invert nightly. I've seen fog form in those valleys while the airport's sitting up in the clear air. The same thing is gonna happen in that bowl where you propose to build that site. And I'd like to know why an inversion is not included in your study. It affects air quality. You know what happens when there's an inversion? It traps particulate matter. It stays for hours or days as long as that inversion is in place. The air quality will become so poor in that bowl where that side is, nobody's gonna wanna drive by there. You're gonna wanna hold your breath, okay? So I think nothing short of a study at the site would address the air quality that's actually gonna get produced there. Further, I know you said something about zoning. We don't have any zoning here. We have, we regulate our properties by deed restriction. I'd like more, more time if you're trying to tell me I'm out of time. There are deed restrictions in place on this proposed site. Mr. Roper, new Mr. Hightower, well, Mr. Hightower yeah. how much more time do you need? Need a minute or two. I'm like my five minutes. So, sir, the, the, there were there were too many people that had signed up, so we had to reduce it to three. But you could take another minute, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Let me try to sum this up. Hundreds of folks will be affected by the construction of this plant. Air pollution, light pollution, noise pollution. Only one person benefits. Yeah, that's emotional. I'm going to, I'm going to be, I've talked to a local appraiser. My property value could drop as much as according to him, 50%. This is absurd. This is an absurd location to attempt to put this plant. Mr. Roper knows it. I tried to solve this early. I tried to double his money. You know what he said to me? I stand to make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why would I sell this property to you? What an attitude, you know? We're trying to solve the problem here. 
We're trying to help our neighbors. We're not trying to hurt our neighbors. Please say no. Thank you, Mr. Hightower. May I hear from Nan Fegley, if I'm pronouncing that right? Shorty, not a shorty. Uh, there you go. I can see you, ma'am. Can you spell your name, please? Uh, first name is Nancy, N-A-N-C-Y. Last name is Fegley, F-E-G-E-L-Y. Miss Myers? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed. Um, I'm going to say some of the similar things. Uh, the um, Certainly about the uh, area being a residential area. And it was a residential area long before Roper acquired the property. And you know the site is located next to the White Mountain Wilderness Area and Fort Stanton Snowy River Conservation Area is nearby and downwind of the site. The property is simply not appropriate for such intense industrial use because of its proximity to so many residences, property and sensitive environmental areas, which you also know. We have been wondering if you had visited the site and then it was good to hear that you said you have. But it would have been a good thing had you contacted some of our representatives. We know you're well acquainted with the Alto CEP. We would have been able to show you our concerns and showed you some of our good old Alto hospitality and bargain. But you would at least know in better detail our concerns. We know that the uh, of huge concern is the issues of pollutants and fugitive dust this type of operation creates. Uh, and the carcinogen uh, crystalline silica. The dust and pollutants will not stay contained to the site or nearby. You've heard about uh, reports of New Mexico wind and the winds generated just this past January. I live about three miles downwind from the site. And in my area, I had sustained winds of over 35 miles per hour and gusts between 65 and 75 miles per hour. We can be affected by dust storms created by white sand. That's 40 miles away and that brings gypsum here. And I believe gypsum is heavier than crystalline silica. Uh, stated uh, enormous amounts of water must. Be, oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me just also mention that um, the existing roper plant in Carrizozo is remarkably similar to the topography uh, as the Holloman model. Is it possible that the permit for Alto, for the Alto location submitted, was just a plug and play of previous submitted permit? It didn't have to, uh, it didn't have any, uh, be, by using an existing permit that's remarkably similar to the uh, other location, you didn't have to do additional research. And as stated, you did not, the uh, Sierra Blanca airport was not used because it was missing 22% of the information required in the permit process. So I'm curious why that additional information wasn't gathered and to make that application far more acceptable in terms of the topography because an arid open area like Holloman has nothing to do with what we have here with mountains and the canyons that we have here with, with the downslope winds, et cetera. Okay. I'll sum my comments up with the idea that uh, my husband and I moved to Alto to enjoy a very active outdoor lifestyle in a beautiful scenic area. We fell in love with the clear blue skies, almost devoid of a single contrail left by aircraft, and a night sky brilliant with stars because of a dark sky ordinance and little pollution. The air quality is unparalleled here cur currently, as witnessed by the fact that snow. I'll sum up in just 30 seconds. The air quality is unparalleled here currently, as witnessed by the fact that snow, which has been on the ground for over seven days, is still pristine without a speck of black, brown, or rust-colored dirt on its surface. That is a sure indicator of contaminants in the air when you see that kind of dirt on snow. The CPP will affect our air quality and the quality of life for all of us in the area. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Begley. Uh, do we have a Mr. or Mrs. Steyer Steerwalt? Okay. Um, do we have a Mr. Lou? Good. I'm, I'm here. Oh, ah, okay. And who are you, ma'am? Dorley Steerwalt. Great. Would you please spell your name? Yes. D I O R L Y. S T I E R W A L T. Very good. Uh, Ms. Myers, would you swear her in? Will you raise your right hand, please? <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please and this is a very hand. emotional, excuse me. This isn't a very emotional, uh, uh, whatever it is, and once I get going, I'm I'm going to have to finish, okay? And I'll make it quick, but it may be over. After searching for over a year in 2020, we found a home midway between my work in Ridoso and my husband's principalship in Capitan, an idyllic property on the Coyote Mesa. It was breathtakingly beautiful, filled with tall, majestic ponderosa pines, serene with abundant wildlife, elk, deer, turkey, bear and had the most glorious night skies. It was a hidden gem, our forever home. Life was good. December 12, 2010, I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, one of the rarest in the world at that time. There was little info on causes, no treatment protocol existed, and the survival rates were grim. I was 54 years old and had two young adults in college. I was blessed with a brilliant oncologist who threw every available treatment at it, a double mastectomy, four months of big red chemo. And lastly, I was driven to Roswell for 28 consecutive days to get my glow on from radiation. I finished up with two more surgeries. Our forever home provided us respite, salvation, a protective cocoon and a nurturing environment for family and fellowship during treatment and healing. 18 months later, I was finally done and we had survived. Next in 2012 came the Little Bear Fire. It jumped 48 and came down on the Coyote Mesa. We were given less than an hour to leave. We evacuated in a firestorm. I turned for one last look at our forever home. It was horrifying. After a week of being told our home burned and then that it had not, we were able to see for ourselves that it was still standing. 90% of our trees were destroyed. We had over $100,000 in losses and we were unable to return home for 36 days because of the caustic smoke. But our forever home was still there and we survived. But due to the lack of vegetation, the floods came, our ground floor was standing in four to six inches of water. We mucked soggy carpets, removed mushy drywall, threw out destroyed furniture, repaired the damage, and we survived. Next came the beetles. They devoured many of the remaining weakened trees. We cried as we cut them down. It took us seven years to clean up our five acres of dead and down trees because 100% of the cost to do so came out of our pocket. And as public school educators, we had no expendable income. Once again, we survived. We now live in a moonscape. We see neighbors we did not know existed. Gone are our beautiful trees and our privacy. We get horrific high winds. The dust from our dirt roads wreak havoc and the traffic noise from Highway 220 reverberates over our property since we no longer have trees for a buffer. However, we gained a full view of Sierra Blanca, bought the adjoining five acres and we're making the best of what we have. After all, it's our forever home and we survived again. But today we're facing a most formidable foe of a different kind, the most destructive yet, one that feeds off greed and disdain for its neighbors. One that appears to be insurmountable, a man-made threat that will take away our rights as a property owner. Roper Construction proposed concrete batch plant on Highway 220, just under a half mile from our property. Since I am immunocompromised from my cancer treatments, I will not be able to stay in my forever home. Any emissions of cancer causing particles is too many. We will be forced to leave the place that is most sacred to us, our oasis that holds our life story, where for years our family memories have been made and our children and their friends hung out and holidays have been celebrated the container of who we are and the reminder of past challenges overcome. Tragically, for the first time in our 21 years, 
history on the Coyote Mesa, we know that we will not and cannot survive this foe if it prevails. Our forever home will be no more. What gives a person the right to destroy the way of life for us and our neighbors? You must remember that there are real people with real lives who are facing real consequences concerning our future. This is about real human beings. No one should be able to do this. It's simply wrong. Hey, I hear from Lou Good. Would you spell your name, sir? Uh, Lewis, L O U I S, Good, G O O D E. Miss Myers? Will you raise your right hand, please? Thank, uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am, I do. Please proceed, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Lewis Good. Moved with my uh, with my parents from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to Las Cruces, New Mexico, back in 1956. I currently reside with my wife Amy, three quarters of a mile downwind and downstream from uh, Roper's proposed Alto CBP site. Our message is a simple one: concrete batch plant operations, equipment and trucks emit volatile organic compounds, hazardous air pollutants, particulate matter, and non-EPA. New Mexico Environmental Department controlled respirable crystalline silica, RCS or silica dust, that once inhaled can cause lung cancer, kidney disease, silicosis, and incurable lung disease. How can anyone issue an air quality permit for a permanent temporary or mobile CVP where people in wildlife, birds, fish, and animals live, work, and play? While your draft permit suggests that spraying water in quantities Mr. Roper has yet to prove he can provide over the entire CBP operation to limit dispersion of HAPS, box, particle, uh, particulate matter, meet EPA and MET standards, it fails to charge them with controlling the primary source of visible emissions, which is RCS or silica dust, which is a byproduct of fly ash aggregate cement mixing. The heavy trucks, more than 150 per day, constantly dropping mud, dirt, aggregate, cement, water, Motor oil transmission and brake fluid on CR220 in New Mexico 48, coating the asphalt pavement outside of the boundary of the CBP with slime, grit, sludge that forms a clay like substance, coating both roadways that dries out and becomes dust that's now inhaled by motorists, tourists, wildlife residents, their children, and grandkids. In the summertime, every day from 3 a.m. to 9 p.m., in the springtime, our 50 to 60 mile an hour southwesterly winds will carry these airborne particles for miles and miles perhaps all the way out to the Sierra Block Virgil Airport. In the wintertime, northeast winds will carry the half dock fugitive emissions directly into the Class 1 White Mountain Wilderness Area. Why does NMED's air quality permitting process focus on what goes on behind or inside the applicant's boundary fences when it actually is the air quality outside the boundary fences that affects people, plants, creatures, and is what really matters most, sir? Hundreds of trucks running up and down 5% grades, constantly shifting gears, dropping debris, fluids, jack braking on two lane roads, just to park and idle their diesel engines for hours at or near the CBP site. There would be no noise associated with the traffic or sense of burning diesel fuel and hazards of Vox without air. I'll argue that noise and odor are both essential components of air quality because without air, we'd have neither odor, smell, or noise sound. With water being nearly 32% air and subject to evaporation, atmospheric pressure, it should be considered a staple of air quality analysis and permitting as well, sir. With RCI's NMED Air Quality Bureau permit request, as dozens of revisions being the first I've examined, along with the extensive draft permit, NMED AQB team continues to revise seemingly ultimately for approval. I'm hoping this hearing provides an opportunity for some common sense to be applied to the resolution of this matter. Aside from rejecting current permitting applications, perhaps the right thing to do is direct Mr. Roper to relocate the CBP to a sparsely populated area more than five minutes from his house with fewer people and animals, less tourists, and further away from the EPA Class 1 White Mountain Wilderness area and any other sensitive areas so not to adversely affect them with ongoing CBP operations. Direct him to provide you with air dispersion modeling, replicating meteorological data 
an environment at the new location instead of information about Holloman Air Force Base near White Sands National Park, 50 miles southwest of Alto, South Ferris Airport, 130 miles southwest of Alto, near El Paso, Texas, both located on the District of Florida, around 4,000 feet of elevation. Mr. Good, you take me your three minutes are up. You can't use Sierra Blanca, use Roswell, which is on the right side of the mountain, at least. Another minute, sir. Perhaps it would be wise to ask him to resubmit his original application, correcting hundreds of typographical errors, his public notice included. The typographic errors, like using particle weight values for limestone instead of cement, stating asphalt instead of concrete, right? Ensure areas requesting information about the proximity of occupied structures and sensitive areas and local Indian tribes. And uh, using correct units of measurement throughout documents, including basic application before deeming it, be, to, deeming it to be administratively complete and prior to developing and issuing a draft permit. Almost finished, sir. As a United States Army Field Artillery School trained nuclear and chemical weapons target analyst, I know firsthand how radiation and inhalation of monitored and fugitive box, PAPS, and RCS slowly and quietly kills humans and animals. God's blessed us with two sons, four daughters, two beautiful grandchildren. Having found our forever home three years ago in Alto, I can't imagine not seeing the sunrise and set on Sierra Blanca from our backyard porch because of a smoke, dust, or particle plume and inversion clouds generated by RCI's backyard batch plant. In short, NMED's approval of RCI's current application for air quality permit just one mile east of the Class 1 White Mountain Wilderness area will expose our family, friends, neighbors, and wildlife to all significant collateral damage health risks associated with residing within five miles a five mile radius with CBP. Thank you, Mr. Good. We appreciate the opportunity to share our concerns with you at the state level as your constituents. Sir. May I hear from Mr. Dennis Bensky? Mr. Vensky, would you spell your name, please? First name Dennis, D E N N I S, last name Vensky, and he is in Victor E N S K I. Hey, Ms. Myers? Will you raise your right hand, please, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Vensky, please proceed. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I understand the need for bureaucracy. I don't like it, but I understand it. Um, I don't think bureaucracy should benefit one person over thousands of neighbors. And that's what he's asking to do. What I dislike most about bureaucracy is the unwritten rule of pass the buck. Several times today, more than several times, I have heard about the use of water to mitigate dust and pollutants. Um, and even worse, using water or sweeping on the roads to get rid of the dust there. If you use water on the road, it washes all these pollutants into the ditch. It goes back into the water system. If you sweep the road, you put all this dust back into the air and it goes someplace else and it has another chance to get to someone. Um, it seems by saying, if you eliminate the dust and use water, you're passing the buck. Because it takes it out of the air, you no longer have to worry about it. We have to live with it. I hope that the people responsible for passing this permit or issuing the permit will look beyond the bureaucracy and see what the residents will have to live with the rest of their lives. Because 90% of the people here, this is it. Their next home is gonna be a funeral home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vensky. Uh, Mr. Bill Kren. Mr. Kren. Would you please spell your name? K R E N. First name? William. 
Ms. Myers. Will you raise your right hand, please, sir? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, my first comment here was going to be uh, if I could see the audience, but I, I could tell I can't very well do that. However, however everyone is at uh, at the sound of my voice. I was just going to see if I could see a show of hands of people who are not originally from Alto or Rio Doso, New Mexico, attending this session. I can't see that. So I'll proceed here with what I have to say. I come from a big city. I lived, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I also lived in Phoenix, Arizona and Dallas, Texas. These three cities have three things in common. Noise, traffic and air pollution. These three things is what Alto does not need to have right now. Let me mention those things again. Noise, traffic and air pollution. Air quality is the reason we're here tonight. I guess it wouldn't be really fair to qualify Alto in the same category as those three major cities. However, if Mr. Roper is allowed to construct this batch plant, I'm afraid the air quality could very well go to that level. It's mentioned that this plant is going to operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How in the world could that not affect air quality? I'm not an air quality engineer. I don't know how to, how to measure particulates in the, in the air. And I don't know how much dust can be produced in the air. However, I know that if I go outside and start sneezing, that's because of the dust. I know there's particulates in the air and that's what's gonna make me cough. I must say that the prior two speakers that I've heard so far are quite technical in their, in their research. The air quality will not be the same in this area and Roper does not need to proceed with this construction. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's my list. Have I missed anyone? Uh, no, Mr. Hearing Officer, um, those, um, I gave you the list and um, we're done with the list. So we're done with public comment for tonight. Okay. Okay, there being no more evidence to be presented oh, today. I apologize, um, Mr. Hearing Officer. Uh, Hank Jones, um, earlier um, he was not present, but he's present now. Mr. Jones? Are you there, Mr. Jones? He's with the um, convention center. I see him walking. There he is. Mr. Jones, uh, would you um, unmute your microphone, please? Ms. Corral, oh, there we go. Oh. Hello, Mr. Jones, would you please spell your name and then you're going to be sworn in? Uh, Hank Jones, H-A-N-K-J-O-N-E-S. Ms. Myers? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed, sir. Uh, I have friends that live in the area, and uh, I'm a resident of Rio Dosa and caught wind of this. <clears throat> um, I know that uh, this is an air quality uh, issue, but it, it's also a uh, water quality issue. And uh, this facility is located uh, within within a mile of uh, of a waterway of the United States, um, and <clears throat> under some of the acts that uh, RECRA 
uh, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act established, they're to pre protect the waterways of the United States. And one of the uh, things that they did was uh, enact the uh, uh, stormwater uh, P3 uh, permits, which uh, basically says you have to collect all the rainwater on your property and make sure whatever is discharged does not contaminate a waterway of the United States. And I haven't seen any of this uh, exhibited uh, in these meetings. Also, they talked about cleaning uh, uh, the uh, pavement of uh, wash water with uh, cleaning pavements with uh, wash water. Uh, that is a, <clears throat> these are called non stormwater discharges. And <clears throat> that would also send contaminants to uh, a, a waterway. Um, without uh, getting really into the weeds on this, uh, it, it's, it, this has not been addressed, and I think it, if it does get addressed, that <clears throat> the permit would not be allowed. Um, cement contains uh, quite a few heavy metals. And uh, uh, above allowable percentages and content, and uh, I think uh, sampling around the area would show that uh, levels would would go up, and uh, um, can again uh, pollute the the waters of the United States. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Okay, let's go back to closing the hearing. There being no more evidence to be presented today in accordance with 20.1.4.500 NMAC, this hearing is now closed. The court reporter will submit a copy of the verbatim transcript to the Office of Public Facilitation, which will in turn provide the parties with notice of a transcript filing. Um, Ms. Myers, are you anticipating about a week? Uh, actually, I would like two if I can get it, only because I have it's up to you. a lot ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two o'clock. Uh, unless, uh, unless, Mr., um, I've seen in the past where the applicant um, expedites it. Mr. Rose? Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, we have not discussed that, so I can certainly talk to the client, but at this point, uh, we we have not requested an expedited transcript. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and I wasn't suggesting that you should. Uh, I was just saying that in the past it has been done, uh, and that shortens the time. But okay, so two weeks, about two weeks from now, we will get the verbatim transcript, and we will issue a notice to the parties. That will in turn provide the parties um, the 30 days that they have to submit proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law and a closing written argument. The transcript is the official record of the hearing and all citations must be to the transcript page and line or to the administrative record or to properly um, admitted exhibits. Um, and we'll get to the exhibit issue with Sonterra in just a moment. Anyone who wants a copy of the transcript will contact the court reporter directly. Uh, Ms. Myers, would you like to give your email address now? Yes, thank you. Um, you can actually send it to S Myers, M-Y-E-R-S, C-C-R, 
at gmail.com. Okay. Um, I need one minute. I will be back in one minute. Okay. There is also a WebEx audio and visual recording of this hearing, which may be requested from the hearing clerk. Uh, Ms. Corral, would you give your email address, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Officer. My email, which is Madai, M A. D A I point Corral, which is spelled C O R R A L at state dot N F dot U S. Okay. Um, any party that submits a post hearing submission, it must be in Microsoft Word format. Any issue not addressed in the party's closing argument is deemed to be waived. Parties may also file joint findings and conclusions by oral motion or written motion. All motion, all submissions shall be in writing and shall contain adequate references to the hearing record and the authorities relied upon. No new evidence shall be presented. The hearing record is defined at 20.1.4.7 NMAC as the record proper and the verbatim transcript of the public hearing, including all exhibits offered into evidence, whether or not admitted. The record proper is further defined as the administrative record and all documents filed by or with the hearing clerk. Within 30 days after the party's submissions, I will serve on the parties a hearing officer report and a recommended decision the parties will then have 15 days to comment. Once we receive the parties' comments, the, uh, rec the hearing officer report and the recommended decision and the comments will go to the deputy secretary for her consideration of whether or not to approve this permit. Now it is time to deal with Sonterra's exhibits. Mr. Hanasco, have you cured the defect? We have, Mr. Hearing Officer, and uh, the exhibits have been submitted in numerical form from Exhibit 1 through Exhibit 18. And the only exhibit that we did not include was, of course, the application. So that has all been uh, taken care of. Okay. One uh, I would like matter. to look at it, Mr. Hanasco. Uh, before you continue, I would like to look at it so that we are talking about what's in front of me. So has it been sent to the hearing officer yet? It's been sent to Ms. Corral plus all, right. all the parties, so. Okay, and Mr. Mr. Rose and Mr. Vigil, have you received it? Yes, I have. Okay. And we have too, we haven't looked at it, but I trust Mr. Nasco's representations. Okay, and Ms. Ms. Um, Corral, have you sent it to me so I can look at it? Um, I, I, I have a couple of emails from them. Um, I just want to make sure that I sent you the correct one. Um, at what time was the last? It was, it would be within the last 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I have not received it. From... The last 15. 
Okay, and it, it's coming from Linda? It's from Sonia, and I think it was, we got it timed at 528. So it would have been eight minutes ago. Mm, I don't have it. No, I, I don't see it on on my email. Um, if if you wouldn't mind um, resending it to me. Sure. Mr. Hearing Officer, do you want us to send you one directly? No, if you'll send it to Ms. Corral, she'll she'll immediately forward it to me. Um, one less thing to to not worry about right now. Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, may I add one housekeeping matter? By all means. Thank you. Uh, you know, I previously made a motion to include as a, a complete copy of AP 42 yes. as an additional exhibit. In reviewing the record, I note that the entire AP 42 is attached as exhibit 14 okay. and to Ms. Bernal's testimony. So I respectfully withdraw that motion. Okay. Okay. So, in other words, it's already here. It's already here. Okay. Sounds good. And Mr. Herring also, just as a housekeeping matter, yes. I think when you refer to submittal of the post hearing, um, findings and conclusions yes. and closing argument. I think you asked for them in Microsoft Word. Yes. It's my understanding that normally we submit these both as a PDF and as a Microsoft Word document. That's at least been the practice. Is that you're more than you're more than welcome to. Okay, thank you. Yes, of course. Mr. Hearing Officer, to tell you that you know, uh, apparently it was too big for the state system to receive all in one PDF. So we're breaking it up. Um, and that was the issue there. That's why uh, I'm not quite sure why, why Chris could receive it um, and not. Mr. V Hill? Mr. V Hill, sorry. Yes, that's okay. Mr. V Hill? Um. I uh, I'm not sure what the question is. I I received um, I received three emails and I have not looked at them. I have a problem with any of the exhibits or you know uh, the or, or any representations. Um, but I'm happy to go through the emails if you'd like me to. Well, I, I think it's important that everyone receive be properly marked exhibits. Uh, Mr. Rose, did you say that you've looked at this already? Uh, Mr. Hangoff, sir, I, I noted that I received it and we're looking at it now, but, and I, I think it was, if uh, Mr. V Hill's looking for the, for the email, I think it was what, 528 and it was uh, submitted by Ms. Morris, I think. Is who it should have come from. Four or five different emails. That's what they're doing. Yeah. Yes, my ours is time five twenty eight. So yeah, I haven't received a five twenty eight email yet. I think I think you may have the same problem that that uh, Mr. Nasco and and Ms. Sakura referenced in terms of the. The actual attachment being too large for the state system. So, okay, Mr. 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 Rose, how big is this email? Um, we're looking. It looks like. Was it 51 megabytes? 51.1 megabytes. I see. Yeah, that probably is too big. So, I'm surprised to resend it in parts. If that would be. Better. Right. So maybe five or six different parts. I mean, or you could create an FTP site and have them access it. Yes. Mr. Hearing Officer, now that we're waiting, um, they're asking, um, and 
can they still submit comments um, until 12 tonight? Yes, we will leave the smart comment uh, link uh, open uh, okay. for the rest of the evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Hinasco, while we're waiting for this, uh, your exhibits, uh, why don't we go down a list of what we are going to be looking at? So, what is exhibit one? I'm back, Mr. Hearing Officer. Sorry. All right. Did you hear the question? I did not. I'm sorry. Okay. So, what is so I have here your 19 page SOI referencing exhibits. What is going to be exhibit one? Uh, the CV. The CV. Can you be can you be very specific about how many pages and whose CD? Yes, I just got to get in front of me. I didn't think this would be that complicated, frankly, but let me, let me just get the document. Exhibit one is the is the uh, CV of uh, Dr. Carlos Tuarte Villarreal. How many pages is it? Three pages. All right. What is exhibit two? Exhibit two is the model change bulletin. For Air Mod version two one 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 two. How many pages? Seven pages. Six, seven. Exhibit three is what? Is uh, Federal Register volume uh, eighty two, number ten, consisting of uh, two pages. Two. Two. Seems to me that it's more than two. It looks like it's three. I have two. I have pages five, Federal Register page 5231, 5232, and 5222. That's the next exhibit, Mr. Hearing Officer. 5222 is the is exhibit number four. Perfect. So it's a one page document. Okay. What is exhibit five? Exhibit five is a is is part of the rope construction dispersion model protocol. Mm -hmm. Consisting of one page, page nine of that uh, protocol, exhibit five. Very good. And and what does it depict? Pardon me. What does it depict? Meteorological data, uh, narrative on meteorological data using the uh, Holloman Air Force Base. Okay, what I have, the next page I have after your exhibit number four looks like a relief map of an airport. No, so that is coming up later in our submittal. Well, originally you submitted that picture right after. 5222 of the federal register. In our presentation, we did, but not, not, in the, not in the notice of attempt. I'm looking at your NOI, sir. I have exhibit five uh, is, the, is the dispersion model protocol, page nine. I'm ex going to exhibit six, which is the uh, wind rose. Okay, I, I'm not at the wind rose yet. I'm still wondering what are these photographs that have green colors on them and look like one is an airport, one might be the location of the of the of the proposed facility. Those are terrain maps that are later on. Uh, we have a number of those. You have a number of them. Okay, well, the way you submitted them to at least to Miss Corral, you have one, two. You have two that are greenish in color and one that is reddish and yellow in color. That's correct. So should I ignore those pages for now? Just for now. Okay, so what is exhibit five and, and what does it look like? Exhibit five is a one page document taken from the uh, Roper Construction Dispersion Model Protocol, 
I no, think I, I found it. Okay. Does it start out with what it says, Winrose data table? No, it is section 2.2 .2 is at the top of the page. I don't have that. This is what we, because six is, this is five. This is five. Five is in our NOI is a meteorological data collecting for the modeling study. But it says on page two. And that's it. That's on our notice of intent at page two. Okay, I printed your NOI in its entirety. And what I'd like to know is these two green, these two green maps, there are two green maps and one yellow map. What exhibit are they part of? The first map, which is exhibit seven, is uh, depicts the uh, uh, the the, the uh, terrain locations at the Alto Concrete Batch Plant proposed location. The second map, which is what you refer to as the uh, more tan colored map, that's Exhibit Eight, and that is the wind. That is the. Uh, oh, five. We did. So I'm. I'm now. In five. Exhibit exhibits. Uh, let me back up if I may. Uh, uh, exhibit six is our is the wind rose. Exhibit six is the is the. Uh, Map depicting the topographical conditions at Holland Air Force Base. The brown map. Okay, I you I thought you just said exhibit six was the wind roads. I did, and I was incorrect. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, uh, my question my question is this: um, I have two green green maps. Okay, one yes. one has a well, they both have bullseyes on them. One looks like it is of the proposed site. What exhibit number is that? Of the proposed site. Okay. The proposed site is seven. Exhibit seven. And what is, it looks like it might be the Sierra Blanca airport. It is. Yeah. Oh, that is, that is, uh, the, one, the other one is the Sierra Blanca airport. Which, which one is it? It's, it's uh, I think what we're going to have to do, Mr. Here now, to, to, I, I know you're trying to get through this, but I think it is best if we, if we specifically identify these, resubmit them in 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 in, a, in, in two or three separate emails, and okay. I think it'll be self-explanatory to you at that okay. point. Okay. Okay. So I did, when do, I did when just do you foresee to, doing? Um, I, I I don't know if this is going to help at all or make things worse, but I just I received two emails. Um, uh, with uh, part one and part two of their exhibits, and the, 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 I've looked at them while you were chatting. I was looking through them, and the bureau has no objection as uh, uh, on those. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that, Chris. But I would like to I would like to go through these one more time, and then resubmit it, them if there are any out of order, so the hearing officer has them okay. exactly in the order with the description that he needs. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's fine with the bureau as well. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So let's let's do this then. Um, 
Let's do this, Mr. Hanasco. Uh, when do you foresee sending those emails out with the corrected uh, labels and marks? Within 30, 30 minutes after we get off our call here, after we get off WebEx. Okay, then what I'll do is this. Um, you send it to Ms. Corral, Mr. Rose, and Mr. Vigil. And I'm going to give them some time to look through the exhibits and make any objections that they see um, fit to make, if any. If they do make a, a if they do make objections, we're going to have to uh, get back on the record to deal with the objections um, either tomorrow or the next day. If they do not make an objection, then what we'll do is uh, we will accept them as you send them and we will get them to the court reporter. Thank you. Am I, uh, is there anything else before we are off the record for this evening? Nothing further, um, Mr. I, I, maybe. Uh, just a formal motion. Uh, may, maybe you've already taken care of it, but I move that the record remain open uh, for the purpose of Santerra's exhibits until a uh, close of business Friday. Uh, I, I have no problem with leaving the record open until we, uh, for, for the specific purpose of fixing, uh, of, of getting these properly marked and into, uh, and into evidence and to the court reporter. Uh, not at all. That's not a problem. Um, Mr. Hearing officer, just uh, one clarification. I think you yes. said you're going to keep the record open. This evening for additional yes. written comments or folks yes. to include in there is. Is there a mechanism by which those submittals can be. Be provided to the applicant as well, or definitely you have copies definitely. of those? Definitely uh, we have a new system. In place, it just was put in place a few weeks ago. It's called smart comment. Uh, other states have been using it for years now. And what we can do is once uh, the record is closed for comment as as of midnight, um, the hearing clerk will work with IT to compile those into a report. And that report can be sent to the parties. I think that would be appropriate, Mr. Hearing Officer. And that's fine. What we will do is we will send those comments in their um, original format as they are submitted to us. And um, we will get those to the parties as as soon as next week sometime. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Just, just to make it clear, we've looked at Mr. Nasco's exhibits and we have no objection either. They look fine to us, so. And of course, since I can't see what you're looking at, it, it's, uh, it's nice of you, but it doesn't help me right now. Um, I appreciate that. So we're we still in the same boat where we have to wait for for Sonterra's council to send out the final version of these exhibits in 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 one, two, or three files, so that everyone has a chance to uh, either object or not object. And I will wait to hear from Mr. Vigil and yourself, uh, either saying we have no objection or we have an objection, and here's our objection so that I can then uh, work with the court reporter. Yeah, we can certainly do that, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, and, uh, Mr. Rose, from your perspective, is there anything else? Uh, no, I think uh, I think we've covered all the areas that, that we need to, and we've set the post-hearing process, so I think we're, we're good to go. Okay, Mr. Vigil, is there anything from your perspective? No, thank you. Of course. And Mr. Hanasco or Ms. Sakura, is there anything from your perspective? Well, nothing, Mr. Hearing Officer. Thank you for your time today. Okay, hey, Ms. Myers. Yes. Okay, Ms. Myers. Um, I need to be able to communicate with you regarding the exhibits in the next couple of days. Would you okay. send an email to Ms. Corral, the hearing clerk, uh, with all of your contact info, including your cell phone number? Yes. Wonderful. We are now off the record. It is 555 PM on Wednesday, February 9th. Thank you to everyone. And thank you to all of the public members who spoke uh, with such heartfelt comments uh, that they were uh, loudly heard. Um, and also all of the witnesses, all of the uh, public servants at the New Mexico Air Quality Bureau uh, and all of the witnesses who testified on behalf of Roper and uh, from Sonterra. So thank you everyone, have a good evening.
Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.